Chapter One of Red Diamonds. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caroline. Red Diamonds by Justin McCarthy. Chapter One: The Voyages. The Voyages Club considered itself to be a very remarkable institution. It stood in St. James's Square on the north side where it occupied a stately mansion that had been sufficiently famous in the days of the georges indeed strangers of a literary turn of mind who visited the club often confessed to much mental fluttering and exultation as they looked at the white hall and the spacious rooms fair with the graceful ornamentation of the last century they declared that their imagination revived the past that for them once again the flambeau flickered in the lackey's hands once again the square was choked with the chairs and the carriages of the great once again the staircase was thronged with the shadows of the statesmen the ambassadors the wits and soldiers the poets and proconsuls who made the hanoverian rule illustrious the voyagers themselves however seldom wasted much time in such contemplations they were a new club and they were proud of their newness and felt as a body the very slightest sympathy with the people of the past the present was good enough for them they maintained and they lived in and for the present with a persistent activity which was gradually making them famous if indeed a bust of herodotus adorned their library if portraits of hakluyt and columbus stared down upon the smokers in the smoking-room these were the only worthies of antiquity for whom the voyagers professed any special reverence for it was modern travel which the voyagers considered themselves especially to represent that modern travel which has linked constantinople with paris which has so astonishingly abridged the distance between liverpool and new york between england and india between america and japan and which has schemed out its great scheme of the euphrates valley railroad the voyagers were men of the moment who liked to travel far but who liked above all things to travel fast practical men who would like to put railways everywhere and who laughed contemptuously at the faddy and fussy persons who signed with mr ruskin for the old days of pack saddle and stage coach their sympathies lay more in the direction of jules verne and the mighty conceptions of his mind the men who put a girdle around the world in eighty days who hoped for excursions to the moon and to the centre of the earth and who dreamt of altering the axis of the globe in order to make use of the ultimate realms of the pole so when the members of the voyagers club were not racing across south america or planning railways in persia or dreaming of annexations in the islands of the south seas when they were at home beneath their pleasant roof-tree in st james's square they thought very little of the politicians and the poets of the last century who had once gloried and drunk deep within the same walls their thoughts were with sir richard burton and mr h m stanley with johnston of kilimanjaro and sir samuel baker the club entertained divided opinions as to the merits of a channel tunnel or channel bridge and it held in affectionate reverence the name of mr pullman if ever an expedition was to be started for the exploration of some untravelled tract of land in the hottest heart of asia or for the rescue of some traveller who had disappeared adventurous into the darkest part of darkest africa members of the voyagers club were sure to be found among the organizers of the expedition and the smoking-room would be converted into a kind of permanent committee-room for the expedition until it was fairly started 
the royal geographical society boasted no more enterprising fellows upon its roll than those whose names were also to be found set down in the members list of the voyagers club in st james's square in fact the voyagers club was a very characteristic creation of an age that above all things loves to wonder an age when civilized men children of generations of civic life become as restless as the nomad arabs and wander feverishly hither and thither having no home and yet at home everywhere even as the gypsies the club was the centre of a great network of travel exploration and adventure sitting in its smoking-room even the laziest of mankind felt himself in a kind of personal communication with the uttermost ends of the earth with baghdad and bolivia and bernares and balara nay even felt so strong was the heady influence of the place that it was his own immediate duty at once to arise and shake the dust of cities from his shoes and journey day and night to the land of Presta john or the other remoter land east of the sun west of the moon but if the voyagers as a body were go-ahead men tearing across the world eternally as though the devil was at their heels and despising the term globe-trotters it must not be supposed that all its members were thus desperately adventurous the club was a young club barely a year in working existence it had been started by a little handful of tough travellers of the newest school but there were not enough of such tough travellers easily obtainable at short notice to make up a successful club and so the tough travellers were obliged to compromise a little life is all compromise captain the honourable john raven had observed sententiously when the club was still in embryo few men had travelled more for his time of life for he was still a youngish man than captain the honourable john raven whom his playful friends called captain jack daw a man has not been a queen's messenger and a special correspondent and a soldier of the queen and a soldier of fortune all for nothing and john raven had seen a great deal of the world and its ways before he came to the shaping of the voyagers club so when he said that life was all compromise his committee colleagues of the unborn voyagers agreed with him and accordingly they compromised it was agreed and made plain through the medium of the public press that a man might very well be a voyager without having explored central africa like lovett cameron or baluchistan like ernest floyer in fact the club committee decided that any one who had ever travelled a thousand miles from london was by that fact qualified for membership of the voyagers club and entitled up to a certain date to election without entrance fee if his other qualifications were considered acceptable such was captain jack daw's compromise and it bore good fruit the number of people who wanted to become voyagers proved to be very great and in quite a short time the original limit was reached a heavy entrance fee was fixed and the voyagers took its place among the most flourishing of young clubs in london gerald aspen was very fond of the voyagers club partly perhaps because it was the only club to which he had the privilege of belonging but chiefly because of its name and its associations he was very grateful to the compromise which as he considered had allowed him to enter the club for he could not consider himself in the serious sense a voyager at all he had certainly fulfilled the primal qualification he had been more than a thousand miles from london if a man employs a month's holiday in going to new york and back on the off chance of picking up some information about a lost father he has travelled a good deal more than a thousand miles from london 
and that was the extent of Gerald Aspen's serious voyaging. He had, it is true, knocked about the continent a good deal. He had been bear leader to a solemn young cub, the son of a city magnate, whom he had been entrusted with and with whom he had made what his great-grandfather would have called the grand tour he had had a good time and kept his cub out of all manner of mischief holding his paws and muzzle from many varieties of unwholesome honey his bear leading had brought him enough money to make that little trip to new york which had resulted in failure so far as its object was concerned but in success so far as it qualified him for membership of the voyagers still he might never have been a member of the voyagers if it had not been for captain jackdaw gerald had met john raven in prague first on that famous bear-leading tour expedition and again in vienna and the pair had struck up a strongish friendship of the kind that men do strike up in foreign towns so when gerald aspen found himself in london with his way to make as a journalist and rich with all the inestimable privileges that four guineas a week offer to the ambitious he came across the announcement of the voyagers club in the newspaper to which he was devoted and saw the name of john raven on the committee gerald was almost unknown in london he knew that it would be a very convenient thing for him to belong to a club he had something in his blood of that wandering spirit which made it tingle at the thought of voyagers besides in such a club who knows bringing together as it would men from all the ends of the earth he might very possibly some day come across somebody who could tell him something of that long-lost father at least it was not impossible it was always gerald's dream and the voyagers offered a better chance than any other that lay in his way so he wrote to raven setting forth his claims and recalling the old continental friendship and waited somewhat anxiously for the result the result came rapidly in the form of a letter from the secretary informing him that he had been duly elected a member of the voyagers club and requesting him to forward his subscription the subscription was eight guineas and gerald felt a certain thrill of blended pain and pleasure as he made out on his almost virgin cheque-book a cheque for that to him enormous sum all this was long ago almost a year ago gerald felt quite an old member of the club now he came there every day he was very fond of it a young man alone in london especially a young man who is country-bred who lives in chambers and has no relatives and few friends gets naturally to be fond of his club it means companionship it means comfort it imparts an agreeable sense of being in and of the great world of london he feels that he is neither friendless nor alone as he passes through the swinging doors and finds himself the temporary master of a surprising amount of comfort and even of luxury in return for his modest yearly subscription there was a young gentleman once of the name of brown whose uncle gave him some very good advice on the occasion of his being elected to that very illustrious institution the megatherium but that was many years ago and the club world of london has multiplied amazingly since those days it was a business to get into a club in those days it is a business to get into a good many clubs still but there are a great many more clubs now than there were then and the young soldier of fortune the eager young journalist like gerald aspen can without making any serious encroachment upon his income find himself privileged to spend a solid part of his day within the walls of buildings that would have appeared indeed palatial to the struggling young journalist of a generation and a half ago not that gerald aspen could now be described as a struggling journalist 
he considered that he had been very lucky. When his father had vanished years ago into outer darkness, Gerald, then a child, was left in the care of a maiden aunt in the country, and with that maiden aunt he had lived until she died. Then he came to London with two purposes, to find his father and to make his fortune. So far he had done neither, but he was a prominent and responsible member of the staff of an enterprising journal. Gerald's newspaper was a weekly journal of the new school. It was the representative of advanced journalism, as the Voyagers' Club was the representative of advanced travel. It gave Gerald plenty to do, for Gerald was able and willing and well-informed and well-read. He had been well-educated in that quiet country town, and wrote a fluent, pleasant style, and was really quite worth the six guineas a week to which he had now been advanced, and which he regarded with pardonable pride as a very comfortable, not to say enormous, income. To write for the catapult, to belong to the Voyagers' Club, to have comfortable tiny chambers in a building behind the strand which looked over the gardens of the Thames embarkment and the stately river. What more could a young man wish for? What, indeed, if only he knew where his father was, or what had become of him? But then, as Gerald had never known his father, this inquiry, though it occupied his thoughts a good deal and had guided his actions, at all events on one occasion, did not poignantly harass him or darken his existence. He had a kind of impression that he should find his father some day. Even if he did not, it would not greatly matter. It was a mystery indeed, but not a mystery of a kind which compelled solution at the risk of poisoning all happiness if the mystery was left unsolved. In the meantime, Gerald's business in life was to work, and to work well for the catapult, to study London as the battleground of his life, and to cherish that affectionate regard for the Voyagers' Club, which is the instinct of man as a domestic animal, to entertain for some set of four walls or other somewhere. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of Red Diamonds by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Two The Man from Afar. It was an evening in late April. Gerald Aspen sat at a little table in the dining room of the Voyagers, a little table that he was especially fond of. It was a window table, and now, as the blinds were not drawn, he could look out into the darkness beyond and see the black bulk of the square, cinctured by its stars of light, burning with a gem-like brilliancy in the clear air. It had been a cold, raw April, as April often is, and it was very pleasant to sit there in the warm bright room with its soft carpets and its crimson shaded lamps and candles and its bright fire at either end and to look out upon that vague mass of light and darkness which a famous painter would call a harmony in gold and sable and delicately appreciate without experiencing the stinging chill of the atmosphere outside a whimsical recollection crossed gerald's mind of that old poetic tale of the bird which flew for a moment out of the wintry darkness into the blazing hall and then flew out again or how the wise man commented thereupon and saw in the swift passage of the bird from darkness through light to darkness an allegory of the life of man the dining-room of the voyagers was an exceedingly pleasant room between seven and nine it was generally pretty crowded with men of all ages and types 
from the smart young man about town, brilliantly attired, who banqueted there with other splendid creatures like themselves, on their way to the gaiety theatre, to grizzled explorers, with skins like old mahogany, who strolled about London in a garb that suggested more the jungle and the reedy African river than the neighbourhood of Piccadilly. Here came men who knew and liked the never-never land better than Piccadilly, men who still cherished the theory that Leichardt might yet be lingering in extreme old age somewhere in the core of aboriginal brush, men who had known themselves what it was to lose their way in desolate Australasian deserts, men who found their champagne the more grateful because of their memories of times when they had well-nigh perished of thirst in the trackless, waterless wastes at the other end of the world. Here came men who had served under half the battle-flags of the world. You might hear animated controversies going on any day between soldiers of fortune who had fought on opposite sides at Gettysburg, in Mexico, in Crete, in Spain, who had served federal and confederate cause, who had fought for the Turk and the Greek, and the Carlist and the Commune, men who had served China in the ever-victorious army, men who knew the terraces of Khartoum as well as they knew the club windows in St. James's Square. Here came men to whom all travel was but an aid to the cause of science, who would have explored all South America for a new beetle or a new bud. Here came the men who organized fantastic expeditions for the discovery of buried cities and buried treasures. Here came the men of means, who combined exploration with all the luxuries of civilization, who travelled with an army of camp followers, who never took a meal without champagne, and who made it a point to dress for dinner in the centre of the Sahara or on the summit of Chimborazo. Here, too, came those men who could journey for days on a handful of dates, the anchorites of travel. Gerald, in his own mind, had baptized the voyager's dining-room the place of strange parting. It was a common thing, a matter of daily occurrence, for men to dine there together, one of whom, towards the close of the meal, would glance at his watch, spring up, shake hands all around, and disappear, while his friends cried after him, safe returns. Then, if you listened to their talk, you would learn that the departing one was just off on an exploration to the mountains of the moon, or the hidden cities of Tibet, or the South Pole, or some such trifling trip. Men were always rushing away from the voyagers to catch trains that were to carry them off, a stage on their way to the uttermost ends of the earth. Men were often coming back too, but not quite so often, for the voyagers' club had its record of glory in the Caucasus and in Crim Tartary, in Burma, and the elephant haunts of the Cape, with a deeper tint of the shadowed livery of the banished sun upon their faces, with a thought more silver in their hair. When these men came back after absences of long months, after desperate and deadly adventures, they were greeted by their friends with as much composure as if they had been for a Saturday to Monday at Brighton or a week in Paris. It was the purpose in life of most of the voyagers to storm across the earth like the wind's blast, never resting homeless, as Schiller says of the soldiers of Wallenstein. 
Any one of them would have been amazed, indeed, if anyone else made a fuss about him on his return from the Sandwich Islands or Japan or Peru. They came and went on their wild flights with absolute indifference, and if the bones of some of them whitened the dreary desert or lay rotting in mid-African rivers, those who survived wasted no breath in regrets. The pathless desert, the untracked river, these were fitting resting places for such restless spirits, fitting as the battlefield to the soldier or the hunting field to the hunter. On this particular evening in April, when Gerald was sitting at his familiar table, the room was uncommonly full. The waiters were exceedingly busy, the steward of the club, a popular person with a face like a diplomatist's, walked gravely hither and thither, and saw that all went well. Most of the men who were present were in evening dress, as Gerald was himself, for he was going later on to a festive function at a big hotel, for which a card had been sent to the catapult. The tables were very white and bright, and glittering with glass, and there were pretty flowers in quaint Venetian vessels on all the tables, a pretty voyager's custom, and the softly shaded lights lent a very tender tone to the colour and the contrasts of the room. The table at which Gerald sat was the only table in the room at which there was a vacant seat. It was a table intended for two persons, though at a pinch it could be made to accommodate four, but this evening the pinch was not felt, and Gerald, as he ate his dinner, sat with an empty chair facing him. Usually he dined in company with some club acquaintance, but on this particular evening no one had turned up to join him, so he sat alone very contentedly, looking over the room every now and then with the eye of a man to whom observation is a business, and ate his modest meal and supped his modest claret, and occasionally glanced at the evening paper which lay on the table beside him. He felt in a very contented mood. He had passed a very busy day, he looked forward to a pleasant evening, for he was still young enough to like crowds and rushes and functions, even when they came as a matter of business, and not of planned pleasure. When he had exhausted the evening paper, when he had noted with the trained journalistic eye the matters of moment which would afford him opportunity for comment, for satire or support, when he had weighed with complacent authority the merits of conflicting cabinets and chancelleries, and settled with off-hand abruptness the affairs of Europe, Asia, Africa, America, and the Antipodes, when he had smiled over an essay signed by the initials of his favourite author, and frowned over a criticism which clashed with his own opinions, Gerald felt the need of further mental sustenance. He had not nearly finished his dinner, and he had quite finished his paper. Then he remembered that he had in his pocket several letters which he had brought along with him with the intention of reading them in the club, and of answering them after dinner in the smoking-room, before starting on his way to his festivity. He now pulled them out of his tail-pocket and began to consider them. Most of them were unimportant, invitations to private views of picture-galleries, cards for amateur concerts, tickets for matinees, admissions to scientific lectures, and to scientific discussions. Gerald went in for being an all-round young man. The advanced journalist, like Bacon, has taken all knowledge for his province, and the proprietors of the catapult, finding that Gerald could write with an agreeable air of information upon a variety of topics, 
gave him a good deal of rather miscellaneous occupation. Among Gerald's letters there was one, however, which seemed to promise interest. It was a card of invitation from Lady Scardale to the editor of the Catapult, bidding that distinguished personage to a ceremonial at her culture college in Chelsea. The editor had handed it over to Gerald. "'Look here,' he said, "'this is just the sort of thing for you. You are a young fellow, and I am an old fodgy.' He was, as a matter of fact, a man of about five-and-thirty, but he thought the affectation of age an adjunct to the editorial dignity. "'It will just suit you to go and look at a lot of women.' Gerald had mildly suggested that it depended a good deal upon who composed the lot of women, but his editor waved him down. "'That will be all right,' he said. "'They are sure to be mostly young and mostly pretty. Lady Scardale's is a wonderful place, quite like the thing in The Princess, you know, sweet girl graduates in her golden hair, and all the rest of it. Fix us up a column.' So the editor thrust the card into Gerald's hand, and turned with a great air of gravity to his desk again. Now Gerald, seated at his table, studied the card with interest. He had heard of Lady Scardale, of course. Everybody had heard of Lady Scardale and her enterprise, her excellent enterprise according to some, her eccentric enterprise according to others. The card was issued in the name of Lady Scardale as President, and of Fidelia Locke as Vice President, of the Culture College, Chelsea, and bade its recipient to a ceremonial afternoon in honour of the first anniversary of its existence. Fidelia Locke, Gerald said to himself, what a pretty name! I wonder if the woman is as pretty as her name. Probably not. Possibly a frump in blue spectacles, with terrible views of life and a taste for baggy umbrellas. I should think it will be rather a tedious business altogether. Afternoon ceremonials always are. Still, it may make copy. Gerald dearly liked to assure himself that he looked upon the whole of the orbed earth merely as a subject for copy, that he considered all its events, from the fall of a dynasty to the first night of a new peace, solely as a matter to be recorded with more or less skill in the columns of the catapult by a quite unimpassioned, impartial, and serene philosopher, to wit himself. As a matter of fact, he was not at all the solemn personage he conceived himself to be, but an exceedingly healthy young man, with plenty of healthy interests in life, and a very creditable adaptability for journalism. Though he professed to himself to be slightly bored at the prospect of the afternoon ceremonial at the Culture College, Chelsea, he was in his heart decidedly interested. He had heard a good deal of Lady Scardale's little scheme for setting up a sort of miniature Girton or Vassar by the rushing Thames in the old world of Chelsea, and he already saw in his mind's eye a very agreeable column of copy, full of the portentous erudition and familiarity with the names of illustrious masters so dear to youth. Then, too, he should know that Fidelia Locke was like. Yes, it is a pretty name, he said again. Quite suddenly his attention was diverted from the culture college and Fidelia Locke by the entry of a new customer into the room. The new customer stood just inside the doorway, looking somewhat dubiously at the crowded room. He was a tall, strongly made, loosely built man. He had a large face whose native ruddiness had been deepened by time into a red-brick glow. 
This fiery face was crowned by a great mass of hair and fringed by a great mass of beard of the orange-yellow color of vivid flame. The stranger seemed to have a taste for strongly marked coloring in his attire as well as his person, for he wore a loose, well-worn tweed suit of a yellow ochre hue, and the attractions of a rather soiled and very blue shirt were enhanced by a necktie of crimson silk, also soiled and frayed. Many diners looked up as well as Gerald, gazing in wonder at the singular apparition, whose wide, good-humoured, flaming face slowly moved as his eyes travelled around the room in search of a vacant seat. The diplomatic steward was at his side in a moment with counsel and suggestion. Then, rather to his horror, Gerald saw that the party-coloured giant was making his somewhat lumbering way towards the table at which he sat. It was rude to stare, but the strange figure exercised a kind of fascination over Gerald, and he watched it cross the room and bring itself to a halt directly opposite to him. Then the party-coloured giant laid an enormous hand on the back of the vacant chair opposite to Gerald. It was a very enormous hand, and Gerald, dropping his eyes to wonder at its massiveness, noticed that his little finger, if anything about the hand could be called little, was graced with a ring in which an enormous diamond blazed and twinkled. The yellow ochre figure leaned forward, the very red mouth and the very red face opened, and Gerald found that he was being addressed. "'Say, stranger, have you any objection if I happen in here along of you?' The accent and speech were American, but not American alone, it seemed to Gerald. He looked up quickly from the large hand, and its large, brilliant, and answered, with an affability that was slightly confused by the abruptness of the address, that he could not possibly have the least objection. It was obvious that the yellow ochre gentleman was a member of the club, though Gerald had never seen him there before. Neither, it would seem, had any other of the occupants of the dining-room, for Gerald could notice, with his quick journalistic capacity for noticing everything that was going on around him, how the talk at the tables had dropped into a whispering buzz of wonder, and how the diplomatic steward glanced from table to table discreetly, answering softly propounded questions. The stranger had planted himself squarely at the table opposite to Gerald, and was proceeding to shovel soup in his mouth, with a rapidity and noisy satisfaction in the process that amused Gerald. The moment the soup had vanished, the stranger began again. "'Not at all bad soup that, eh, stranger?' I've lapped up worse stuff than that in my time, and been thankful, too. Gerald was amused and interested. A more irritable or a more fastidious man might have been annoyed by the familiar volubility and demonstrative eating powers of the stranger, but Gerald was always eager in his capacity of journalist to study types of any kind, and this type seemed sufficiently remarkable. So he answered with a friendly smile that he thought the food at the voyages was pretty good, and having so far ingratiated himself with his companion, he artfully proceeded to sound him by asking him if he did not think it was generally satisfactory. The stranger had, by this time, dispatched with amazing swiftness a large plate of salmon, and to the utter discomfiture of the solemn waiter, had handed him the empty plate with the order to bring some more of that. The waiter staggered in helpless indignation over to the diplomatic steward. 
the diplomatic steward apparently allowed the eccentric demand to pass unchallenged for a second portion of fish was placed before the stranger who in the interval had packed his large mouth almost as full as it could hold with bread and proceeded to address gerald through that medium why the fact is stranger that this is the very first time i've ever waltzed into this shanty fact sir by this time the bread had disappeared and in its place the stranger was packing away large portions of salmon without ever allowing the packing process to interfere at all with the current of his conversation what's more curious too it's the first time that ever i have been on this blessed little island of yourn i only landed at liverpool this morning gerald allowed his curiosity to get the better of his politeness besides he saw from the free and easy manner of the stranger that he was not a man who would readily take offence at any little departure from the ordinary rules of social etiquette so gerald with the gracious manner which he assumed whenever it fell to his lot to interview some great statesman for the columns of the catapult inquired of the stranger how it happened that he had come to belong to the voyagers and why he had made his appearance within its walls on the evening of his first arrival in london well now that's mighty curious too the stranger answered not in the least annoyed or embarrassed by gerald's questions why you see it came about in this way it was over there on the felt on the eternalest tarnationest durndest hot day it was ever my luck to strike gerald wondered where the felt was but the many-coloured stranger seemed to assume that his listener knew all about that for he went on talking and eating very quickly though he generally asked for a second helping of everything that was offered to him he consumed his food with such rapidity that he had already caught up with gerald who was just eating an anchovy on toast whoa but it was hot though even noah didn't like it though he could stand the heat pretty well there always was a bit of blazes about noah this was interpolated in a confidential way to gerald as if gerald was familiar with noah but not so familiar as to be unwilling to hear an independent opinion upon him the name however only conjured up in gerald's mind a childish memory of a wooden little gentleman in a blue gown and a brown hat whose children and whose wives had all an amazing resemblance to each other so he simply nodded and the stranger went on yes sir it was hot i tell you fact so i just happened into the tent for a little shade and saw the nekulin here the stranger emptied at a draught a tall tumbler of whisky and soda which he had commanded and signified to the waiter with a wink to bring him another where was i he asked after wiping his lips with an enormous red handkerchief in the tent in the shade gerald prompted politely why yes of course after drinking something cooling well i just sat down feeling quite calm and pleasant just in the mood for a little light literature but there wasn't much literature knocking about on the felt you bet gerald smiled a smile of grave sympathy with the deficiencies of the felt well the only thing i could find to read was a number of the daily news that had come up country round some tay it was two months old but that wasn't bad for the felt well sir the first thing that caught my eye in that journal was a paragraph about the voyagers club that was about to be started in london then i says to myself seth old pard you've done a good bit of voyaging in your time so that's all right then i says to myself 
Seth, old pard, it's a good deal more nor likely that you'll be waltzing over to London one of these days, so that's all right. Then I says to myself, Seth, old pard, when you're in London it would be quite the high-toned thing for you to belong to a real club, all smart fixin's. So I just wrote off a letter to the shop as was boomin' the show, a shop with the name of a bird. Raven, suggested Gerald. Right you are, stranger, got it first time. Raven it was. Well now, when I seed that name it set me thinkin'. The stranger looked so intently into Gerald's face as he said this, that Gerald was forced out of ordinary politeness to inquire, Why? Why? Because we had a chum in camp with just such a name, though it wasn't the name he went by among the boys. We always called him Gentleman Jim. We did, poor boy. The stranger sighed and dropped into silence for a few moments. Why, poor boy? Gerald asked, in order to show some interest. He was murdered lately. Poor old Jim, gentleman Jim. The melancholy recollection which had induced the stranger to interrupt his narrative soon passed off. He took a deep drink and resumed. Well, I went to gentleman Jim and I showed him that bit of the newspaper. "'Air you two birds of the same feather, anyhow?' says I. And he looked up and laughed and said, "'Why, bless you, man, that's my brother.' Then, says I, "'Perhaps you wouldn't mind giving me a line to him?' And I explained my notions about belonging to a high-toned club. Then he laughed again and said that he and his brother weren't particularly good pals, but he did give me the letter after a bit, and I sent it along to old man Raven on this side, with a note of my own, allowing as I had been a pretty slick voyager in my time, and could figure in along with the smartest child in his record. Gerald could hardly restrain a smile as he thought of the amused face of Captain Jackdaw when he read this strange epistle. But he did restrain it, or rather converted it into a look of still more absorbing interest in the traveller's tale, and the traveller went on. Well, time went on, and time went on, and the felt went on, and the diamonds went on, which was the best of all. Times were, it seemed to me, as if there was a big blazing diamond for every drop of water in the felt— but one day, when I had clean forgotten all about it, there came a letter to me addressed all right to Seth Chickering, Esquire, Ooms and Streck, Blumenfeld, South Africa. It was from Mr. John Raven, sending his kind regards to his brother, and telling me, in more high-toned language than I can tell you, that I had been duly elected a member of the Voyagers' Club, and would I be good enough to forward a cheque for my subscription? Well, I was good enough. Seth Chickering could write as many cheques as he liked, I guess, for more stiffish figures nor that, and never notice, eh? This last ejaculation was fired at Gerald, in an interrogative way, with a faint suspicion of defiance in it. So Gerald hastened to answer, No doubt, of course, with all the sincerity possible. The man in yellow ochre seemed mollified and went on. You bet I felt good that day, member of a high-toned London club. I guess my head was a little too big for me that day, for Noah and I had words, and we came to blows pretty near, which would have been bad for Noah. Gerald glanced at the great red hands as they lay on the table with the great white diamond blazing, and thought that very possibly it might have been bad for Noah if he had got into any physical controversy with Mr. Seth Chickering. Well, Mr. Chickering went on, time came and time went, and a pretty good time it was, considering everything. 
Why, when I was a bit of a boy and used to read fairy tales and such likes, with their talk of jewels and precious stones and such like, I didn't think there were so many diamonds in the world as just came rolling into our hands there on the felt. And we weren't the only ones neither, but we were the luckiest, and by a long way too, I will say that. Say now, what do you think of that? Mr. Chickering dipped his hand into a hip pocket of his yellow oak trousers and produced a small canvas bag tied with a piece of string. He slowly unfastened the string and then, turning the mouth of the bag downwards, shook its contents carefully out on the white tablecloth. A little flood of diamonds ran out of the bag and settled like a glittering, glowing pool of silver fire upon the white tablecloth. Gerald could not avoid giving a cry of surprise, for the stones were unusually large and very splendid in colour and water, and they gleamed and winked in a fascinating, opulent way as they lay on the cloth. Mr. Chickering leaned back in his chair and enjoyed largely Gerald's looks of admiration and surprise. "'Pretty sparklers, ain't they?' he inquired, with a beaming smile all over his red brick countenance. "'Don't see them sort of things lying around promiscuous on a club table every day, eh, pard?' Gerald admitted to himself and to the big man that he did not— Gerald knew little about the value of precious stones. His journalistic omniscience was not often tested in that way, but he could not help thinking that if they were real, as there seemed no reason to doubt that they were, he had never seen the equivalent of so much money so lightly treated before. "'They are very beautiful,' he said. "'Beautiful!' "'I should think they were,' the big man answered. "'But they're not the most beautiful I've seen or handled, not by a long chalk. "'What do you say to these?' And he drew from another pocket another little canvas bag. Untying the string, he shook another little pile of diamonds onto the tablecloth at a little distance from the first pile. "'Them's more beautiful,' he said." So they were, undoubtedly, larger, finer, more brilliant. They looked exceedingly pretty as they gleamed and sparkled on the white tablecloth, and the big man seemed to take an almost childish delight in their glitter, for he pushed them about with his big red forefinger, and smoothed them out with his big red palm, and appeared to be as pleased as a child with a new toy, in noticing how they caught the light and flashed prismatically. Gerald glanced around uneasily. There was something reckless in the way in which the stranger scattered his diamonds about the table, which made him feel nervous. He felt sure that everybody else must be looking at them, and he was reassured to find that the room had nearly emptied and that most of the diners had gone away. Near the screen that led into the regions of the kitchen, some of the waiters were gathered together, glancing at the table where he sat and whispering discreetly together. Undoubtedly the big man made himself an object of remark, but Gerald hoped that they had not noticed the diamonds. The stranger, meanwhile, seemed only to enjoy the effect that his display of diamonds had produced upon Gerald. "'I tell you, Pard,' he said, confidentially leaning across the table and speaking with all the solemn gravity natural to a man who had just drunk four whiskies and soda, I tell you, pard, there's a strange story to do with those diamonds. Fact. He gazed at Gerald with a kind of alcoholic intensity, as if he expected Gerald immediately to express a desire for the whole history of the diamonds. If he had any such expectations, they were disappointed, for Gerald said nothing. 
he was wondering to himself who on earth this extraordinary man could be. The extraordinary man seemed determined to pour the history of his diamonds into Gerald's ears. "'Tell you what, Pard, I'll tell you all about those diamonds. I like you. You're a white man, you are, and when Seth Chickering says a man's a white man, you may bet your boot soles he ain't no dog and nigger. No, sir.' Gerald wondered vaguely how far Mr. Seth Chickering's emphatic commendation would approve him in the eyes of the world at large, and of, say, the editor of the Catapult in particular. Indeed, just then Mr. Seth Chickering did not seem to be quite the man whose certificate of character would carry any great weight with it. His face glowed redder than ever, his big eyes were staring at Gerald with a slightly alcoholic enthusiasm, and his manner and gestures were, to say the least of it, peculiar. However, Gerald endeavoured to force his countenance into an expression of gratitude at Mr. Chickering's approval. "'Yes, sirree!' Mr. Chickering repeated emphatically. You are a white man. That's what you are, a white man, and you shall hear all about the diamonds. Gerald began, from the mere force of repetition, to feel a certain interest in the threatened story about the diamonds. Indeed, it would be difficult not to feel strong emotions of some sort about this wild man, who scattered precious stones in such profusion over the dining-table of a London club. "'Hadn't you better take those up?' Gerald suggested, pointing to the shining stones. "'Some of them might get lost, you know.' Mr. Chickering raked them together with his big red hands as if they had been pebbles, and shoveled them into their little bag again. "'Plenty more where they come from. Them's only specimens. Just you listen, and I'll tell you all about them.' Gerald glanced at his watch. It was not quite ten, still a long time before he needed to think of going to his festivity. "'Very well,' he said. "'I shall be delighted to hear the story of the diamonds. "'But suppose we have it outside, where we can smoke?' Mr. Chickering nodded approval. "'Right you are, Pard. "'I can always talk better when I have tobacco between my teeth. "'Where's your darn smoking-room?' He drained his glass as he spoke, and weighing on the table with his big red hands lifted himself into a standing position. Gerald rose also, and led the way. The regular smoking-room of the club was downstairs, but there was a small room, a kind of alcove on the landing between the ground floor and the first floor, on which the dining-room was, where members could also smoke, and this little alcove was a favourite resort of Gerald's. So he piloted his new friend thither, planted him upon the comfortable sofa which ran all around it as in an eastern divan, ordered coffee and liquors, and seating himself by Mr. Chickering's side, asked him what he would smoke. Mr. Chickering said he would take what he called a cigarette. Gerald offered him his case, took one himself, and leaned back waiting till Mr. Chickering had lit up and was ready to begin his narrative. This was not long. Mr. Chickering took a considerable quantity of smoke into his lungs, allowed it to roll forth again in steady volumes through his nostrils, gave a sigh of satisfaction, and began his story. End of chapter 2《Chapter 3 of Red Diamonds by Justin McCarthy》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter 3 A Strange Story You liked those diamonds? Gerald nodded. 
"'Shows your taste, young man, shows your taste. "'But we can do better than that, you bet on the felt. "'Just look here.' The stranger thrust a red finger and a thumb into a yellow ochre waistcoat pocket, and fished out something which he placed upon the little table where the coffee cups stood. The something was a large diamond, one of the largest Gerald had ever seen. It was as large around as a shilling, and it glittered with strange fires. Gerald gave an involuntary cry of surprise. "'What a splendid stone!' he said. "'I believe you, pard,' said Mr. Chickering, leaning back on the sofa and enjoying the wonder of his companion. "'That's a dandy stone, that is, and no mistake about it. But that's not our boss stone, no how. We can go better than that at the felt yonder.' and Mr. Chickering made a slight backward motion with his head, as if the felt were somewhere in the immediate vicinity of St. James's Square, say, somewhere up in German Street. Gerald took the stone in his hands. He was no skilled lapidary, but it needed no skilled lapidary to tell at a glance that such a diamond was exceptionally beautiful and exceptionally valuable. "'If you have many more diamonds like that,' he said with a smile, "'you must be a tolerably rich man.' Mr. Chickering leaned back on the sofa and laughed heartily. "'Well, yes,' he said, "'I reckon I'm pretty comfortably off. Oh, there's quite enough to go round up there.' Here he again jerked his head in the direction of St. James's Square and the Felt. There would be plenty enough to go round if there had been more of us standing in than there were. That mine didn't peter out in a hurry, I reckon. Gerald handed him back the diamond, which, while he had been talking, he had kept in the hollow of his hand, admiring its weight and its beauty, and thinking of the enormous difference that the possession of a few stones like that made to a man. "'If I had only a handful of stones like that,' he thought to himself, "'it might be good-bye catapult and hey westward, oh!' for a journey round the world. But if he thought this, all he said was, as he dropped the shining stone back into Mr. Chickering's red palm, "'You and your friends must be very lucky.' "'That's as it may be,' was Mr. Chickering's laconic remark. Then they were both silent for a while, puffing away at their cigarettes. Gerald was meditating upon the curious chance which made his yellow ochre friend a millionaire, while he, Gerald, who could spend money with so much enjoyment to himself, was the bond-slave of the catapult for six guineas a week. That very morning Gerald had thought himself a very lucky and very well-paid young man, as indeed he was, and he really was very fond of the catapult but the sight of that glittering image of wealth in the red fist of the stranger had troubled him. The sound of Mr. Chickering's voice startled Gerald from his brown study. "'The funny part of it is that some of them don't know their luck.' "'Some of your friends don't know their luck?' Gerald was beginning to get quite interested in Mr. Chickering and his unknown friends. "'Well, they ain't my friends yet, but they will be, I reckon, when they find out what I've got to say to them. It isn't every day that a man turns up from South Africa and says, "'Here's a small fortune in diamonds for you, is it now?' Thus appealed to, Gerald was compelled to admit that the event was not diurnal. In fact, up to now, it had not happened to him at all. He wished it would.' At this pleasantry Mr. Chickering laughed heartily. He surveyed Gerald good-humouredly. "'I wish it did for your sake,' he said, "'for I've taken quite a fancy to you, Pard. Who knows if I shall take a fancy to the others when I find them?' 
when you find them? Do you mean that you have got to look for them? Hit it, stranger, first go off. That's exactly what I do mean. Seth Chickering has got to cavort around until he claps hands upon certain people whom he has never heard of until a year ago and never seen in all his life. How's that for high, eh? Gerald thought it very high indeed, too high for his comprehension. Mr. Chickering condescended to explain. He had mellowed to a narrative point, and Gerald was sufficiently interested to be very willing to sit there and listen to him. "'You see,' he said, "'it's this way. Suppose you imagine that certain gentlemen get together and say to themselves among themselves, "'You and me will go parts and play the square game and share and share alike. Suppose that now.' Mr. Chickering glanced appealingly at Gerald as he put his proposition forward. Gerald nodded in token that he was quite willing to suppose so much. "'Very well,' Mr. Chickering went on, evidently flattered by this proof of his listener's readiness. "'Very well. Suppose further that some of these parts say to others of these parts, "'Right you are, old man, every time.' Mr. Chickering paused, as a man might pause who had announced to his audience some soul-stirring, some world-startling truth. Gerald was neither stirred nor startled, but he did not wish to seem indifferent, so he simply nodded and said, "'Of course.' "'And of course it is,' said Mr. Chickering cheerily. "'Some of these parts say to others of these parts,' Look a here, mister, we don't care one derned red cent for what we snakes out of this here load, but there are those in the world as we do care for a derned deal more than our derned old selves, and so suppose as how we fixes it this away. And it was fixed that away. What away? said Gerald, unconsciously falling into the phraseology of his new friend, as that new friend paused in his talk. "'Why, this way,' answered Mr. Chickering. "'Says part number one, "'Money ain't so much account to me,' says he. "'But there's a little girl away in London thousands and thousands of miles from here "'who might find that money sweet in her young life. "'It's for her I hope to get rich.' says part number one. And very creditable of him, too, murmured Gerald, for Mr. Chickering had paused, and the expression of his fiery face seemed to betoken that he thought Gerald ought to say something. You're right, stranger, right as can be, he went on cheerily after Gerald's observation. Part number one was a white man, he was. Poor old part. Then up gets part number two, and what does part number two say? Why, part number two says, Well, money ain't much account to me neither, if it comes to that, though it was a darned deal too much to me once, says he. But I have a boy over there in London these thousands of miles away, says he, and I should like him to have money, says part number two. Again Mr. Chickering paused, again Gerald murmured something complimentary to the character of part number two, again Mr. Chickering resumed his narrative. Then part number three, Walston. That was Noah, that was. Noah Bland. Well, says Noah Bland, I guess I ain't a-going to go to the high-toned with any bluff about not caring for money, for I do. And he did too, the cuss. "'But I've a kid over in London, too,' says he. "'If it comes to that end, I'll go bail he cares about money, "'if he takes after his father at all. "'And between you and me, stranger, "'if he does take after his father, he must be a daisy, that's all. "'He was a bad man from way back, was Noah Bland.' "'Gerald was beginning to feel faintly drowsy.' The rolling tones of the stranger's voice seemed to flow over him with a soothing effect, and he began to close his eyes involuntarily. But there was something emphatic in the tone in which Mr. Chickering condemned Noah Bland that brought him to himself again with a start. 
"'Yes, sir. Noah Bland was an out-and-out -out tarnation scoundrel. That's what he was. Perhaps you will be wondering why we had anything to do with him, then?' And Mr. Chickering gave Gerald an interrogative stare. Gerald admitted that the question was pertinent to his thoughts. "'Why did we have anything to do with him?' said Mr. Chickering. "'Why, because we couldn't help it, that's why. "'Twas he as had the notion first about that claim. "'But as he hadn't nary sent to work it with, "'why, he came to us five chums.' "'Oh, there were five of you,' said Gerald, "'seeing that Mr. Chickering expected him to say something. "'Why, of course we were. "'One of them was Gentleman Jim, what I told you of. "'The other was... "'But I don't matter about him. "'He was a pal of Gentleman Jim's, "'but he got up and gitted before we struck Isle, as it were. "'Gentleman Jim put his brother's name into the biz, "'and his pal put a sister, "'and so there we all were, you see, "'fixed up fair and square and comfortable.' "'Gerald filled up the pause which followed "'each of Mr. Chickering's deliveries "'by trying to sketch for himself a fancy portrait of Mr. Noah Bland. But the attempt was not satisfactory, and before it could be completed Mr. Chickering was under way again. "'Well,' he went on in a rambling way, with a voice in which repeated libations had developed an alarming tendency to vagueness, "'to make a long story short, we settled it this away. It was evident that Mr. Chickering's mental process had outstripped the vocal process, and that the narrative he was now relating to Gerald was but the sequel to a lengthier narrative which had flashed through his excited brain, but which had found no verbal form. "'We agreed to stand in together, each for each, and all for all, like one of them durned tontine rigouts you may have heard tell on.' Life's pretty cheap out there on the felt, what with the fever and the niggers and the firewater, and a general casualness in the shootin' iron line, and when a man gets out of his blanket in the morning, he durstn't bet his pile that he'll roll into it again at night. No, sir. Mr. Chickering sighed deeply as he uttered this axiom. It occurred to Gerald that it had a certain applicability to other places besides the felt, but he held his tongue, for he began to feel as if he had had enough of Mr. Chickering's story, and he feared that interruptions might delay its conclusion. "'Well,' resumed Mr. Chickering, "'we fixed it up that we was all to share equally in the mine, and if any one of us dropped out, as might happen, you know, part any day, we'd all stand in equal for his share too, unless he happened to have kids or kin to whom he wished that it should go. I ain't got no child myself, for the very good reason that I never got married, nor no relatives I know of, but the other parts, they had children or relatives, every man jack em, this one a boy and that one a girl, and this one a brother and that one a sister, and Noah Bland had his beauty, for a beauty he must be if he takes after old man Noah, for certain sure. There was another pause during which Mr. Chickering, after draining his tumbler, gazed moodily at the floor, apparently engaged in conjuring up past scenes of felt life. It was obvious that the story which he was telling to Aspen was going on in his mind all the time that he was silent, and that when he spoke, he took up the thread not at the point where he had audibly left off, but at the moment to which his somewhat confused meditations had carried him. He sighed heavily now, and fixing a somewhat bloodshot eye upon Gerald, he said, well, we must all peter out sooner or later, but I was mighty sorry for those two shops, you bet. Now, if it had been Noah, I shouldn't have cared a darn. But it weren't Noah no how. It was all Noah's doin', darn him. Was it indeed? Gerald asked. He found the thread of the narrative difficult to follow, but he wished to please Mr. Chickering by manifesting an intelligent interest. "'Yes, sir, at least I believe so. 
why it was he the skunk as got up the fight between old warbler and gentleman jim's pal which did for poor old warbler that's why jim's pal left us you know he thought it might be unpleasant for us having him there though it was as fair a fight as ever i seed and i've seen a few you bet and what became of noah gerald questioned for he saw that mr chickering was wandering in the meadows of memory again ay ay said mr chickering to be sure why they hanged him of course did they asked gerald in some astonishment at this sudden and tragic conclusion to a career in which he had been interesting himself who did why the boys in camp for sure there was no mistake about it he dropped poor gentleman jim even if it weren't good enough that the chinaman saw him do it the bullet fitted his pistol and there wasn't another man in camp had a pistol like noah's shot him from behind like the derned coward he was so they strung him up after a fair trial before judge lynch and serve him right too for i believe he poisoned the other sharp and he'd have killed me too if he'd had time enough why should he asked gerald why should he why because he wanted all the claim to himself the selfish thief nice man noah bland gerald murmured nice he was a daisy he was just a daisy why i've seen some pretty tall scoundrels in my time in frisco and elsewhere but for an out-and-out thorough-going scoundrel commend me to noah bland but he died game enough he asked for time to write a letter after the court sentenced him and he gave it to one of the jury to post as coolly as you please and then they turned him off what a strange story gerald observed it certainly seemed a grim story of blood and treasure and crime and lawless law a little confused perhaps but that was owing to mr chickering's way of telling his tale after that said mr chickering i shut up shop the claim was about petered out but i sold it for a fancy figure we'd got all our diamonds safely stored at the government bank in cape town and a pretty fortune they made and so being alone in the world as it were i allowed that the best thing i could do was just to come across to england and look after the rightful heirs i guess they'll think they're lucky sharps when i find them out and tell em the piece of news i've got for em and we've got it all fixed up in a lawyer's deed and the money is to be shared out on next new year's the first of january next right you are we call it new year's gerald felt dimly conscious that one of the sharps must be captain jackdaw he was about to say so when mr chickering rose with a sigh it was not surprising that thoughts of such a past should arouse mr chickering's regrets and mr chickering himself was evidently blissfully unaware that there were any gaps in his narrative well he said the best of friends must part whether on the felt yonder or here in babylon and i guess it's time to say good-night young gentleman he held out his great red hand on which the big white diamond blazed and gerald rising extended his own to meet it when suddenly mr chickering withdrew his proffered hand in order to thrust it into his breast-coat pocket young man he said with a gravity which a determined intention to master the insidious slothfulness of his drinks made most portentous young man i like you and when seth chickering says he likes a man he means it you bet the whole way and a bit beyond too maybe and when i like a man i trust him and i'm a-going to trust you will you do me a favour pard gerald looked at him in wonder what on earth was coming for a moment the unworthy idea of a demand for a small loan flitted across his mind to be immediately rejected mr chickering eyed him inquiringly why of course gerald stammered i shall be delighted to be of any service to you 
A stranger in a strange land? That's bully, Mr. Chickering replied, evidently much encouraged by Gerald's answer, and withdrawing his hand from his breast pocket, he displayed to Gerald's gaze a very fat brown leather pocket book, fastened with a clasp and a girt with a strong band. Do you see that there wallet, mister? said Mr. Chickering. Gerald nodded. "'Well, I want you to take charge of that there wallet for me till tomorrow. "'It's a darned sight too precious for me to risk losing it, "'and I know I'm a bit careless like when I've had a drink or two, "'and I've had a drink or two tonight, I don't deny. "'Also, this year's city's new to me, "'and I propose to take a little pass car round it "'and see what the saloons are like and the girls, "'and the fixins generally.' and it might be just as well not to have that there little wallet on board. So if you don't mind, part, will you just take care of it till tomorrow, when I ask you for it? You happen in here most every day, I guess. Yes, I do come here every day, Gerald answered, and of course if you wish it I will accept your charge, but isn't there somebody else, the landlord of your hotel, the steward of the club— Mr. Chickering shook his head decidedly. "'No, sir,' he said decisively. "'You're the man I can trust. I see that in your eye. So there you are, my young friend.' And Mr. Chickering thrust the pocket-book into Gerald's hesitating fingers. Gerald looked at him dubiously. "'Would you like me to go out with you?' he asked. "'I've got an engagement at eleven, but up to then—' Mr. Chickering waved the offer genially away. "'Not at all, part, not at all. Thanks to you all the same. But I like to knock about a new town, and I like to do it by myself. I've knocked about by myself all my life, and I ain't tired of it yet, no, sir. But you're a white man, you are, and we'll have a good time one of these fine days.' He crushed Gerald's right hand in an iron grip, and moved heavily away, leaving Gerald speechless with surprise on the divan, holding the pocket-book in his left hand, and gazing after the retreating figure. Mr. Chickering lumbered down the stairs into the hall, a strange yellow ochre colossus, extracted an enormous stick from the stand, and passed out through the glass doors into the night, while a group of attendants clustered together to gaze wonderingly after the unwanted apparition. "'I wonder,' said Gerald to himself, "'if I ought to accept his trust. I wonder if I ought to let him go about by himself.' He got up and stood for a moment reflectively at the head of the stairs. "'He has been drinking a lot,' Gerald mused. "'But he seems to be used to that, and to be used to looking after himself in wilder parts of the world even than London at night, though that is wild enough, heaven knows.' Gerald had the true journalist's respect for London, which he believed to be the premier city in all things. Still he felt vaguely uneasy. He thrust the pocket-book into his breast-pocket, and ran down the stairs with a half-formed intention of pursuing Mr. Chickering and getting some more definite information, about what he scarcely knew, from him. He slipped on his coat and passed out into the square. It was a starless night, but it was not obscure. It was what sailors call a clear dark night. Gerald stood on the steps of the club, hansoms were darting hither and thither, their lamps gleaming like the eyes of strange monsters in some mysterious jungle. There were not many passers-by, but those there were had none of them the mighty build of Mr. Chickering. Gerald walked a few paces rapidly to the left, and then retracing his steps walked a few paces rapidly to the right, but his efforts were vain. Short as the time had been in which he had waited, hesitating in the alcove, it was long enough to allow Mr. Chickering to get out of sight. The stranger had disappeared into the vastness of London. End of chapter 3
Chapter Four of Red Diamonds by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Four, in the doorway. As Gerald stood at the club door, a carriage drove up and stopped. The carriage door opened and a man got out. Gerald knew the man at once. He was Captain Raven. He stood for some moments at the open carriage door talking to the ladies, its occupants. They were, as Gerald could see distinctly, ladies. Two ladies. One, the one nearest to the door, was very young and very pretty. Gerald got a kind of bewildering, delightful impression of a delicate oval face and a pair of bright eyes, of a mass of soft, fair hair. The other inmate of the carriage, Gerald could see less distinctly, but she was evidently an older woman. It was to her that Captain Raven was talking. The young girl had glanced through her window at the club and at Gerald standing in the doorway, and it was in this brief glance that Gerald had received the bewildering impression of beauty. Then the young lady had turned away, and Gerald only got a glimpse of her side face as she nestled in the white down of her cloak. "'It was really most kind of you to drop me,' Captain Raven said. "'Not at all,' the elder lady responded, and Gerald liked her voice for its firm, kind tone. "'It is not in the least out of our way. You will not forget the great occasion.' "'Could I possibly?' Captain Raven answered gallantly, while memory holds her seat in this distracted globe." "'We shall make a convert of you in time,' the elder lady replied. "'I am converted already,' said the captain. "'At least you shall see that women can do some things as well as men. You will show him what fencing is like, won't you, dear?' Captain Raven turned his face to the young girl. "'That will be indeed delightful.' The girl laughed a delightful laugh, and spoke in a delightful voice. "'Wait till you see it, Captain Raven. Don't form rash hopes.' "'I shall form hopes, but they will not be rash. So many thanks. Good night.' Captain Raven closed the carriage door, raised his hat, the ladies nodded, and the carriage drove rapidly away in the direction of King Street. Raven, turning round, recognized Gerald. He greeted him cheerfully. "'Hello, Aspen, my boy, how are you?' "'I'm all right,' Gerald answered. "'I say, look here, I want to speak with you.' "'Certainly, my dear fellow, certainly. Nothing wrong with the club, I hope. No complaint, no appeal to the committee?' Gerald laughed. "'No, no, the club is all right. I just want a word with you.' "'Right you are. Did you see those women? Charming women.' "'Yes. Who were they?' "'What? Don't you know? Oh, you must know them. Of course you've heard of them, though, a newspaper man like you.' The two men were still standing in the porch of the club. Gerald had his hand upon the swing door, and Raven was looking with an air of half-real, half-affected sentimentality in the direction of King Street, as if to his fancy the wheels of the departing carriage had left behind them a hallowed track of golden fire. Gerald could not help laughing at the troubadour air of the cynical club's secretary. "'What a fellow you are, Raven,' he said. "'Who are they, anyhow?' "'My dear boy,' said Raven solemnly, "'one of those two ladies was the charming Lady Scardale, "'the other was the still more charming Miss Locke.' "'Gerald almost started with surprise. "'What, Fidelia?' he asked. "'Captain Raven eyed him curiously. "'Oh, then you have heard of her,' he said. "'That is Miss Fidelia Locke.' "'I heard of her by mere chance,' Gerald hastened to explain. "'Her name was on a card of invitation I received. 
in the regular way of business, to some function at some college or other of which Lady Scardale, of course I have heard of Lady Scardale, was the patroness, and Miss Locke's name was on the card. Captain Raven nodded. That is to be a big business, that function, he said. Sort of going to teach the world how to revolve out of its own orbit, I believe. Dear Lady Scardale, she's as good and kind a woman as ever breathed, and she'd be as happy as she's good if only she'd married a good man. But there aren't many men with that complaint about. And Captain Raven laughed. And Miss Locke? Gerald queried tentatively. Oh, Miss Locke is a charming young woman to whom Lady Scardale acts as guide, philosopher, and friend. She's awfully clever and awfully advanced, and Lady Scardale thinks no end of her, and so do a lot of other people as well as Lady Scardale. This time Captain Raven did not laugh. And she is pretty, said Gerald, answering aloud to his own silent thoughts. If he had gone on as he began, he would have added, and she doesn't wear spectacles and carry a baggy umbrella after all. Pretty? I should think she is. She's just beautiful. I wish all the women in the world were as pretty. By Allah, life would be like the seventh heaven in that case. Captain Raven had travelled considerably in the East, and was fond of the East, and amused himself as his friends by affecting occasionally a Mohammedanism of language and attitude towards Occidental life. However, he added, I suppose that wasn't what you wanted to talk to me about, the charms of Miss Fidelia Locke? Oh, no, indeed, said Gerald. Then let's get inside and have it out. Captain Raven pushed the door open and the pair entered the hall together. Raven divested himself of his coat, a fur coat, though the April was mild, for the gallant captain professed an oriental susceptibility to cold as well as to female beauty. "'Let us go into the morning-room,' said Raven. "'Perhaps there is nobody there.' Into the morning-room they went, with its series of fine engravings of famous travellers all around the walls. Nobody was there as it happened, so Raven and Aspen sat down and Raven began to smoke. "'Now then,' said Raven, "'fire away. What is it?' "'Did you ever,' asked Gerald, "'hear of a man named Seth Chickering?' "'Seth Chickering.' Captain Raven blew a cloud of smoke into the air and reflected while it evaporated. Seth Chickering, Seth Chickering. Oh, why, yes, at least. No, I never knew him, but that's the name of a man who was elected to this club some time ago. What do you know about him? Nothing much, but he was here tonight. The deuce he was! Where did he turn up from? Raven was leaning against the mantelpiece, looking down at Gerald, who had dropped into an armchair. Gerald, looking up at him, could not help contrasting him in his mind with the man they were talking about, with the man who had just left him a few minutes ago. Raven was very tall and slightly built. His black hair was closely cut, his black moustache was carefully waxed, his black eyes were very bright. The almost Spanish darkness of his skin lent something of what the French call a fatal air to his appearance. He was very carefully dressed, and there was about him something of that curious compound of skill, quiet strength, and audacity which suggested a blend of the lady's riding-master with the high-toned Mississippi gambler. Yet with every word he spoke, with every gesture he made, it was plain that he was a gentleman. An adventurer, perhaps, he would scarcely have denied that, but certainly a gentleman adventurer. Yes, he was curiously unlike Seth Chickering, and it was odd they should have any connection together. 
Well, said Gerald, he seems to have turned up from South Africa. He sat at my table and told me a long, rambling tale, which I couldn't quite make out. But there's a lot about a diamond mine, and he had a lot of diamonds with him, and he talked of your brother. Yes, I have a brother somewhere out there, Raven remarked. Do you know I am very much afraid from something he said that your brother is no longer alive? Ah, is poor old Jim dead? Raven gave a little sigh, and followed it by a little shrug of the shoulders. We weren't very fond of each other. None of our family ever are. A pity, I suppose. Can't be helped, eh? Of course I can't be sure, Gerald went on. He may be mistaken, or I may have misunderstood him. It was a most rambling story altogether, but anyhow it ended up by his drinking more than was good for him. Then he insisted on going out, and he also insisted on my taking charge of a pocket-book for him. He seemed to have taken a sort of fancy for me. "'I'm not surprised,' said Raven good-humouredly. Raven liked Gerald. He who had seen so much of the world and its ways liked the energetic, enthusiastic young man who had seen so little of either, and whose very cocksuredness was entertaining to so old a hand as Captain Jackdaw. Well? Well, I took the pocket-book, but really I don't know if I ought to have. I went to the door to give it back to him, but he had gone, and just then you drove up. Look here, Raven, don't you think that as you are secretary of the club, I might entrust this document to your safekeeping? Raven laughed. No, thank you, my boy. Catch me accepting any responsibility I am not obliged to accept. No, you've taken the pocket book, and you'd better take care of it until you can give it to him again. Where's he staying? He didn't say. Did he make any appointment? Oh, yes, he said he would come to the club tomorrow, and then he would claim his pocket-book. Well, there you are. You've only got to keep it till then. I shall take care to be on the spot tomorrow, and see this Seth Chickering. I'd like to be sure about Jim, too. Gerald was going to say something to Raven about the possible heritage of diamonds, but then he thought he had better not. After all, Seth Chickering's tale might not be true, or Gerald might have mistaken its drift. Anyhow, it was no use to let Raven prematurely think himself the heir to an inheritance of diamonds. So Gerald held his peace. "'Well,' said Raven, "'what are you going to do now? Come and have a game at billiards.' "'No, thanks,' said Gerald. I am off to a function, magnificent show, Metropole. You'll see all about it in the catapult. Shall I? said Raven. Then in that case I won't bother about going myself. It would be a pity to take the edge off my appreciation of your splendid description by forming any previous acquaintance with the dull, commonplace reality. That's good of you, said Gerald. Well, I'm off. Good night. "'Good night,' said Raven. They had walked together into the hall. Raven lounged slowly up the staircase in the direction of the billiard-room. Gerald climbed into his overcoat and went off to his festivity. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of Red Diamonds by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Five. What happened in St James's Street? St James's Street must always be a steady source of delight to the serious lover of London. In its antiquity and its exceeding modernity, at the same time, it exercises upon the true lover something of the same charm of abidingness, of permanency, which makes the charm of Rome. For just as Rome in its great degree has gone on in an unbroken history ever since Romulus leaped over the mud wall, and with that history one might say increasing and not diminishing in interest with the ages, 
so in its lesser degree st james's street presents the same spectacle of unfading vitality in this street are clubs that bore the same name when the world was well nigh two centuries younger when the world was well nigh two centuries younger st james's street was the centre of all that was social all that was political all that was brilliant and witty and for the matter of that wicked in the world of london the two centuries that have made hampstead and chelsea alike parts of london which have turned the city of Anne into the hugest metropolis in the world, have left St. James's Street very much what they found it. Altered externally, it remains in spirit the same, the centre of all that is social, all that is political, all that is brilliant and witty and wicked in the world of London. Talk of haunted places, no place in the world is more haunted than st james's street not lonely karnak nor the ruin crowned acropolis nor the Colosseum. well may the vision of the dreamer call up mummified egypt in the hall of the kings people the parthenon with the youths and maidens of the panathenaic festival and crowd the deserted amphitheatre with the stately shades of imperial rome these are ruins the world has passed them by in their desolation they are the very places for the dreamer to sit in and conjure up the ghosts of antique time but st james's street with all its animation its crowd its movement day and night with its stately buildings its never-ending never varying throng of passers-by st james's street is to the true visionary as ghostly a spot as any ruined temple that egypt greece or italy can offer such a visionary standing in the window of a st james's street club sees with his mind's eye all the famous figures of some six generations trooping by st john and swift harley and hervey johnson and goldsmith and wild richard savage the greater fox and the lesser pitt and the walpole who wrote letters and evil q and good richardson and great berg and beau brummel and d'orsay and byron what a company what ghosts what memories the pillars of karnak the hill of athena the circle of the Colosseum cannot evoke shadows more wonderful than are evoked by this bustling brilliant living london street no reflections of this kind crossed the mind of mr seth chickering as he lumbered into st james's street a few minutes after he had said good-night to gerald he may have heard of st james's street before but if he had the fact awakened no chord in his memory when he now found himself in it he had turned through york street into german street and so striding rapidly if somewhat unevenly along he had found himself in a few seconds on the edge of st james's street he stood at the corner of german street looking up and down at piccadilly glittering on his right at the distant darkness of st james's park on his left where the great clock of the palace showed like a moon in the gloom mr chickering swayed for a few moments in uncertainty as to the course he should take he had drunk a good deal and though he had a strong head he was a little confused and dizzy and as he paused now he yawned sleepily it may have been this vague sense of fatigue which prompted him to turn to the left rather than to the right to move in the direction of quiet and obscurity rather than in that of noise and brightness anyhow he did turn to the left and made his way more slowly now down st james's street towards the park 
Whatever he was conscious of, he was probably not conscious of the historical nature of the ground he was treading, of all its associations, of all the great and famous ghosts who had gone down that street before him, and whom he was so soon to join. But if no such appropriate reflections crossed the heated brain of Mr. Chickering, they danced agreeably enough in the mind of another pedestrian. Almost at the very moment when Mr. Chickering turned into St. James's Street from German Street, another man turned into St. James's Street from Piccadilly, and proceeded to walk leisurely down its left-hand side. He was a man who was fond of indulging in occasional reflections, and if these reflections were often of a somewhat obvious kind, he had at least made them in so many out-of-the-way parts of the world that the triteness of the reflections gained a dignity from the strangeness of the circumstances which evoked them. Just now St. James's Street seemed stranger than the desert and odder than Siberia to the meditative gentleman who smoked his cigar and sauntered lazily along, pleasing his thoughts by feeding them on the former fortunes of St. James's Street, and amusing himself by mentally conjuring up the shades of St. John and of Fox to keep him company. Suddenly he dismissed those stately ghosts from his mind. Some considerable distance away he caught sight of a bulky figure, clad in yellow garments, who was lumbering along ahead of him. Something in the gait, something in the garments, troubled the spectator's mind. He came to a halt for a moment, as lounging men will often do when suddenly brought face to face with a problem which requires concentration. The form was familiar to him, he felt sure, the very cut of the garments stirred him with nebulous recollections. What was it? Who was it? That the form was familiar to him the lounger did not doubt for an instant. He had a good memory, but he could not at the moment place the personality. In which of the many parts of the world he had been familiar with, did he boast an acquaintance with a man so built and wearing just such garments? In vain he puzzled, the light would not come. Bah, he said to himself, let us give chase and overtake him, that will solve the mystery. And as he thought he moved briskly forward again. But lo, at that very instant his quarry had vanished. "'The earth has bubbles as the water hath,' he quoted to himself as he paused again, "'and this is of them.' It was certainly a fact, the burly man in the yellow suit whom he had seen only a minute before had vanished, as completely as if the earth had swallowed him. "'Very funny.' muttered the lounger to himself. He can't have gone into a shop because they are all shut. Perhaps he lives here and has entered his lodgings. The meditative individual had fallen back into his slow lounge again and proceeded on his way, scanning with a certain curiosity each house as he passed it, in speculation as to whether it was the one which sheltered the mysterious apparition. Suddenly he came to a pause. He had come, most unexpectedly, to a gap in the continuity of the houses. He was standing at the mouth of a narrow court, which led abruptly off St. James's Street. It was a very narrow court indeed. The entrance was no wider than the width of an ordinary door. It looked very black within, though there seemed to be some kind of feeble light at the end of it. The lounger whistled softly to himself. Well, he mused, I thought I knew St. James's Street pretty well, but I never remember seeing this court before. Live and learn by Jove, to think that I have travelled all over the globe, and learned for the first time of the existence in my most familiar street of a court which possibly dates from the days of Anne. 
He gave a vigorous puff at his cigar. I wonder, he went on reflecting, if my quarry could have dodged down here. As he thought, it seemed to him that he heard the sound of voices dimly down in the darkness, even that he heard something like a fall. I wonder if there's anything going on down there, the lounger asked himself. Let me satisfy a natural curiosity and see. At that second, and as he was just about to advance into the darkness, he received a violent shock. A man rushing right out of the darkness cannoned heavily against him. The lounger was a strong man, and strongly built, but he staggered a little under the force of the impact, and the man who fell against him staggered also. As the rushing newcomer staggered back, he uttered a sound more like a growl of animal rage and fear than any articulate expression, even an oath. For one moment his face was turned towards the man against whom he had reeled, and was distinctly visible in the light of the gas-lamp. A bearded face with a shook head of hair under a workman's hat, the hair of a ruddy colour, that was all the lounger saw in the brief glimpse afforded to him of his unexpected and apparently involuntary assailant. The next moment the man had turned and fled swiftly and noiselessly down the street in the direction of the park, and was out of sight before the lounger had quite recovered his breath. Well, said the lounger to himself, that's a rum way to behave. He was in a blazing hurry and no mistake. What a face the fellow had! What made him so scared, too? As he put these questions to himself, the lounger, still standing in the entrance to the little court, recovered the wind that had been knocked out of him by the vehemence of the fugitive's impetuous. With his recovered breath came the decision to go to the end of the court, the discovery of whose existence had so much surprised him. He walked slowly on. The entrance was dark, narrow, and dirty, running between two houses, and suddenly coming to an end in a square, open place like a yard, walled in by the backs of various buildings. It was a queer, dingy hole enough, the oddest kind of place to associate with St. James's Street. It was quite a small place, about as much space as would be covered by an ordinary house. It was shut in on all sides, except at the mouth of the narrow passage, by the backs of the houses. The backs of dingy houses in crowded localities are seldom cheerful sights, but it seemed to the stranger as if these backs of houses looked especially depressing, and as if the windows with which they were pierced had an exceptionally lugubrious aspect. In some of the windows lights were visible, high above, the blue heaven sparkled with stars. The air of the place was close and oppressive, and the newcomer felt as if he wanted to gasp for breath. What a beastly place, he said to himself, as he stood in the mouth of the opening and looked about him. I wonder if my mysterious friend lives in this hall by any chance. If so, I really do not envy him his choice of residence. He advanced a little, moving cautiously, for the place was not well lighted. A single gas-lamp protruding from the wall could hardly be said to illumine the cheerless spot. "'Talk about darkness visible,' the explorer muttered to himself as he moved forward, still impelled by the curiosity which had led him to penetrate so far. "'I should think this is about the worst-lit place in the world. What a cut-throat kind of hole it is!' As he said this, he came to a pause just under the single gas-lamp. The light this gave forth was indeed wretched. It seemed to fill the dismal spot with uncanny shadows, 
and the lounger shuddered, involuntarily acknowledging the depressing influences of the place. As he did so, his attention was attracted by one shadow more uncanny than the rest, a shadow in a corner that looked like the huddled mass of a fallen body. The explorer advanced towards it resolutely. It was not a shadow, there was something solid there. It was the body of a man lying all in a heap with its face turned to the wall. Is he drunk? the newcomer asked himself. Drunk or... He did not finish his sentence, but stooping down touched the body. The touch was enough to turn it back, and the light fell full on the upturned face. It was the face of a dead man, there was no doubt of that, but it was not the sudden presence of death which so startled the discoverer that he sprang to his feet with a cry of surprise. The face was a familiar one to him, very familiar. Why, he cried, it's Seth Chickering! End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of Red Diamonds by Justin McCarthy》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Six. Mr. Red Gundy. The dead body of Seth Chickering lay on the pavement of this little court within a few yards, a few strides of the great night life of the West End of the clubs and the cabs and carriages, of the evening parties and the footmen and the link boys, of the drinking houses, the cigar shops aflame with light, the tramping feet of the policemen, the trailing skirts of the street walkers. It might have lain there still longer, but that the attention of the police was called shrilly to it by the piercing scream of a whistle, sounding exactly like that which the police themselves put into frequent and dissonant use. The whistle went on again and again, sounding more keen and shrilly each time. A couple of policemen at last came rushing into the little court. There they saw a man lying on the ground and another man standing composedly near him. "'Glad you have come at last,' the latter said, with perfect composure, and turning a cigar between his lips so as to get it more conveniently placed. "'It was lucky for me I learned how to make that whistle with my fingers.' "'Here's a man killed!' "'Killed!' the policeman exclaimed with one voice, but in properly repressed tones. "'It is not wise to call the whole attention of the public to the fact that yonder is foul murder done.' "'Dead as a herring,' the man replied, still in a tone as composed as though he were giving intelligence concerning a slaughtered rat, or a victimized black beetle. The policeman examined the body, and just barely lifted the head. The body was still warm, the limbs had not yet become quite stiff, but poor Seth Chickering was dead. He had been mad at this very first night of his arrival in town. He had seen about six hours of London life all told. Just at this moment a police inspector came up, and in a few seconds was made acquainted with the whole grim story, as much as his subordinates knew about it. Naturally, every eye, and indeed every bull's eye, was now turned upon the stranger, who stood there as composedly as ever. The inspector was not astonished. Inspectors seldom are. In any case, murders are of too frequent an occurrence in London to surprise the most inexperienced of officials, and this particular inspector was a man of very considerable experience. 
He gave his orders quickly and quietly. The great thing was not to arouse any unnecessary alarm. A couple of policemen were immediately stationed at the entrance of the court to keep the curious out. Already people were beginning to stop and a crowd to form, but a couple more policemen judiciously broke the crowd up, preventing it from congregating, and declined to answer all inquiries, so that the passers-by, seeing that no information was forthcoming, soon went their way, and only a few of the most incorrigible of loafers loitered about the entrance of the court. Presently the stretcher and the doctor, for whom the inspector had sent, arrived together. The doctor pronounced the victim to be quite dead, and the body of Seth Chickering was placed upon the stretcher and conveyed to the nearest police station, followed, of course, by a little crowd. In the meantime, the inspector had been having some conversation with the stranger, who had told him very briefly and composedly how he came to be there, and how he had discovered the body. "'Fun of the thing is,' he observed, "'that I knew the poor fellow well.' "'Don't quite see the fun, sir,' the inspector said sternly. "'You will have to give some account of yourself.' "'Well, when I say fun, I don't really mean fun, you know. I'm sorry, very sorry for poor Seth Chickering. What I mean is, it is so odd, you know, that I should be standing just here, and he should be lying just there.' "'It is odd,' the inspector said. "'Very odd. So odd that I must ask you at once to give me some explanation as to how he comes to be there, and you come to be here. As to how he comes to be here, I am sorry I can't give you the faintest notion, for, don't you see, I don't know any more than you do yourselves. As to how I came to be here, the explanation of that fact is as easy as lying. I think these are Hamlet's words. His words are no evidence in this case, the inspector said sharply. This is no trifling business, sir. I think I have made it pretty plain that I didn't consider it quite a trifling business, seeing that I stood here and kept on whistling in a way that might have blown a man's lungs out, and where were you police all the time, I want to know? Patrolling St. James's Street, I dare say, as if there was any likelihood of a murder being committed there. The inspector evaded that question. He certainly had begun with some ugly suspicions about the stranger, but it had to be acknowledged that if the stranger had, for any reason, wished to escape notice, he would simply have had to walk quietly away. He was a handsome man, well-dressed, with a dark drooping moustache, long hair of the Wild West order, and an unkempt beard. He was not tall, but he was built for strength and activity, and had a daredevil look in his bright dark eyes, which would have made him a remarkable figure anywhere. It was perfectly clear that whatever the newcomer had been doing, he was not in a particular alarm about it. "'The queerest coincidence I ever saw,' he remarked emphatically. "'I must trouble you to come with me to the station,' said the inspector. "'I have some questions to put to you still.' "'By all means,' said the stranger, "'as many questions as you like, but if it's all the same to you I should prefer to go in a cab. There is probably a crowd outside, and as I am a modest, retiring man, I should rather not walk up St. James's Street with a procession at my heels. If it's all the same to you, of course, for I have gone through more uncomfortable experiences in my time. It was all the same to Mr. Inspector. 
he explained to the composed stranger that he need not consider himself under arrest but that he must answer some questions the pair walked to the entrance of the court the crowd had practically dispersed following the stretcher on which poor seth lay but there were still one or two people hanging about so the inspector and the stranger jumped into a hansom and drove to the station for a moment it crossed the mind of the inspector that if the stranger had anything to do with the crime he might attempt to escape but he seemed so calmly indifferent that the inspector dismissed the notion from his mind. At the station, the inspector resumed his interrogation. "'May I trouble you for your name?' the inspector asked. "'Rat Gundy,' was the prompt reply. "'Queer sort of Christian name, Rat.' the inspector observed with a look of what might be called well-regulated incredulity now mr inspector the stranger observed i take you to witness that i never said i was a christian i may be a jew i may be a mohammedan i may be a buddhist i may be the follower of madame blavatsky i may be a member of the small and select band who worship at the west central shrine of the late august comte well i don't know anything about him or about them the inspector said i only asked for your name and now you have got it uh, yes will you give it to me over again with pleasure red gundy a rat gundy how do you spell rat one t more than the household scourge or the renegade politician a rat do you see but i may relieve your mind by telling you that i was not christened rat rat is short for randolph randolph is your name oh well i don't want to be too precise as to that randolph is my name now at present the name i choose to go by it is quite as much my name as gundy then you have different names different names for different countries but not many of the whole lot but you may as well come off that mr inspector you won't make much of my change of names i live in the berkeley hotel st james's street and you will find that i have a pretty long account at my bank and i can easily get plenty of highly respectable not to say virtuous householders to give substantial bail for my appearance to answer any charge that may be brought against me you will please to observe sir that i have not brought any charge against you shouldn't be surprised in the least even if you had mr inspector i have had so many charges brought against me in all parts of the world i have been in the hands of judge lynch and was very near suffering at his hands mr inspector i need not tell you wrongfully of course and i have administered the judge's justice myself don't scruple making a charge against me if you have one to make i shan't bear any malice i am making no charge the inspector said rather impatiently time is going on mr uh grundy i want to be going on too said the unabashed stranger i call myself gundy if you please not that it much matters i want you to assist the course of justice by telling me all you know about the death of this man about poor old seth chickering i am afraid i know very little poor dear old seth i knew him well out in south africa and i have only come to town this very night and the first thing that happens to me or very nearly the first is to trip over the corpse of seth chickering here in the west end wonder whom old chick left his pot of money to that does not concern me the inspector said firmly to repress if possible mr gundy's tendency towards or from the immediate subject
"'It concerns me, Mr. Inspector, a good deal, I can assure you, for if old Seth has not left his money to somebody in particular, I and some other good folks come in for shares of it.' The inspector began to look astonished. "'Do you mean to tell me,' he asked, "'that this man and you were mixed up in some money affairs, and that if he has made no will, you are to come in for some of the money, and that you came to London this very night, and the first thing you stumble on is the dead body of your friend murdered here in this court?' "'Mr. Inspector, you have hit the nail on the head. You have got my story down to the ground.' Poor Seth and I were chums with others, and we had a lot of money to divide, and we promised among ourselves that if any of us should die without making a will, the whole of his share should be divided next January among the surviving jolly boys, and by Jove I am told there's a pretty girl among the heirs. I vote we give the whole share, Seth's share, to her." What do you say, Mr. Inspector? Would not that be a handsome thing to do? I am quite serious. By Jove! But about this body, Mr. Gundy, do please tell me all you know. With pleasure. Only sorry I have so little to tell. Well, I'd been to a theatre, and I had been smoking a cigar and having a quiet drink, and I started to go home. Good Lord, how odd it seemed to walk along the old streets under such new conditions. Yes, yes, never mind all that. Right, right, of course, that wouldn't interest you. Well, as I came past this corner, a man was running out, and ran right against me and nearly knocked me over. I am pretty firm on my pins, however, and I stood fast, but I gave him a shove that nearly knocked him over. I waited for him to pull himself together, and I felt sure there would be a fight, but he only ran away. Then I heard a groan, I thought, and I went down this lane, or court, or whatever you call it, and I saw someone lying on the ground, and I thought it was a drunken squabble, and that my chap had knocked the other chap down. I looked at the face of the man on the pavement, and first I saw that it was my old pal Seth Chickering, and next I saw that he was dead, as dead as Julius Caesar. "'Were you not very much shocked and surprised?' the inspector asked, somewhat sternly. "'Surprised? Oh, well, yes, a little surprised, certainly, at the odd chance that brought me on the spot just at the time. Shocked? Well, I can't say that I was. It takes a great deal to shock me much.' I have seen ever so many men killed in my time, and not too much fuss made about it. Where's the good, you know? When a man's dead, he's dead, you know. Seth had got to die some time, and I don't see that he could have done it any better on the whole. I am sure I should rather die in that neat, prompt sort of way than be finished off by the Russian influenza." It must not be supposed that while the stranger was delivering himself of these occasional and intercalated dissertations on life and death and other abstract questions, the inspector was simply listening idle and open-mouthed to the fluent expression of his views. The inspector was making a profound and astute study of Mr. Gandhi. The inspector had been about the world himself a good deal. He had been on the trail of fugitive Englishmen in California and South America, and in Queensland, Australia. He knew what sort of men and what codes of manly honour are made by such places. He did not assume that Mr. Gundy was in sympathy with murder, because he did not profess to feel much surprise at the death of Seth Chickering. Still, the coincidences were all very remarkable. "'You knew this part of the town before?' the inspector asked with seeming carelessness. "'Oh, bless you, yes, I was brought up here.' 
Yes, I knew you were a Londoner. Just so. The Cockney may change his spots, but he can't cast his skin. But I'm not ashamed of it, Mr. Inspector. In spite of all temptation to belong to a foreign nation, I've remained an Englishman, Mr. Inspector. I give you my honour. Though what my native country has ever done for me, I should find it pretty hard to tell you. Mr. Inspector had long settled in his mind that, despite his swagger and his voluble talk and his assumed rattle, Mr. Gundy was a gentleman in the conventional sense of the word. He had made a mental note of this suspicion from the first. It was growing to be a conviction now. There was not much clue in that, however. Many Englishmen of good family and bringing up had turned out terrible scamps in Sacramento or Ballara or at the Cape. The very carelessness of the swagger might be merely put on to brave away all appearance of complicity in crime. He must have had something to do with it, the inspector thought. The man who ran against you, had you ever seen him before, Mr. Gundy? the inspector asked, rather for form's sake. Never set eyes on him before in all the long and checkered course of my earthly pilgrimage. You don't know who he was? Mr. Inspector, I put it to you as a man of intelligence. If I never saw the chap before and never heard of him, how is it likely or possible that I could know who he was? Should you know him again if you were to see him? The inspector asked, almost aggressively. Know him? Yes, I should think I should. I never set eyes on any man once, for one flash, that I shouldn't know again after twenty years. Get that man for me, Mr. Inspector, and I'll recognize him even if his own mother should fail to make him out. Well, we must look for him first, the inspector said, with a thoughtful air. Yes, and you must catch him first. By Jove, what a fool I was not to hold him when I had got him. It was a pity, the inspector observed dryly. But who in all creation could jump to the conclusion that because a fellow runs one down in the street at night, he must have been just that moment murdering one's own old pal? Your sneer or taunt, Mr. Inspector, is unreasonable. The only unreasonable thing I have observed about you so far. Well, this whole story will have to be told to the magistrate and the coroner. All right, I don't mind. I rather like telling a curious sort of story like that, all the more if it puzzles wise and practical dunderheads who cannot believe in any such thing as a coincidence. Whom shall I have to tell the story to? The beak, the worthy magistrate, isn't he called? Yes, the magistrate and the coroner, I suppose. All right, I'm there. Well the inspector said, a little doubtfully. I am sure you will make no mistake about coming, Mr. Um, Gundy. No mistake in the world. Tell me when and where, and I'm then and there. Look here, Mr. Inspector, would you mind walking along with me? It's only a step to the Berkeley Hotel. They'll tell you that I have taken rooms there, that I have been vouched for by respectability, and that they have a good lot of money in charge for me. Come along, and I'll give you a prime cigar and anything you like to drink, if it isn't too late to have a drink. No, thanks, the inspector said thoughtfully. I'm sure it's all right, Mr. Grundy, but I can't leave this place just now. No, I can take your word, I'm sure. Of course, you could take my word if I had given it. We don't break our words to each other in the places where I have been knocking about lately. Things wouldn't hang together at all if we did that. But then you see, Mr. Inspector, I have not given you my word. No, but you mean to, I am sure, the inspector said, with a smile of winning confidence and a gleam of sudden mistrust in his heart. 
Right you are. I give you my word that I will appear at any time and place you name tomorrow morning, and that you shall never come into any sort of trouble by my not turning up all right, provided only that I don't have my throat cut meantime by one of your clever and seasoned London assassins. Mr. Inspector, I wish you good night. Mr. Gundy smiled a bright smile, lifted his hat, put a cigar straight between his lips, and sauntered away. End of chapter 6Chapter Seven of Red Diamonds by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Seven. Fidelia Locke. When the carriage containing Lady Scardale and Miss Locke drove away from the Voyagers' Club after leaving Captain Raven on its threshold, the elder lady leaned back with a half sigh. "'Are you tired, dear Lady Scardale? the young girl asked. The question was an ordinary question enough, but there was the ring of genuine and deep affection in the voice which uttered it. "'No, my dear,' Lady Scardale answered, reaching out her hand to take and hold that of her companion. "'No, not exactly tired.' Mrs. Seagrave's parties are always entertaining and always interesting. Then why did you sigh, dear? For you did sigh. Come, you cannot deny that sigh. Can't I? Very well, then I won't. And Lady Scardale laughed a bright laugh that had no suggestion of a sigh lurking anywhere in it. I think I sighed because I was thinking. Thinking? Thinking of what? Oh, of many things. Of Captain Raven, chiefly. My dear Lady Scardale, what is there to sigh about in Captain Raven? I think he is very well contented with himself. There was a slight, just the slightest, suggestion of scorn in the girl's voice as she said this. Lady Scardale's quick ear detected it, and somehow it seemed to please her. It is because he is so well contented with himself that he makes me sigh. It seems to me a pity that a man should be so purposeless. But Captain Raven isn't purposeless, Lady Scardale. At present his great purpose in life is the Voyagers' Club, and I'm sure nothing ever seems to be going on in London that he has not his name in. Nothing amusing, that is. Ah, yes, exactly. Nothing amusing. But that's just it. He has no serious purpose, no great object, no high ideal. Dear Lady Scardale, why do you want him to have all these qualities? Well, because I like him. I like him very much, but... Well? Well, Lady Scardale went on, I should be sorry, my dear, if I thought that you liked him very much. Fidelia began to laugh, very brightly and sweetly. You need not be at all alarmed, dear Lady Scardale. I am not at all likely to care for Captain Raven. Well, Fidelia, he is an attractive man, and I think, dear, unless I am mistaken, that he likes you very much. Possibly he does, said Fidelia, and the smile on her face faded somewhat. Indeed, I think it is probable that he does, but he is not the kind of man I could ever care for. And what kind of man could you care for, fanciful Fidelia? Well, he should be such a man as you spoke of just now, Lady Scardale, a man with a purpose, with an object, with an ideal, such a man as... As who? As my father was, Lady Scardale. Ah, you were thinking of your father. 
Well, I was thinking of someone who was dear to me once, and whom Captain Raven reminded me of always. My poor brother-in-law, Rupert. He was wild like Raven, and adventurous and purposeless, too. Lady Scardale sighed again. For a little while there was silence between the two women. The carriage had just passed out of St. James's Park, and was rolling along Buckingham Palace Road on its way towards Chelsea. Each was busy with thoughts which were sad thoughts, and which the brief conversation had called up and made very vivid. They did not speak again until the carriage had driven past Sir Hans Sloane's physics garden, and had stopped at Lady Scardale's door. The physic garden in Chelsea is a curious patch of old-fashioned, memory-haunted ground, wedged in by the most modern devices of red brick and painted window. Chelsea has of late completely metamorphosed itself into a Queen Anneism, which is much more pronouncedly Queen Anneish than anything that was ever known in the days of Queen Anne herself. Along the embankment, and up and down the streets that run off it, the red brick houses cover all space, and publish themselves as old-fashioned with an audacity which only draws the more attention to their astonishing and even brazen newness. The physic garden stands, a sort of grave and dignified protest against all this innovation. Its trees, its shrubs, its grasses have a look of antiquity and proud decay. There is one tree, a Lebanon cedar, which can be seen from almost any point in the region, like the famous tree that everybody looks at from the Pincian Hill in Rome. From some back slum that seems as barren of interest and bare of poetic association as a genteel street in Pimlico, one can catch a glimpse of this tree just above the vulgar, commonplace roofs and chimney-pots around, and the sight lifts one in a moment into a realm of beauty, and imagination, and memory, and brings thoughts and fancies of far-off lands, and eastern skies, and Arabian nights, and sacred waters. So this tree often impressed itself upon the mind of Fidelia Locke. She never saw the tree's broad crest uplifted in the distance, but she was borne away out of the commonplace surroundings of the spot, and went out, and sailed away in a daydream across the sea towards the golden sunset, and was happy. Indeed, she ought not to have been much in quest of happiness, as mortals go, for she lived a useful life that was entirely to her taste, and she had a most generous friend and patroness, a patroness who never patronized either Fidelia or anyone else, and she had, as yet, no serious love troubles. Men had indeed made love to her, and professed to be in love with her, but her heart was whole and free. Life was all opening freshly on her, the shadows all fell before her. Not far from this famous physic garden, inward from the physic garden, there is another garden enclosed in walls, and of which the careless passer-by never suspects the existence. It was a merry place in days of yore, no doubt, to quote the language of Wordsworth. It was the residence of some great personage of Chelsea, and it had upon its grounds a stately mansion-house. The mansion-house and grounds have passed through all sorts of changes since the ancient seigneurial family dropped into decay and finally disappeared. It was a collegiate school for boys, it was an art exhibition, it was a medical establishment for the care of self-surrendered inebriates. All these institutions failed in their turn, 
and at last it was about to be cut up into lots for building ground and would no doubt before long have been covered with other red brick houses ever so much more queen anneish than queen anne's own reign had looked upon when it was suddenly brought up by the rich and philanthropic countess of scardale and turned into an entirely new-fashioned not to say new-fangled encampment for the development of self-reliance and other masculine virtues in woman the countess of scardale was not a widow the earl of scardale was alive and well as far as physical health was concerned when lady scardale was miss eastrop only daughter of the rich banker and philanthropist sir james eastrop she fell in love with the young earl of scardale a man who was spending the last of his family property that could be spent on gambling and the turf of the stage and various other amusements miss eastrop fell in love with him and he professed to fall in love with her she had an impassioned love for converting souls to goodness and lord scardale offered himself and his soul for conversion miss eastrop accepted the trust her father protested in vain and told the girl he had never in all his experience known an authentic case of a profligate man converted by a rich marriage his daughter smiled her sweet and confident smile he loves me was her argument he will do anything for me her father was wise enough not to argue too long and the marriage took place and he died soon after leaving his daughter immensely rich he died not too soon for he did not live to see his sad forebodings come true lord scardale got all the money he could out of his wife indulged in all his old and evil tastes and finally left her and went off to nobody well knew where with another woman lady scardale lavished a great deal of her affection on a younger brother of her husband's who was only a boy when they married he lived in their house for years and he stood by her when her husband left her but wilderness had run in the scardale family for generations one of that blood could no more save himself from the consequences of being a scardale than he could keep himself from the trials of humanity being a man scardale's younger brother became wild too well nigh wore out even the sweet patience of his sister-in-law and finally went off to some dim and distant country declaring that he would make his fortune for himself or would never return to civilized life lady scardale had heard nothing of him of her husband for many years she was now a tall handsome and stately woman of forty-five she never went into society she spent her life her widowed life her worse than widowed life in trying to do good her chief efforts to do good were naturally among women her great wish was to train up girls not indeed to remain single but to be able to live without making marriage a profession a trade so that if they did marry they should marry for some reason and not out of sheer necessity it might have been thought that she herself had married for a reason and not out of sheer necessity and that nevertheless her marriage had not prospered but she felt all the same that up to the time of her own experience in marriage she had always understood that there was nothing for a girl to do but to marry she had always known that she must marry somebody and she had with this previous assumption to guide her cause allowed herself to fall in love with lord scardale so that even her own case she looked on as contributing only another illustration to the great argument that women ought to be trained to encounter life without any actual necessity for having recourse to marriage had she been thus trained her life she thought might have been more happy 
Lady Scardale bought the old domain near the physic garden and started a sort of technical school for girls, which was also to be what may be called a culture school of life. It was called the Chelsea Culture College, and it meant a great deal by the word culture. Girls were to be put in the way of learning every art and craft by which a woman could make a living, and they were also to be taught how to live. Lady Scardale did not believe in the teaching of women exclusively by women. She thought it must be at the best somewhat narrow and enfeebling. So she had professors of all manner of arts and sciences, teachers of fencing and gymnastics. The girls learned to cook, to make and mend clothes, to drive and ride, and even to groom a horse. They took the household work in turns, and they kept no servants. An untrained girl went at first into the class of attendance, and while she was learning letters and science, she had to learn how to carry a message and how to wait at table. The girls thus gradually worked their way up. There were no servants, or there were none but servants. It might be put either way. Every girl had learned how to be a servant. The institution was conducted on the principle of practical equality. There were numbers of young women there who had originally belonged to the maid-of-all-work class, and who now held good positions in the institution and were fit to go out into the world as ladies, if there was any way of making a living in life as a lady. There were some married women in the institution, with whom, through no fault of theirs, marriage had proved a most decided failure. The principle of payment was simple. Each resident or her parents paid what they could. Lady Scardale arranged for the admission of each, and would take no one at any price who did not appear likely to improve herself and the institution by abiding for a time in it. She had several girls there who paid nothing, for whom she paid, whom she had rescued from miserable homes and drunken parents, but Lady Scardale never told their story to any of the other girls. She had herself thought at one time of dropping her own title and calling herself Sister Scardale, or Mrs. Scardale, or Miss Eastrop, or something of the kind, but she came to the conclusion that it would seem like mere affectation or eccentricity, and she detested affectation and eccentricity. Besides, she had been far too much a woman of the world not to know quite well that an effect in strengthening the public influence of an institution like hers would be obtained from the fact that its president was a countess. Lady Scardale was the president of the institution, the vice-president was Miss Fidelia Locke. Lady Scardale had appointed Miss Fidelia Locke to the proud position of vice-president because she found her sympathetic and capable, and because she was touched by her story. Fidelia Locke was not exactly an orphan, but she was practically alone in the world when chance threw her in the way of the benevolent woman who, though not exactly a widow, was practically alone in the world also. Each day that they passed in work together brought them more and more into companionship. Fidelia was a girl of twenty-two or three, with a handsome, melancholy face. She had deep eyes that sometimes flashed up with sudden light, suggesting a suppressed strength of emotion and passion, and a mouth that quivered to every ripple of feeling. One might have set her down for a girl who would in ordinary conditions have had a self-willed and masterful temperament enough, had it not been early checked and made patient by trouble. Fidelia went to Lady Scardale's room for a little talk, as she always did when they came home from any festivity together. "'I am glad to talk to you, Fidelia,' Lady Scardale said. 
"'You were not looking well today, not quite like yourself, I thought. You ought to have a holiday, child. Would you not like to go anywhere?' "'Oh, no, dear Lady Scardale, I am quite well. I should not like to go anywhere, at least anywhere away from you.' Lady Scardale smiled. "'That is very sweet of you,' she said. "'But all the same, I don't think so much of London quite agrees with you. This is a sort of hermitage. It is all very well for the old who have lived their lives, like me.' It has nothing to do with that, Fidelia said simply, but just now I am very unhappy. I know, dear child, Lady Scardale said gently, soothing the girl by a caressing touch on her cheek, as if she were really only a little child, whom the touch of a loving hand could encourage and strengthen. I thought when I first came here, Fidelia said, that I could charm away all my own troubles by trying to relieve some of the troubles of other people. But I am not good enough for that, Lady Scardale. I am not unselfish enough. My own troubles get in my way and fill up my heart. I once, said Lady Scardale gravely, knew a very pious and believing man who knelt to pray at a shrine in a foreign country. As he was kneeling, a minute particle of dust got into his eye and tormented him, and he told me he could not pray. Every high thought was driven out of him by that grain of dust in his eye. The troubles of the world are a good deal like that to all of us, Fidelia. I wish my only trouble were a grain of dust in my eye, Fidelia said sadly. She did not say it impatiently, for she did not fancy for a moment that her friend and patroness was making light of her troubles. She knew Lady Scardale's way. "'It would be a pity if anything were to spoil your bright eyes, Fidelia. I would rather see them spoiled for the moment by dust than by tears. We could get the dust out, I dare say, easily enough, but not the tears.' I have seldom seen tears in your eyes, but when they get there they are apt to stay there, or to come again and again, I am afraid. I am sure my father is dead, Fidelia said. I have dreamt of him night after night lately, and always dreamt of him as dead. Oh, how shall I ever live without him? You were very fond of your father, Fidelia? Oh, yes, Lady Scardale, I was all devoted to him, and he was so fond of me. He went away for nothing but to make money for me. He never would have cared to go exploring about the world but for me. He could not bear to see me poor. He was always saying so, and I didn't care. Oh, I didn't care one straw so long as I had him. What did it matter to me if we were poor? There are troubles ever so much worse than being poor. There are indeed, Fidelia. I have never known what it was to want for money, and I have not been happy, and everything has gone wrong with me. No, you have not been happy, dear Lady Scardale. You have not indeed, Fidelia said with emotion, clasping her companion's hand. I am ashamed to talk of my troubles when I think of yours. But you can do so much good. You are always doing so much good. Your whole life is all goodness. Tell me about your father, Fidelia. Have you any reason to fear that he is dead? Only my dreams. Oh, yes, and the fact that I have not heard from him so long— you know, people used to say he was more like my lover than my father. Oh, why, Lady Scardale, if I only put a fresh bunch of flowers in my dress, he would study me as if I were a picture. Oh, he so spoiled me. I was not fit for the world. He loved me so, and I loved him so, and we spoiled each other. He never told me he was going away. He knew I would not let him. I would have clung to him. I would have hung on his neck. He never should have gone, 
or at least he should have taken his daughter with him. Then he wrote to me from Australia, and then from the Cape, and he told me he was going to the diamond mines. He wrote regularly, and said he was not going to allow me to sink into poverty, and then he was so glad when you were good to me, and lately he told me he hoped soon to make his fortune and to come home rich. For me, always for me, and since then I have not heard any more, and I know he is dead. Oh, yes, he is dead. It is likely enough, Lady Scardale thought, but she would not communicate that thought to her young friend. There are far worse calamities than death, Lady Scardale thought, but that thought, too, she would not communicate to her young friend. Ah, yes, she was thinking. There are worse troubles, too, than the death even of someone we dearly love. There may be the moral decay, the moral death, the gradual extinction of the better spiritual nature, the protracted life that is only a living death. But this thought, too, she forbore to communicate to her young friend. In truth, all that Lady Scardale had heard about Captain Locke from various sources had not quite supplied her with such a pleasing picture of him as his daughter's loving hand would have painted. She had heard from everyone that he was very fond of Fidelia in an idolatrous and absorbing sort of way, but she had heard, too, that he was a heedless, good-for-nothing creature, pursuing his own whims and follies recklessly, hot-tempered, jealous, eager to quarrel, capable of anything rather than patience. Wherefore she regarded it as not at all impossible that such a life might have come to a sudden and tragic end in such a place as the mining region of the felt. "'You must not keep looking out for the worst, my dear child,' Lady Scardale said gently, but without too much encouragement in her voice. "'Come what will, Fidelia. You know you have always a home and a friend.' "'Oh, yes, I know it well,' Fidelia exclaimed. "'But do you know—no, you could not think—how wicked and ungrateful I am to you and to heaven and to every one? I sometimes wish I had not a home when I think that he may be lying homeless, unburied, under the southern stars. My dear, Lady Scardale softly interposed. It is no use, Lady Scardale, reasoning with me or trying to bring me to what is wise and right and submissive. I know already it is right and wise. I know I ought to be submissive, only I can't submit. I can only think that if he is dead, he died for me. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of Red Diamonds by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Eight: The Pocket Book. Gerald Aspen lived in a set of chambers high up in an ancient house at the foot of one of the streets leading from the strand to the river. They were cheap for the young lieutenant of the catapult had to husband his resources, but they were comfortable, they were clean, and because they were high up they possessed an unrivalled view. To left and right the river wound its way between the stately embankment of the one side and the crazy wharves of the other. In the greenness of summer, in the greyness of winter, Gerald always found the prospect from his watch-tower a pleasure for his gaze, and of nights, summer nights, it gratified him much to open his windows and lean out, propped on his elbows, 
far into the night and to fancy himself like the poetic notary of jean paul richter's story with his eyes in the stars and his soul in the blue ether it pleased him too to fancy that from the high pitch of his lodging he could look down like another diogenes teufelsdruck upon the absurd imbroglio of the world beneath him and survey it with the calm eyes of a serene impartial philosopher gerald aspen was still very young on the morning after his meeting with the curious stranger in the club he awoke at a late hour but still with a sense of fatigue strung upon him he had gone to his social entertainment it was a ball given by a great financier to the ladies of the frivolity theatre and he had danced a little and supped a little and finally he had come away and walked home and had written his account of the revelry in time to catch the last post and had read a few pages of fiction to clear his mind and big ben was chiming half past three when he put out his light and slipped with the swiftness of still unspoiled youth into the spaces of dreams now as he lay half awake and looking at the sunshine coming through his window the great clock chimed again and he lay lazily listening to its strokes i wonder what time it is he said to himself luxuriously enjoying his monarchy of the lubberland of bed it must be getting on to ten o'clock but the chimes did not stop at the tenth stroke they went on for two strokes beyond twelve o'clock said gerald by jove i am late this morning and he assured himself mentally that he must get up immediately and go about the day's work but he did not get up immediately and go about the day's work for his wakened mind was occupying itself with the night's work a confused medley of memories floated before him the pretty dresses and pretty faces of last night's dancers and through all the pretty faces and the pretty dresses he was anxious to pursue two other memories somewhat formless and intangible which he was trying to reduce to clearer proportions at last the first of these memories took the form of a woman's face framed in the open window of a carriage it was a very beautiful face crowned with soft golden hair a face in which a curious expression of melancholy contrasted with its girlish freshness a face with very bright eyes which also were full of melancholy through all his dreams that face had floated alluring inspiring blending strangely with the fantastic visions of dancing feet and laughing lips which his last night's revel had set stirring in his dreaming brain now awake he sighed for it as one does sigh on awaking for some visionary phantom of delight that has greeted the sleeper in the kingdom of dreams then the sigh changed to a smile as gerald remembered that the beautiful wistful face was no mere creation of sleep but the face of a living girl of a girl whom he was likely soon to meet the face of fidelia locke but there was another memory haunting him as well as the memory of the face of fidelia locke it was a perplexing memory of something not beautiful of something fantastic something incongruous which worried him because he could not quite realize it could not as it were piece together the puzzle of shifting recollections that was occupying his mind 
Suddenly, however, it all came back to him in the suddenness with which such things do come. The chaos of scattered memories combined and evolved the form of a big man in yellow garments, and the picture of his companion at dinner on the previous evening rose before him. Immediately Gerald's mind proceeded along the track of the entire episode at the Voyagers' Club, and he found the episode so fantastic, so preposterous, that he decided within himself that the whole story must be neither more nor less than a dream, begotten of a late supper and the production of a column of copy thereafter. But even as he came to this sober decision, he turned his eyes towards his dressing-table, and saw lying there, in the spot where he had placed it in the previous night, the leather pocket-book which the mysterious stranger had insisted upon entrusting to his care. "'Then it's not a dream after all,' Gerald said in surprise and the sense of his surprise lasted him all through the process of dressing, until the moment when he rang his bell for his landlady to bring him his breakfast. Before the breakfast arrived, he did what till then he had delayed doing, out of a whim for reserving the convincing proof of the reality of his vision to the moment when he was definitely equipped to face the world. There it was, no doubt of it, just as he had left it last night. The same black leather pocket-book, fastened with a silver clasp, which Gerald had, in spite of his very natural curiosity, left unopened. Gerald thought of the hero of the French story, who dreams that he is visited by a princess of ancient Egypt, and who on waking finds that she has left her slipper behind her as a proof of the reality of the vision. But the bulky black pocket-book was a far more serious responsibility than the pantoufle of a daughter of the pyramids, and he resolved to return it to its rightful owner at the very earliest opportunity. As he made this resolve, his breakfast arrived, accompanied by the morning's papers. To Gerald, as an adventurous journalist, the morning paper was a treasure-house of delightful possibilities, and when he had poured himself a cup of tea, he carefully unfolded one of the journals and propped it up before him on the table at the most convenient angle for reading. The first thing that caught his eye was a column on the principal page, headed in large letters. Mysterious murder last night in the West End. This was evidently the chief feature of the morning's news, at least to the reporting mind, and Gerald, with an eye to possible usefulness for the later editions of the catapult, began to read it with a careless interest. But after a line or two his interest deepened absorbingly, and for a few seconds he asked himself in startled astonishment whether he was not still dreaming— for the story was the story of the murder in St. James's Street, and the name of the victim was Seth Chickering. There was no mistake about it. The man in whose company he had dined last night, the man to whose strange story he had listened, the man who had insisted on entrusting him with the pocket-book which was now in his possession, the man with whom he parted in St. James's Square only a comparatively few hours earlier, was dead, murdered, struck down in the most mysterious way by some unknown hand. Gerald's head seemed to swim. The whole thing was so strange, so sudden, so horrible. A feeling of pity for his friend of a night blended grimly with a personal repugnance to be mixed up in the matter, 
and with at the same time a curious interest in finding himself so mixed up for that he was mixed up and very much mixed up in the matter was only too obvious even if he had simply met poor seth chickering and had parted from him with no confidences of any kind exchanged between them gerald aspen would have been bound to come forward and tell all he knew but the conditions were much more serious here he was with a portion of the personal property of the dead man in his possession with a portion of a very singular story told by the dead man still fresh in his memory it was clearly gerald aspen's duty to lay and that speedily all the information he possessed about seth chickering before the proper authorities and to entrust the mysterious pocket-book to their keeping it must be admitted that for all his horror gerald felt a certain professional satisfaction in being so closely implicated in the st james's mystery a man is not one of the favourite lieutenants of the catapult for nothing and it was not unnatural that an enthusiastic journalist should experience a thrill of satisfaction on reflecting how very much his own journal would be in the know about the matter on which all london must now be talking but this cheerful reflection was barred by another which was distinctly less cheerful how if his connection with the mystery got him into grave difficulty how if he were not able to explain to the satisfaction of the authorities the way in which the pocket-book of the murdered man came into his possession for a single second but only for a single second as this thought flashed across his mind did it occur to gerald that it would be better for himself if he were to leave well alone and quietly drop the compromising pocket-book into the river or into the fire and so save himself from all complication the thought only came to be dismissed with the air of a spartan gerald finished his breakfast assured himself of the presence of the mysterious pocket-book in his breast-pocket buttoned his overcoat heroically and started off for scotland yard but if gerald had been surprised by the discovery of the pocket-book and the story of the murder greater surprises still were in store for him the poor fisherman in the arabian tale was not more astounded when the jar his net had captured proved to be the prison of a genie than gerald was when the pocket-book which had come so curiously into his possession was opened and its contents were revealed the pocket-book contained in the first instance an immense quantity of very valuable diamonds embedded as such treasures usually are by the adept in thin layers of gutta perca then came two sealed envelopes the first contained a formal copy of the agreement which seth chickering had told gerald of the agreement binding every member of the little association in a common bond the second envelope contained the names of all the members of the association with the names of all the persons to whom in the case of the death of the original owners the money was to go on the first day of the next january to gerald's utter amazement the first name on the list was his own john aspen was the oldest member of the association john aspen was undoubtedly gerald aspen's long-lost father john aspen had given the name of his only son gerald as his heir in the case of his death and john aspen was dead and gerald was heir to his share of the fortune 
The names of the company were carefully set forth in the document, and after each of the names something was written in pencil by Seth Chickering. The first name, as we have seen, was that of John Aspen. Opposite that Chickering had written, Dead, overdose chloral, taken by mistake. The next name on the list was that of Captain Reginald Locke. Opposite his name, Seth Chickering had written, Killed in fair fight by blank. And then there came only a stroke of the pencil, and no name filled up the blank. The inheritor of his fortune was stated to be a Miss Fidelia Locke, who was described as living in London under the care of the Countess of Scardale. Fancy the thrill that went through Gerald's heart. Last night he had been weaving fancies over the face, seen for the first time, of Fidelia Locke. And now... The third name was that of the Honourable George Percy Raven, second son of Lord Wellington. Opposite his name was written, Found dead outside camp, murdered by Noah Bland. His heir was set forth in the agreement as his younger brother, Captain the Honourable John Raven. The fourth name on the list was that of Noah Bland, opposite which was written, Lynched, followed by a date some two months earlier. His heir was stated to be his son, Jaffet Bland, but no address was added nor any hint as to his whereabouts. The fifth name was that of Rat Gundy, opposite to which Seth Chickering had written the one word, Vermist. In this case the name of no heir was given. The sixth name was Seth Chickering's own. Nothing was written opposite, and no heir's name followed. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of Red Diamonds by Justin McCarthy》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Nine: The Culture College. Lady Scardale had certainly been fortunate in the site she had found for her culture college. It was within sight of the river. It was close to the Physic Garden. Originally, it had been several houses. That is to say, it had been the stately old house with several modern smaller houses clustering around it. Lady Scardale had been lucky enough to get the whole place, and had so altered and improved it as to make it one of the wonders of the neighbourhood. She pulled down the small houses, she made additions to the stately old house, she ran all the various gardens into one, which was laid out with such skill that it actually seemed rather a park than a large garden. It really was an exceedingly large garden for London, even for Chelsea, where large gardens do still linger, and moreover, the physic garden was just across the road, so that the fair collegians of the Culture College had no lack of fresh air, of trees and grass, to lighten their labours and preserve their health. All around the culture college ran a high wall, which gave to its green garden a delightful air of scholastic, almost monastic seclusion. But there was nothing at all gloomy about the seclusion of the garden of the culture college at any time, and on this particular afternoon of late April it was looking very cheerful indeed. For this was the day of the celebration at the culture college, to which Gerald Aspen had been bidden, and of which Lady Scardale had reminded Captain Raven on the previous evening, when they parted at the door of the Voyagers' Club. The day was fortunately fine. The month had not been pleasant. April seldom is pleasant in England, in spite of Chaucer's praises, 
and the praises of that latter-day Chaucer, Mr. William Morris, whose song of April's loveliness is exquisite enough to make men forget that the breezes soft that o'er the blossoms of the orchards blow generally blow from the east and are bitter and biting but this particular day was really fine almost like an ideal april day as near perhaps to an ideal april day as london ever gets the air that had so long been wintry had for the first time a suggestion of warmth about it of warmth and an awakening world the sun shone royally flinging the largesse of his golden light about with generous profusion as if to compensate by a sudden prodigality mortals beggared by a stripping winter the delicate pink stars of the almond blossom made the garden a glory of blushing pink and the bursting buds lent their soft tones of tender green to the luminous beauty of the spring colouring there was a great deal of animation in the neighbourhood of the culture college on that april afternoon the great gate stood open all the day and carriages and cabs kept driving up and depositing visitors at the portal a little crowd clustered about the door and stared at the arrivals and peered through the open gate into the mysterious region beyond and enjoyed itself very much as a gaping crowd always does inside the gates the culture college was all alive for the various guests who had been bidden to inspect the college on this the day of its first anniversary were wandering all over the building under the guidance of affable young collegians told off for that special duty when the guests had seen all that was to be seen and had thoroughly satisfied their thirst for knowledge on every particular of the working of the scheme they were conveyed into the great garden at the back where lady scardale received them and where there were tents at which tea awaited the thursday lady scardale stood in the centre of the garden surrounded by a little group of personal friends and received each new visitor or set of visitors graciously fidelia locke was here there and everywhere superintending explaining assisting one of the fair collegians came towards lady scardale she had a card in her hand and she explained to lady scardale that the owner of the card wanted a few moments private and urgent conversation lady scardale read the name mr gerald aspen embankment chambers villiers street strand and voyages club st james's square lady scardale had never heard the name before but of course all manner of unknown people were constantly calling on her and she never refused to see any one but the name of the voyagers club impressed her curiously in connection with fidelia's fears for her wandering father and something ominous became present to her mind did this gentleman she said to the girl in a low tone ask to see me in the first instance yes lady scardale he asked if miss locke were here and i told him she was and then he asked if he might see you he said he would rather see you first it is as i thought lady scardale said to herself then she turned to the little group around her and said i shall be back in a few minutes i hope and she followed the girl into the house and into her own study where gerald aspen was waiting for her lady scardale was absent rather longer than she expected to be she did not come back to the garden for more than a quarter of an hour and when she did come she did not return alone gerald aspen was by her side lady scardale looked very grave and sad 
and Gerald looked grave and sad, too. He had just told Lady Scardale the strange story with which he had become acquainted that morning, and Lady Scardale had decided that he himself had better tell it to Fidelia. Lady Scardale looked around for Fidelia, and saw her in a distant part of the garden, talking to some of the visitors. The garden was almost empty now, for it was growing chill, and most of the guests had gone indoors or departed. "'Wait here a moment,' Lady Scardale said to Gerald, who bowed silently. Then she walked rapidly across the grass to where Fidelia was standing. "'Fidelia,' said Lady Scardale softly, "'I want to speak to you.' The people to whom Fidelia was talking said good-bye, and shook hands and departed. Lady Scardale and Fidelia were left alone. Fidelia knew by Lady Scardale's manner that she had something serious to say, and her heart began to beat quickly, for she felt sure that it must be on the one subject which occupied her mind. Fidelia, said Lady Scardale, I have sad news. I don't believe in trying to break the fall or soften the pain of such news. She took Fidelia's hands in hers and pressed them tenderly. Fidelia looked at her through eyes swimming in sudden tears. My father, she said, he is dead. Yes, dear, said Lady Scardale. He is dead. How do you know? There is a young man here, Lady Scardale answered, who has just told me. His is a strange story altogether. Are you strong enough to hear it now, or would you rather wait until some other time? No, no, Fidelia answered firmly. I would rather hear it now. Lady Scardale turned and made a sign to Gerald. He had stood where she left him, watching them and wondering at the strange chance which had thrown him so suddenly into confidential relationship with the two women he had seen for the first time on the previous night. He obeyed Lady Scardale's signal and joined the two women. Fidelia, said Lady Scardale, this is Mr. Gerald Aspen, who has some sad and strange news for you. Mr. Aspen, this is Miss Locke. Gerald bowed. If the girl had looked beautiful last night, smiling in the darkness, she was more beautiful now in the clear evening light, though her face was so intensely sad. Sit down, Fidelia, while Mr. Aspen tells you his story. And Lady Scardale led Fidelia to a garden seat under an old elm. There, I will leave you for the present. I shall be back again directly. Lady Scardale moved away to take farewell of the last departing guests. Fidelia looked up at Gerald. Tell me about my father, she said. Looking down at her, Gerald told her all the strange story, the fairy tale which he had learned that day from the pocket-book, and which so mysteriously brought together her name and his. He told her of the murder of Seth Chickering, of her father's death and his father's death, and of the fortunes that were so strangely bequeathed to her and to him. She hardly listened to the few words in which he told that part of the story. I knew my father was dead. She rose and stood, white and rigid, as a statue. Need I tell you how much I feel for you, Miss Locke? Sir, I feel for you, Fidelia said, with her eyes swimming in tears. If I have lost a father, you have lost a father, too. She held out her hand in simple, girlish sympathy. Gerald took it for a moment in his. 
He would gladly have raised it to his lips in the graceful fashion of another time, but he shrank from the semblance of making too free with the girl in her distress. He saw that she was shaken to the very centre of her life. He gently pressed her hand and then withdrew his own. Her suffering sanctified her in his eyes. Even modern journalism by no means takes the chivalry out of a man. He felt deeply for her, and it seemed to him a kind of hypocrisy to liken his sorrows to hers. He had known nothing of his father, who had indeed never been over much of a family man, and had left his son to do the battle of life on his own account. Was it not the father of the black prince who refused to send more troops to his son's aid, declaring it would be better for his son to win the battle entirely off his own bat? Perhaps this was the heroic view of his paternal duty taken by Mr. Aspen Senior also. Anyhow, he left his son to make the best battle he could, unencumbered by any help from a father's hand. It may have been a well-meant and even heroic policy, but it is certainly not the sort of policy which is likely to endear a father to his son. So Gerald did not believe in his inmost heart that he felt the loss of his father as Miss Locke felt the loss of hers. Therefore, her words of sympathetic companionship made him feel almost ashamed. "'I knew very little of my father,' he said frankly, not without an effort, for it seemed like a censure to the memory of the dead. "'My father was always with me while we were at home,' Fidelia said. "'I adored him. Well, I must pray to God,' to give me strength. You have not told me yet, Mr. Aspen, she had got his name already, what he, her voice choked, what he died of. Can you have courage, Miss Locke? the young man asked, in tones as tremulous and with cheek as blanched as if he himself had done the deed it was now his cruel duty to announce. I have to tell you the worst. She shook her head. The worst was told, she said, when I learned that my father is dead, that he will never, never come home to me any more. Nothing to be told after that can affect my courage or my power of endurance. Yet it is horrible to have to tell you. Miss Locke, your father was killed. Stop, I said killed, not murdered. She had involuntarily given vent to a little scream, and put up her hands nervously before her face, as if to ward off the wings of some odious calamity that was coming to beat her down. Her father was killed. There was no need for him to die. No disease had caught hold of him. No inevitable fate had stricken him down. He might have lived— and someone had killed him. Now she felt that she had not exhausted her limits of suffering, even when she heard of her father's death. It was added horror, and horror unspeakable, to think that some brutal hand had killed him. An English girl thinks of death, even to those she loves most fondly, as some unavoidable fate coming gently on the victim in the sweet, quiet, stilled presence of those who watch in devotion and grief around the deathbed. She does not think of a death by violence, a death by some cruel human hand, which might have spared and did not, a death by violence, with blows and a hideous wound, a death desecrated, a life cut off in the wantonness of brutal enmity and hatred. Oh, this is too terrible, she murmured. I never thought of that. Then she said, with something positively fierce in her tone and the look of her gleaming eyes, 
Tell me, Mr. Aspen, and don't spare me, please. Tell me who murdered my father. I have not said that he was murdered. I dare not say that yet. I hope and believe it was not so. He was murdered, she exclaimed. He was gentle, he was kind, he was only too tender-hearted. He could not have been killed unless by an accident, or by murder, murder, murder. Was it an accident? You do not try to deceive me by pretending that it was. It was not an accident, Miss Locke. It was in a quarrel, I believe. My father never quarrelled. He was too noble and generous and gentle. Do you think I do not know my father? He was murdered. Now tell me who murdered him. In all his embarrassment and pain, Gerald could not help feeling an almost impassioned admiration for the girl who stood now in so brave and splendid an attitude of resolve. She appeared to have suddenly changed her nature. She was strong, bold, resolute, filled with the temper of set purpose, and it is to be feared the spirit of vengeance. Let us sit down, Mr. Aspen, she said. Now tell me all about it. Gerald told her all that he knew. She flinched from nothing, and neither did he now. He gave her all the reasons, all the hopes he could, for the belief that Captain Locke had been killed in one of the fights so common in that region. The girl listened quietly. Then she began to ask him many questions about the man who made such a strange and sudden appearance on the scene of the murder, the man who called himself Randolph, or rather, Rat Gundy. "'Something about him haunts me,' she said. "'I can't make it out, but there is something which makes me turn cold when I hear of him. Had he nothing to do with the murder, do you think?' The murder in St. James's Street? Yes, you won't admit as yet that there was any other murder, that my father was murdered. What a change a few moments had made in her. She talked now calmly, coldly of her father's death. Everyone says there was no evidence of the remotest kind against this man, this stranger, except the fact that he was found beside the dead body. But indeed, it is not quite fair to him to say he was found there. It was he who gave the alarm and summoned the police. Is that his real name, do you think? No, I am sure it is not. A man seldom goes by a real name out in those places. I want to see that man, she said. I want to know him. Will you help me? I will help you in every way I can. I will do anything to help you, but I do not understand why you should want to see that man. For one thing, Mr. Aspen, because he is the only man now in England who knows anything of all this story, I mean, from personal knowledge, he must be able to tell me something about, about my father, and I should like to see him face to face. I should know better what to think if I had seen him. Of course, Gerald said hesitatingly. I will do all I can. Will you help me to see this man? He was a little surprised at her eagerness, but he only answered, Oh, yes, if I can. If you can, why are you not involved in the whole story as well as I? Is not your father dead out there as well as mine? Can't you go and see him and talk to him? Would not that be the natural thing to do? It would certainly, Gerald said. I must see him in any case, and of course, if you wish to see him, it shall be made easy for you. Thank you very much she said, with suddenly down-dropped eyes. 
Why had Gerald rather evaded her wish to see this extraordinary Mr. Red Gundy? Partly, perhaps, out of a natural and manly reluctance to see that bright, pure creature brought into any manner of relationship with such a cosmopolitan adventurer as the so-called Red Gundy. Gerald had met Red Gundy in Scotland Yard, Gerald had very chivalrous, almost quixotic notions about women and the fittingness of their segregation from all that was tainted and rowdy in manhood, notions for which, be it observed, womanhood in general would not perhaps always thank him. And then, too, deep down in the depths of his heart was a jealous feeling that Gundy was a very handsome, dashing, daredevil sort of fellow, who had a winning voice, a bright smile, and a voluble tongue, and that it was quite possible to fancy that a girl might be charmed by him. Gerald had spoken to Miss Locke for the first time in his life. He had not been talking to her for much more than a quarter of an hour, and already, in truly masculine fashion, he began to dislike instinctively the idea of other men coming near her. For he said to himself, Destiny must have had some purpose in bringing us so strangely together. One word, he said as he was going, and after they had arranged that he was to see her or to communicate with her again on this wholly sad subject. You know that you are now rich, at least that a great sum of money is coming to you, and will be yours next January? Yes, you have made that clear to me. Thank you ever so much. I am so glad, so delighted, so enchanted. Her eyes sparkled with a curious flashing light of triumph. Gerald was surprised. Is she then like many others, like all the rest? he asked himself. Can she too be consoled for any loss by a compensation in money? You are glad? he stammered. Oh, well, and naturally, of course. I suppose every one must be glad to get money. Naturally, of course, she repeated, if one wants to do something. Everyone says that nothing can be done without money. Very well, I will use that money to find out all about my father's death and to bring his murder to justice. I will go out to those diamond fields myself if it be necessary. But it will not, I know it will not. I shall spend my money here, my money and all I own, to my last gown, to my health, to my life. All... All shall be given up from this moment to the task of finding out my father's murderer. She took leave of Gerald with a sort of patronizing air. There was something stately and serene about her. She sent him away with kindly superiority, as an exiled princess might have done. When he first came within sight of her, not very many minutes ago, she had seemed to him only a beautiful, delicate girl, whom a stroke of sad news might have borne to the earth like a tall swaying flower under a sharp and sudden hailstorm. Now she seemed self-contained, strong and stately, able to stand upright and alone against any shock. Her resolve sustained her. Her purpose had made her strong. She was a woman, Orestes. She had to find out the truth about a parent's death and bring the slayer to justice. Gerald Aspen had a good deal to think about as he sat in the little niche of the Voyagers Club that night. The whole aspect of life had undergone a change for him, too, as well as for her. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of Red Diamonds by Justin McCarthy》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn.
Chapter Ten, A Nine Days Wonder. An inquest is at the best of times a depressing performance, but it is especially so under the conditions which attended that upon the body of poor Seth Chickering. There was a man, a stranger, suddenly struck down in the very heart of London on the very night of his arrival by an assassin's hand, and struck down too in no obscure corner, no hideous backwater of human life in the purlieus of the East End, but in the very centre of London's fashionable existence, in the neighbourhood of one of London's most famous streets. There was something so terrible, so mysterious, so malignant about the deed, that it passed at once from the category of ordinary crimes. Only one person came forward after the event was made public, who was able to give any fresh information to the jury. This was a man who gave his name as James Bostock, whose business in life was that of a teacher of fencing, and who was employed in that capacity at the Culture College, Chelsea. He had not, however, very much information to give. All that he had to say was that on the evening of the crime he was coming from St. James's Park in the direction of Piccadilly. Just as he was crossing the carriage road between the park and the palace, a man ran against him, a man who was going at full speed and who seemed to be under the influence of great excitement. Mr. Bostock said that he was able to see the man's face very plainly, and he described it in terms which corresponded very closely with the description given by Gundy. The man who ran against Mr. Bostock had, like the man who ran against Mr. Gundy, a mass of red hair, and the lower part of his face was almost concealed by a large red beard. One other particular Mr. Bostock was able, however, to add. He declared that when the man came to a momentary halt, after running up against him, he broke out into some angry utterance, the meaning of which Mr. Bostock did not understand, as it was in a language unfamiliar to him. Being further questioned, he said that he was perfectly sure that it was neither French, German, Italian, nor Spanish, as he himself was fairly well acquainted with all those languages, and that what the man said was sufficiently long to have allowed him time to follow it if it had been in any tongue of which he knew anything. One of the jury, whose mind seemed to be running on nihilism, suggested that perhaps it might have been Russian. Mr. Bostock agreed that perhaps it might have been Russian. The coroner observed that there were many outlandish tongues talked in Europe as well as Russian. There was Turkish, for example, and Greek. Mr. Gundy thereupon pleasantly suggested that there was Magyar, Romanian, Bulgarian, Polish, and the like, not to mention Romany, which was largely talked in all parts of Europe. Mr. Bostock said, very likely, but he didn't know any of those tongues. There was evidently nothing further to be got out of him, and he was allowed to retire after the coroner had duly thanked him for his sense of public duty in coming forward as he had done. The coroner's jury could find no other verdict in the case of poor Chickering than that of willful murder against some person or persons unknown. There was nothing to be got out of Red Gundy, as he called himself, beyond his original story. He had seen Seth Chickering in St. James's Square shortly after Chickering came out of the Voyagers' Club. He had followed him a little, thinking the figure familiar to him, and the figure disappeared near a court leading out of St. James's Street. 
Rat was looking down the court when he heard a cry and the sound of some sort of scuffle. He was run against suddenly by a man who was running with all his speed and who nearly knocked him over. Rat flung him contemptuously aside, he said, but he thought of nothing more serious than a drunken row. He went down the court, however, and there he found Seth Chickering dead. Many people thought the story suspicious, but there was nothing clear to be said against it. Gundy was able to make it plain enough that he had credit for a large amount on one of the great banking houses, and that he had made arrangements for a lengthened stay in London. There was no evidence whatever against him. He stated that he had not been in London for years. There was nothing to do but to let him go his way. He blandly assured the coroner that he should not be out of the way for some time, that he meant to enjoy himself a little in London. An interviewer, not from the catapult, called on him at the Berkeley Hotel. He was entirely affable and even more than affable. He had up a bottle of champagne and some curaçao, and he made a surprising blend out of the two. He produced some almost divine Havana cigars, and he made it a condition of the interview that the interviewer should smoke and drink. Having the interests of his profession and his paper close at heart, the interviewer accepted the basis of negotiations. The story was soon over the whole town. It flew, rumour wafted, from one quarter to another. The tale of the great diamond find alone would have been marvellous enough to keep the town going for three out of the proverbial nine days at least. The story of the wondrous mine and the strange bond of partnership and the wealth to be poured in upon wholly unexpecting creatures. But then came on the top of it all the mysterious murder of poor Chickering, the man who had brought home the good news, the man who had brought home the names and evidences by which to find out the heirs, and there was he murdered on the very first night of his arrival in London, and no hint or trace of the murderer could be found. When people had time to think of anything but the murder, they talked of the beautiful girl who was associated with Lady Scardale, eccentric Lady Scardale, don't you know, in the Chelsea Culture College, and who had now suddenly become a great heiress. The society papers were studded with paragraphs about Fidelia Locke, and some of the illustrated journals published photographs of her. The catapult made a great affair of it, for Gerald Aspin interviewed himself and set forth his own version of the story at great length and with an easily acquired clearness, the clearness of one who knows all about it. But Gerald had many feelings in his own mind to which he did not give the slightest utterance in print. That was one reason why he interviewed himself for the catapult, and allowed no one to interview him for any other paper. He was thus secure against being asked, and having to evade questions which he did not choose to answer. There was one great question which he always kept asking himself, and to which as yet he could find even in conjecture no manner of answer. Who knew of Chickering's coming to London, and who had an interest in Chickering's death? For that Chickering was the victim of a mere robbery or a chance murder, Gerald could not bring himself to believe. The whole of the property was in the hands of respectable lawyers at the Cape. 
It was estimated, in a note in Seth Chickering's handwriting, at about a million sterling, and it subsequently proved to be rather more than this. Seth Chickering's death had increased the common stock in diminishing the number of shares, so that every one of the persons, either heirs or partners, would come in for a succession of something slightly over two hundred thousand pounds. This story naturally excited the greatest interest in London for the proverbial nine days. Everything about the business, from the original eccentric contract to the mysterious murder of Seth Chickering, and the extraordinary discovery with regard to the heirs, was so attractive to a public that delights in stimulating novelties, that for at least a week little else was talked about or written about except the story of the Blue Water Diamond Mine. Domestic politics, foreign politics, a society scandal, a divorce case, and a new play completed in vain for a glance of public favour. The Blue Water Diamond Mine, the murder of Seth Chickering, the heritage of Gerald Aspen, and the evidence of Rat Gundy were the themes of the time, and until the freshness of those themes was exhausted, little else had a chance of serious consideration. People talked it over on the tops of omnibuses and in fashionable drawing-rooms, in the smoking-rooms of clubs, and at corner coffee stalls. It was discussed in all its bearings by all the journals, and ingenuous people rushed into print with all manner of explanations of all the perplexing points in the affair, explanations in every case evolved entirely from their own moral consciousness, and based upon no knowledge whatever either of the persons concerned, or of the cape, or even of diamonds. There was, of course, no difficulty about finding most of the heirs. Gerald Aspen was the producer of the pocket-book, Red Gundy had almost witnessed the murder. The Honourable John Raven, the secretary of the Voyagers' Club, the Captain Jack Daw of his friends came forward at once. His elder brother, Lord Wallington's second son, had disappeared long ago, no one knew where, and no one very much cared. Captain Jack Daw assumed that he had left his money to him, Jack Daw, more to annoy his eldest brother and his father than out of any affection for him, the younger brother. However, they had been friends to a degree rather remarkable among the ravens, and in any case, Captain Jackdaw, who was desperately hard up, was delighted to enter into this inheritance, and very little disposed to quarrel with the destiny which had brought it about. "'Poor old Percy, good old Percy,' he said. "'Wonder who shot him?' roguish lot in those places must have been from behind though for percy was a good plucked on yes i'm sorry for percy but i'm deuced glad to get the oof and if captain jackdo was glad so were a great number of persons to whom captain jackdo owed money red gundy explained himself the word vermust implied that he had gone away. So he had. He had joined the association when he was at the Cape, had put his share of money into it, and done his share of work, and then had got tired of the whole thing, and as he gracefully expressed it, had turned it up and started to South America to join in a fight that was going on in one of the turbulent republics. 
He had just come to England after a series of adventures in the Republic, which had nearly ended in his being shot by one party, and which actually ended in his receiving the title of general from the other and the finally victorious party. By the terms of the agreement he was entitled to his share in spite of his retirement, and he might very likely have gone off to the Cape again to look after the Blue Water Mine and his comrades, but for the unexpected event which now made such an expedition useless. As for the daughter of Captain Locke, there was no difficulty in finding her. Lady Scardale was well known in London, and everyone who knew Lady Scardale personally knew of her friendship for Miss Fidelia Locke. The only remaining heir was Jeffet Bland. An advertisement was put into all the newspapers, calling upon him to come forward, but no answer was returned to the appeal. Few stranger things can readily happen to a young man than to be raised suddenly from a position of comparative poverty to one which promises positive wealth. At the first blush, Gerald did not rightly realize, did not even try to realize, his new position. The thing was all so sudden, it had all come in such a rush. Moreover, though he was thus unexpectedly made the heir to considerable riches, though he was nominally the master of a fortune such as had seemed as far beyond his dreams, as the koh nur itself, he was not yet actually in possession of his property. There were formalities to be gone through, legal conditions to be fulfilled, twenty trifling necessary acts to be accomplished, and above all, there was the first day of the next January to be reached, before Gerald would, in what may be called the physical sense, be the proprietor of his legacy, and free to do with it as he pleased. The time and the formalities would indeed be soon over, but still Gerald did not fully recognize that he was to be a rich man. He began gradually to recognize it, however. He had never been of a mercenary turn, he had never coveted money, or the things that money can give in any mean way, but he was a young man very well capable of enjoying himself, and perfectly well aware that, other things being equal, the young man with many thousands a year has a far better chance of enjoying himself than the young man with only a few hundreds a year. But Gerald had been very content, had been almost happy on his few hundreds a year. He earned them himself by doing work which he liked very much to do. He was exceedingly proud of being a journalist, and exceedingly pleased with the catapult, and he liked the bustling, varied, endlessly changeful London life of which his duties showed him so much. His little eerie on the embankment, his fellowship at the voyages, his attitude of a keenly interested spectator and dexterous commentator upon the big game of life that was being played all around him, these things had so far filled the measure of his modest ambitions and gratified his desires. Now, of course, all was in a measure changed. His former liking for his work had been an excellent thing, for it had enabled him to do that work better, and had given him pleasure as well as profit. But now he need not work again unless he chose. He had nothing to work for. So far as the great endless human question of food by day, and sleep by night, and raiment to cover him went, he never need distress himself again. These, the great wants of man, as Schopenhauer told him, were comfortably arranged for by a father who had left him to shift for himself since he was a child.
Human happiness, he remembered once reading in Schopenhauer, when he was working up an article for the catapult, was simply based upon health, food, protection from wet and cold. Well, he had had so much all his life so far, and his new-found fortune could not gravely increase the sum of his happiness if these were all. But were these all? he kept asking himself now, as he mused in his embankment watch-tower, while the blue-gray smoke clouds floated from his pipe out far across the river, and his thoughts floated with them into the future and its new possibilities. Gerald was not a man to whom the merely physical side of life appealed preeminently. He was not an ascetic, and he was willing enough to let no flower of the spring go by him. But he was no sensualist, and in his dreams of the disposition of his treasure, the thoughts of mere satisfaction of the senses played little or no part. It scarcely occurred to him, or occurred to him merely as a slight factor in the problem, that he could now afford to dress better, to drink costlier wines, to live as well as the most epicurean of the voyagers, that he had at his absolute command many of the things that would appear exceedingly precious and exceedingly pleasant to most young men, who found themselves suddenly rich beyond their dreams. Indeed, Gerald was too bewildered by his good fortune, when he at all tried to realize it, to form any precise idea as to the course of his new life. It was so astonishing to think that many things which he had desired to do, and which had seemed as impossible as Astolfo's voyage to the moon, would soon be at his absolute command for no more pains than the signing of his name to an oblong strip of paper. It was more astonishing still to find that now, when he had all these desires and desirable things within his grasp, how very few of them he seemed to be immediately in need of. He had wished for them in a vague way, as one wishes for sunlight on a wet day, but now that they were placed within his grasp, he scarcely felt that he wanted to stretch out his hand and take them. This mood would change, he knew, in his heart of hearts. He would soon realize his position and its conditions, but for the moment it seemed to him that his old condition was one of excellent content, and that there was something at once frightening and irritating about his inheritance. He did not want to leave the catapult. He was very happy with the catapult. And then it flashed across his mind that he could, if he chose, make the catapult his own, and the thought seemed to him so whimsical, so suggestive of the private soldier who is suddenly called upon to be commander-in-chief, that he laughed aloud. End of chapter 10《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》ハッピーバースデートゥーユー。ハッピーバースデートゥーユー。ハッピーバースデートゥーユー。ハッピーバースデートゥーユー。ハッピーバースデートゥーユー。ハッピーバースデートゥーユー。ハッピーバースデートゥーユー。ハッピーバースデートゥーユー。ハッピーバースデートゥーユー。ハッピーバースデートゥーユー。ハッピーバースデートゥーユー。ハッピーバースデートゥーユー。ハッピーバースデートゥーユー。ハッピーバースデートゥーユー。ハッピーバースデートゥーユー。ハッピーバースデートゥーユー。ハッピーバースデートゥーユー。One evening came out with an elaborate and amazing report of an interview with Mr. Randolph, or as he preferred to call himself, Red Gundy. The report began by saying he had removed from the Berkeley Hotel into elegant bachelor apartments in St. James's Place, St. James's Square. The representative of the Moonbeam was shown into one of the most elegant of these apartments by the Bedouin attendant, who watched over the outer doors. He was then consigned to the charge of Mr. Gundy's Arab servant. 
he was received with the greatest courtesy and was left for a while to meditate among the interesting collections of objects which told of mr gundy's taste for foreign travel sport and adventure all manner of weapons of chase were there and tiger skins alligator hides the antlers of various kinds of deer the skin of the grizzly bear and the teeth of the alligator there was a grand piano and there was a banjo and likewise a light guitar suggesting as the poetic interviewer said tender reminiscences of soft summer nights under some balcony in madrid or seville mr gundy evidently dabbled in the pictorial arts as well for the walls were ornamented with marvellously artistic etchings and silver points which bore the initials of r g plainly mr gundy had varied tastes and gifts for on the piano stand and on the piano itself were lying several scraps of music bearing the announcement words and music by red gundy on a large table was displayed a magnificent sword of honour with jewelled hilt which bore an enamelled inscription traced in greek character and words along its blade presented to colonel red gundy by the patriots of crete in gratitude for his brilliant services as a leader of volunteers in their cause against the moslem oppressor near the sword lay a superb revolver with gold mounting and a scroll on the gold mounting made known that the revolver was a gift of emin pasha to his one true friend and companion in arms captain red gundy some of the pictures on the walls were those of beautiful women in foreign garb all made further precious by presentation autographs from the fair beings whose lovely lineaments they portrayed stuffed birds made up an important part of the room's decoration among those was an immense creature measuring seventeen feet from wingtip to wingtip and this the interviewer was informed was the celebrated rook or rock of which so much has been read in the arabian nights which indeed was long held to be a creature of fabulous birth or existence until the genius and enterprise of captain red gundy discovered its reality and its genuine haunts so much of the moonbeam's interview had been read with utter amazement by gerald aspen he was reading the paper in the familiar smoking niche of the voyagers club curiously enough his companion was red gundy himself gerald had followed up miss locke's request by seeking and making the acquaintance of mr gundy and she had brought him to dine at the voyagers club they had dined at the very same table where poor seth chickering dined gundy was now sitting in the chair where seth chickering sat just before he went out on that walk homeward which he never completed gerald had not yet begun to explain all his gloomy business to gundy although he meant to do it but as they were lighting their cigarettes his eye fell on the moonbeam and the big capitals announcing the interview with mr gundy and he could not help reading on a little way then he looked up in some surprise hallo i say you promised me the first interview for the catapult you know gerald said distractedly gundy was smoking a big thick full-flavoured able-bodied havana cigar which he had taken from his own case a new twinkle came into his bright falcon-like eyes as they glanced at the copy of the moonbeam which gerald was holding out reproachfully towards him promised you the first interview for the catapult why certainly so i did and so you shall have it my boy 
Yes, but look here. What do you call that? That thing in the moonbeam? That? Why, that's all rot, you know. Yes, but how did they get it? Did you authorize it? Well, yes, in a manner, yes. Did you see anyone from the moonbeam? Give you my word, my dear boy, I never saw anyone from the moonbeam. Did they write to you? Oh, yes, they did. What did they ask for? Well, of course, they asked for an interview. And you said? Well, in fact, I said I was too much engaged, but that my secretary would write them out the sort of thing I thought they would probably like to have. Then your secretary wrote all that glowing account of you and your rooms and your works of art and your presentation revolvers of swords of honour and all the rest of it? Not he. He never wrote a line of it. There is the best possible reason why he couldn't have written a line of it. Yes, what reason? Why, because to begin with, there is no such person in existence. I haven't any secretary. Do you want to know any other of the many, indeed, the innumerable, reasons why my secretary could not have written the account of the wholly imaginary interview? And no, said Gerald with a laugh. I think his non-existence is reason enough for me, although I don't say by any means that it would convince all of our present-day controversialists. But who wrote the description, then? Can't you guess? Not the least in the world. Why, of course I did. Didn't I do it well? Haven't I got what your newspaper people would call a graphic style? Graphic? Isn't that the right word in the right place? Yes, I admit the peculiar merits of your style, Gerald said, still a little annoyed. But you certainly promised me the first go-in, and you always boast to be a man of your word. So I am, dear boy, so I am. So you will always find me. I have broken lots of laws and codes, and I don't know what in my time, but never my own code, never my own word. A man's word ought to be his bond, they say. By Jove, my bond is my word. But I can't now have the first interview. Why not? Here I am. Ask me anything you like. Interview away. Go ahead. But the description of your rooms. All right. Ask me about them. Why, they are already described in the moonbeam. Gandhi put down his cigar for a moment in the little tray beside him and exploded into a peal of really mirthful laughter. He had a ringing, silvery, boyish laugh. It did Gerald good to hear it. One could not distrust a man with such a laugh. Gandhi fairly shook and rolled in his chair. "'My dear fellow, this is too delightful. And are you really taken in, really and truly? Why, I am a child of imagination far beyond anything I ever ventured to dream of. I shall take to the writing of sensation novels next.' "'Well, but do let me know what you are laughing at. Give me a share in the joke. Things are not quite so gladsome all around that one can afford to miss his share in any bit of fun. Good heavens, don't you see? Why, it's all a piece of invention, that description. All my own, every word of it. I haven't any such trophies, I haven't any such weapons. I don't compose music and words of songs, although I do flatter myself I can sing a little. And you have not got all the presentation swords and pistols from everybody? Not a sword, not a pistol. Gerald was astounded. And you did not capture the great bird? Oh, come now, I say, that is rather too bad of you. You don't want to make me believe that you could possibly have swallowed that, the rock, sent but the sailor's rock. By Jupiter, I thought that was rather overdoing it even for the moonbeam. 
I felt almost certain that would have blown the gaff on me, but it didn't, no, it didn't. Why, I say, I suppose if I had sent it to the catapult, it would have done you very well. Do you know I had a great notion of saying I had captured the rock in company with two famous sporting friends of mine, Sir John Mandeville and His Excellency Baron Munchausen? I am sorry I didn't know. I suppose it would not have made any difference? Then you really mean to say that all that description was a pure invention of yours? Every line of it, Gandhi said, with a look of modest self-satisfaction, the look of one who thinks that this time, come now, he does deserve some praise. And what on earth did you do it for? Why don't you see? Can't you recognize the friendly touch of a good comrade? Oh, well, I am quite willing to grant the intention, but I positively do not see the good effect. No? That is odd. How dull you newspaper fellows are. Why, you are not one little better than the moonbeam yourself. Of course I did the whole thing to give you a lift, dear boy. Don't you see? You come out tomorrow. The moonbeam's sold. Hoax on our stupid contemporary. Our vulgar rival makes a fool of himself again. Up went the price of donkeys. Anything you like. And then out you come with the real, genuine, authentic, only warranted to wash, fast colours entered at the stationer's hall, sole secured copyright edition, all rights reserved, dramatic rights of course included, version of an interview with Captain, Colonel, perhaps you might make it a brigadier or general, Gandhi, KCB. But it will have to be admitted that it was you yourself who hoaxed the moonbeam people, Gerald said, a little doubtful still as to his feelings on the whole subject, and wishing his new friend had not quite so exuberant a sense of humour. Yes, yes, of course, isn't that the real fun of the thing? Why not have a line, hoaxed by Gundy himself? I'll stand by you, old chap. I'll say I did it all because I considered the moonbeam utterly unworthy of any serious contribution, but that stupid as I thought it, I did not think it was quite so ignorant an idiot as to be taken in by the sort of thing I sent along. My dear fellow, I see any number of extra editions of the catapult in the whole affair. Why, look here, Colonel Gundy's own explanation. How Gundy hoaxed our ridiculous contemporary. Gundy's own authentic explanation. There are thousands of copies in that. By the way, Aspen, why do you always call each other our contemporary? Why not call them by their names as people do in ordinary existence? Gerald was amazed, amused, not quite certain whether he had to do with an altogether sane man and this adventurous new friend. But certainly, in all his ordinary demeanour, Gandhi, notwithstanding his odd manner and ways of looking at things, seemed sane and shrewd enough. "'Well, now for the real interview.' Gandhi said, after he had puffed his cigar vehemently, and chuckled to himself, gasping between the puffs. Just before going to the real interview, the interview for print, you know, I should like to ask you a few questions on my own account. I say, not necessarily for publication, but as a guarantee of good faith? No, Gerald said, laughing at the incorrigible levity of his companion. Not exactly that, but to enable myself personally to understand something of the mystery, for there is some ghastly mystery in it, the mystery of this whole business. All right, ask me any question you like, and I'll tell you no lies. There's a variation on the good old saying, ain't it? You go ahead and keep in the main channel, or in midstream, just as long as you can. Mr. Gundy settled himself out for a comfortable smoke and a good long talk. Let's begin at the beginning. 
I want to hear about all of you who were in this company or association, whatever it was called. Gandhi laughed. All right, let me see. There were five of us, you know. Seth Chickering, your father, who always kept to his own name like the true-born Briton that he was. Yes, Aspen said hurriedly. The next? In truth, he was a little afraid to hear much about his father. He preferred to have as few revelations as possible. The details of camp life on the felt might be highly droll and diverting about the father of someone else, but Gerald had a good depth of reverence in him yet, and did not care for any anecdotes Mr. Gundy might have on the subject of the late Mr. Aspen. Seth Chickering, he kept his own name too. I needn't tell you much about poor old Seth. You saw him only once, but such as you saw him then, you would have seen him if you had known him for any number of years. Simple as a child and plucky as an English bulldog, stick to his friend in life or death, and act like a man to his open enemy. Not a treacherous touch or a drop of coward's blood about good old Seth. Yes, I should have thought all that. There was Captain Locke, an Englishman, too. We christened him Warbler, because he sang so much and so well. Mr. Gundy spoke with a certain pathos in his voice. How did he die? Gerald asked, inspired to this question by the tone of Gundy's allusion. Gundy had let his cigar go out. He struck a match and relit it. The operation seemed to occupy much attention on his part. He looked away from Gerald as he answered. As a good many chaps die in such places, killed in a fight. It was a fair fight, though, mind, he added hastily. Although I believe he was driven on to it, forced into it, and that he never wanted to kill a fly on his own account. Driven into the fight by the man that killed him? No, by Jupiter, Gundy exclaimed, with a sudden burst of passion. The man that killed him was driven on, too, by that devil called Noah Bland. Noah Bland? The man who was lynched? Yes, after I left. I don't know where he was spawned or what thieves kitchen sent him out, but there he was, and he claimed to be the first man that found the diamonds, and he was not. He only watched and hung on the track of cleverer men, and came up at the right moment and cried halves. You know the sort of thing. At least you would if you had been gold mining or diamond mining. You were all Englishmen? All but Seth Chickering, and after all he was of the same flesh and blood. That was why we formed a company, to pull together English-speaking chaps and guarantee each other against the Afrikanders of all sorts and colours. Not but that some of the very worst of the same Afrikanders were not a deuced deal better than such a cad of an Englishman as Noah Bland. Well, you agreed to work together. Yes, we agreed to work together, and to hold on together, and to divide, share and share alike, and to have a regular offensive and defensive alliance. We agreed that if any of us died, his share was to come to anyone he liked to name as his heir, and that the others were to take care that the proper person was found. If any chap died without telling of any heir, then the share was to be divided along the surviving partners or the heirs of dead partners. Seth had charge of all the wills, and he told us himself that he didn't have any kith or kin, and that his money, if he should be bowled over, was to be divided among his surviving pals. But good heavens, who ever thought of Seth Chickering getting bowled over like that? If I were the president of an insurance company, I would have gone dead on Seth's life. Now, Noah Bland, there was a fellow you might expect shot or lynched any day. 
by jove i remember seth nearly killing him once upon a time and here gundy's face darkened again what about about falsehood and treachery about lying and making mischief about fetching and carrying i didn't know it then or i should have done the trick for him myself didn't know what that he had made the mischief told the lies on both sides got up the quarrel forced on the row the blood of poor captain warbler was as surely on noah bland's head as i am sitting here with you now bland is dead i was glad to hear that justice had overtaken him gundy said with unwonted gravity and the man you call warbler what about him we all liked warbler he had do you see the inestimable advantage of being a gentleman he had odd ways and he did not take much care of himself but he had a brave good heart and as i have been saying he was a gentleman well rest his soul he sang us many a good song and told us many a good story he used to talk sometimes to seth chickering and to me but more to seth seth was a graver and more sympathetic chap than i vieux fil de rire et de la blasphème isn't that the phrase in the scruffless french novel but he talked to me too sometimes about her about whom gerald asked although he knew well that it was about fidelia about his little daughter here at home in england look here aspen i like you i have taken a liking to you and by jove i don't know whether it does you credit or the reserve that i should have taken a liking to you most of my family i dare say would make out that the mere fact of my taking a liking to you ought to damn your character for ever but i do like you all the same and we may as well have this thing out first as last it's about this girl i have come to england you know her then gerald asked in some surprise and with an inexplicable feeling of dissatisfaction know her not i how on earth should i know her i know her name and i know where she lives but i don't know whether she is ten years old or twenty i came because i thought i should like to find her out and make sure that she got her rights that was kind of you was it wait until you know out of regard to her father's memory no not that at least not that alone i came because i could not rest because twas i that killed her father gerald started this was indeed a revelation i want to know that girl red said the idea has got hold of me i think i would shake it off if i were you gerald answered why so how could you take her hand how could you give her your hand the hand that killed her father that's where it is exactly i want to know her i want to do something for her i would like to die for her if i might and if it would do her any good look here i am not a moral man or a scrupulous man even i am shockingly wanting in a sense of moral responsibility but i do feel a ghastly sense of responsibility for that man's death why i have seen men killed by hundreds in my south american experiences and have killed men myself and have thought no more about it than about the killing of cockroaches what do i care about a man or a man's life unless the man is my friend but this man's life i do care about it was a fair fight he was set on me by that scoundrel noah bland and i killed him in self-defence if i hadn't shot him he would have shot me what is there to repent of in that yet i do repent it i wish i could find a woman's relief from trouble and have a good cry over it give me your hand old man aspen said you are a good chap i don't think so i come of a bad lot 
Curious, all the women in our family were saints, and all the men were devils. All the women, even who married into us, were good, and all the men bad. Well, my first, my very first feeling of what people call conscience is about that girl's father. I wish to heaven I had let him hit me. I wish to heaven I had let him shoot me. Why do I feel like that? Some of the fellows I have seen killed, I and killed with my own hand. I dare say they had daughters too, but I don't know. I have got this girl in the brain, and I am bound to know her and help her all I can. You can introduce me, can't you? I couldn't. I don't know why. I understand your feeling, and I honor you for it. But you have killed the girl's father, and I couldn't present you as the man who did it, and I couldn't pass you off as a man who didn't do it. There's my position, Gundy. I like you immensely. I don't blame you one little bit, but somehow I couldn't do that. Gundy drew a deep breath. Odd thing, he said. How anybody will help a man to get bad, and how few, even among the good, will help him to get back to something like goodness. I thought you were the very man to help me to get acquainted with that girl, but you have scruples. Well, all right, I have a way of my own, old chap, a way quite without you. It will cost me something, the giving up of a resolve I had formed. I was determined not to go back to civilization. Now I've got to go back to it all through you. But I don't blame you, and I shan't bear any malice. Gundy smiled his sweet, bright, boyish smile, and held out his hand to Gerald. "'What do you mean by going back to civilization?' Gerald asked. "'Do you mean staying in London? You must stay in London if you want to see her.' He did not mention her name. He had grown shy already of mentioning her name. "'Wait and you'll see,' said Gundy. One favour, my boy, I have to ask, and it's this. A man may have different names in life, mayn't he? There may be one name for London and another name for South Africa, eh? Well, if you should ever meet me with my London name, would you have the goodness to forget that I ever called myself Red Gundy? There's a good chap. I say, what dark some mystery is this? May I not have the first of it for the catapult? Not a bit of it. This little business is purely private and confidential. We shall meet again, as they say in the place, and you will hear of me by a different name, and that will be my real name, and all I ask you to do is not to express any wild amazement over the transformation, but just to take it for granted and drop Red Gandhi for the present. If you want Rat again, you can send for him at any moment, and he's bound to come. But above all things, remember that to that girl I am not Rat Gundy. I am myself alone. Rat Gundy killed her father, well and good. Uh, I mean, ill and bad. But I am not Rat Gundy. I am myself again. Don't be alarmed, old chap. There's no deception in the business. All on the square, honest engine. My identity can be warranted on the most respectable authority. I can have a bishop to avouch it, if you like. We have one in the family. Red stood up and the two young men parted. Gerald went home much mystified and feeling as if he were treading the mazes of a Christmas pantomime. Was everybody going to turn out to be somebody else? The other day he himself was a poor young man, now he was to be a rich young man, and hardly knew how it all came about. The other day he made the acquaintance of Seth Chickering, and now Seth Chickering was the victim of a mysterious murder. The other day he had never heard of Fidelia Locke, and now he was linked with her in a strange sort of colleagueship, and he was falling fast in love with her. The other day he had never heard of Red Gundy, and now Red Gundy was his fast friend, 
and was the man who had killed Fidelia's father, and now Red Gundy was turning out not to be Red Gundy at all, but somebody quite different, who was to come on Gerald with absolute surprise. This is becoming rather too much for me, the young man thought, as he walked homeward. My whole life is getting to be a puzzle. I don't quite know what is real and what is not real, and it's of no manner of use to me for the catapult. Being all true, nobody would believe it. That evening Red Gundy went to his chambers, paid the bills, gave handsome largesse to the servants, had his trunk packed, he travelled as experienced travellers generally do, with very little luggage, and that little well compressed, announced that he was going out to South America, and drove to the railway station and took a ticket for Southampton. He did not go on board any steamer, however. He remained in Southampton only one night, and returned to London the next day, having contrived in the meantime to make a considerable change in his appearance. When he reached London, he took rooms at Claridge's Hotel, and then visited tailors, hatters, and bootmakers of the most approved order. As he was passing a large mirror in one of the hotel halls, he looked at his own face in it and smiled. It was not admiration for his own personal appearance that caused the smile. "'I don't suppose Margaret would know me again in any case,' he said to himself. "'But at all events she wouldn't recognize Red Gundy in me, even if she had ever seen the worthy Red.' It was soon known in the hotel that the newcomer was the brother of an earl, and that he had been about the world a great deal. There was a vague impression that he had been rather a bad lot, but that he was not nearly so bad as his brother, and an impression got about that he had come home with a good deal of money, all which facts or fancies were duly chronicled in the columns of the enterprising catapult. But Gerald Aspen did not do any interviewing at Claridge's. The newcomer, although the brother of an earl, was not nearly so interesting a person as Red Gundy, and the catapult did not take any pains about him. The moonbeam made no attempt to compete for him, but indeed the moonbeam had not yet quite got over the discouraging effect of the hoax perpetrated so mercilessly by Red Gundy. The change of personality was a source of fresh delight to Red himself, who enjoyed everything that came his way, and could, if need were, have lived in a nutshell and contented himself a king of infinite space. End of chapter 11Chapter 12 of Red Diamonds by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter 12. A Master of Fence. So long as man remains the man he is, the sword will always exert its glittering fascination over him. It may be barbarous to love white weapons, and we may grow out of it in time, and certainly we carry swords by our sides no longer, but the sword is a brilliant creature, and modern man, draped in the clinking garments of civilization, is often as eager to catch it by the handle as young Achilles was when Ulysses found him in Skyrus with the girl's gown upon him. It is a question that sometimes troubles the reflective mind, how will a distant generation, to whom the familiar carrying of swords has become as much a thing of the past as to be almost forgotten, how will it enjoy all that shining page of romance, all those cloak and sword dramas and tales, all the epic books and the epic dramas, as to the understanding of which a familiarity with arms seems essential? 
Up to yesterday, as it were, the world had been all the same, custom had run on the old lines, gentlemen had carried swords from the days of Diomede to the days of Diderot, Shakespeare's brilliant swordsmen, his Romeos and Gloucesters, were as much of kin to our great-grandfathers as they were to the Elizabethans, for whom they were written, as they would have been to the Homeric heroes, who figure metamorphosed in Troilus and Cressida. But how will they seem to that posterity to whom the idea of weapons, save as the tools of a military caste, are grown as unfamiliar as incantations? Some such reflections were passing through Lady Scardale's mind as she stood in the great gymnasium hall watching the fencing lesson for lady scardale was as eager and as advanced in her ideas concerning bodily training as she was in her ideas concerning mental training and if her court was a little academe for her girls minds to widen in it had a strong spartan element in it of physical exercise as well lady scardale's ideal woman was to be as excellent in bodily accomplishments as in mental endowments, and every one who came under Lady Scardale's influence was expected to conform so far to Lady Scardale's theories as to devote a certain portion of the day to bodily exercise. A girl might go in for what are called calisthenics, or for the more serious gymnastics, which daring woman adopts now with a success that would have astonished and shocked our great-grandmothers or she might dance especially those beautiful old-fashioned dances pavans and minuets and gavottes which gave our ancestresses grace and dignity of movement or she might go in for fencing for the matter of that any enterprising young woman might go in for all these accomplishments and many of lady scardale's disciples did and distinguished themselves therein but if lady scardale had a belief in the efficacy of any one form of bodily exercise over another she had a belief in the efficacy of fencing fencing she argued and argued rightly gave the body more universal exercise than almost any other form of physical test and she insisted that in england especially where no one fought duels it was just as valuable an accomplishment for women as for men so fencing was an established portion to the girl's education at lady scardale's place and the fencing hour was one of the most interesting hours in Lady Scardale's day. Every day a skilled fencing master came for an hour to give instruction in the handling of the rapier, and a very pretty sight the lesson was. The girls wore a dress that was at once admirably adapted for the purpose, and at the same time exceedingly becoming, and the great hall presented a very animated appearance while the lesson went on the professor instructing novices in the beginnings of the great art in one spot while in others mimic combats were going on between girls whose training was sufficiently far advanced to allow them to practice by themselves while in another the few girls whom the professor had specially singled out for their excellence and address were engaged in getting their inexperienced sisters into shape so that they should have less to learn when they came under the eye of the master lady scardale almost always came in at fencing time and watched the lesson she sat on a kind of little dais or raised gallery at the end of the room a dais led up to by two or three short steps and provided with chairs for the benefit of the occasional visitors friends of lady scardale or of the girls who were privileged to see the lesson 
On this occasion, Lady Scardale sat enthroned upon her dais, watching the lesson with the grave attention which she always gave to everything to which she devoted herself. Indeed, there was something more than her usual interest displayed, for the fencing-master was giving a lesson to Fidelia Locke, and anything in which Fidelia was concerned always inspirited Lady Scardale with an exceptional interest. The interest seemed to be shared by the fencing-master, for he appeared to be giving his lesson with a greater zeal and closer attention than he gave his other pupils. He was always thorough, he was always painstaking, he was always patient, as indeed a man requires to be who takes upon himself the task of teaching women to handle the small sword, but as it had seemed to the keen eyes of Lady Scardale, he was more thorough and more patient, and took more pains when he was teaching Fidelia Locke than he did at any other time. But indeed, Fidelia Locke was a very brilliant pupil, quick in this as in everything else she tried. She was already one of the best fencers in the class, and any fencing master might well be proud of her quickness and address. Lady Scardale's fencing master permitted himself to say as much to Lady Scardale when Lady Scardale once questioned him as to Fidelia's progress and as he did so, it seemed to Lady Scardale that he showed, for him, a most unusual animation. For it was not apparently in the nature of that fencing-master to be animated. He was a curious-looking man, this fencing-master. The splendour of his art, the brightness of the sword, had not passed into him. Tall and thin and dark, always closely shaven as he was, there was ever a deep blue-black shadow on his face, always clad in close-fitting black garments, there was something queerly funeral about him, which was the reverse of exhilarating. He looked as if he were ready for a duel in which he was certain to kill his man, and the very certainty had imparted a settled melancholy to his manner, and an additional sombreness to his attire. His lean, dark-skinned face, swarthy as a Sicilian's, seldom relaxed from an expression of rigid gravity. His thin lips seldom smiled. His eyes were intensely black, not brilliantly black like the eyes of children of the South, but of a dull deep blackness, which seemed never to betray a hint of the man's nature, or of the man's thought. Indeed, when Lady Scardale had first seen him, she thought him a most forbidding-looking person, but he was so excellently recommended, had so many diplomas, certificates and letters from all the best schools and masters of fence on the continent, that she could not very well decline his services on the ground of his blue-black cheeks, funeral bearing, and unpleasant eyes. All the better, she said to herself, the last chance of any of the girls falling in love with him. So he became her fencing-master, and a very admirable fencing-master he proved himself to be. Lady Scardale, who knew something about fencing, as she knew something about most arts, could see that for herself after the first lesson. The place was very quiet, as far indeed as the term can be applied to a place where a series of fencing lessons are going on. But the incessant clinking of steel against steel, and the incessant movement of feet, had something rhythmical in them, something even soporific, and Lady Scardale felt an uncompromising drowsiness creeping over her. She was just remembering, in a confused kind of mood, some verses of one of the young poets, who sometimes came in her way, in which she would speak of sleepiness as drowsy head, and the word drowsy head seemed to be keeping in chime with the clink of the swords and the moving feet, when she was suddenly startled from her oblivion by hearing her name mentioned in respectful loudness. 
Lady Scardale opened her eyes with a start. One of her maids, Lady Scardale would only be waited upon by women servants, was standing before her with a letter on a salver. Lady Scardale smiled. I was up rather late last night, Plimmer, she said, and I do believe that I was dozing. She put out her hand for the letter. It came by cab just now, my lady, said the maid, and disappeared. Lady Scardale held the letter in her hand. Her eyes were still but half awake. It was a letter on thick club paper, sealed with a large red seal, and addressed in a bold, masculine hand. Suddenly Lady Scardale knew that she was wide awake, and the arms on the seal were most familiar to her, and that the handwriting stirred her heart with a swift rush of many memories. Fidelia Locke, earnestly endeavouring to plant her foil on the leather plastrum of the fencing-master's chest, was suddenly startled by a little cry from the dai. Instantly she lowered her foil and turned to where Lady Scardale was sitting. Lady Scardale was bending forward in her chair, holding a letter in her hand with a strange look on her face. Fidelia flung aside her foil and ran swiftly to Lady Scardale's side. The fencing-master, stooping, picked up the falling foil and moved slowly after her. "'Dear Lady Scardale,' said Fidelia, "'is there anything the matter?' For she had been startled by the look on Lady Scardale's face. "'Is there any bad news?' she now added, for she saw that there were tears in Lady Scardale's eyes. "'Bad news,' said Lady Scardale, looking up into Fidelia's questioning face. "'Oh, no, my dear, no, no. Please go on with the lesson, Mr. Bostock, with someone else. I want Miss Locke for the moment. Read that, my dear.' Lady Scardale put the letter into Fidelia's hand, and the girl read it while the fencing-master moved back and chose for himself another pupil. This is what Fidelia read. My dear, I have come back upon your hands like a bad shilling, but still I don't think I am quite so bad as the bad shilling, for I fancy there is something to be made of me even yet. You always had a sort of faith that good was to be got out of me, and yet, dear sister, I think you, more than any other in the world, have put me out of conceit with myself, for if you could make nothing out of me, didn't that plainly show that there was nothing to be made? Oh, well, here I am again, anyhow, and I have made a fortune in the meantime, honestly, too, which is the curious part of the business, and whenever my dear sister wants to see her most good-for-nothing, once pauperized, now rich brother-in-law, she has only to send a message to Claridge's Hotel, and he comes. Worthlessly but still lovingly yours, Rupert Granton. Oh, Fidelia, Lady Scardale exclaimed, with tears in her eyes, how good heaven is to me, how happy I am! I have got my brother-in-law Rupert back again. And the warm-hearted woman's eyes were filled with tears, and indeed the tears were coming into the eyes of Fidelia also, for she knew all about Rupert Granton, how much Lady Scardale had loved him, how much he had loved her, how kind he was and tender, and all unlike her husband, and yet how wild he was, and how the bad blood of the family was in him, and how he would leave the sheltering arms of her affection, and go out of sight and out of civilization, and wander far away somewhere, and be heard of no more until this day, this joyous day, this day of hope and gratitude. Then Lady Scardale sat hurriedly at her desk and scribbled a little note, which contained nothing but the words, "'Come to me at once, darling brother,' and then Lady Scardale cried on Fidelia's neck, and Fidelia did some crying too, out of sweet and sympathetic companionship. Nobody noticed them. 
the girls were too busy in employing the latest moments of the rapidly waning hour the fencing master never noticed or at least never seemed to notice anything presently a bell rang to announce that the hour was done and that the first lesson in fencing had come to an end the girls took off their masks and put their foils carefully into racks in the walls and rapidly dispersed in all directions to their various duties for the time the fencing-master still lingered in the hall occupying himself with his gear on another occasion lady scardale might have imagined that he was lingering to get another word with fidelia locke by her side on the dais but just then she was too much occupied to think of anything through the pretty crowd of dispersing maidens Plimma made her way again, this time with a card on the salver. It bore the name of Rupert Granton. Oh, said Lady Scardale, I will come at once. But there was no need for her to move, for Mr. Rupert Granton had very composedly followed on Plimma's heels, and was standing at the end of the hall. The fencing-master, having finished his preparations for the next lesson, was just passing through the door as Rupert Granton entered. He drew back, looked curiously into Mr. Granton's face, and passed on. In another moment, Rupert Granton had crossed the hall and was holding Lady Scardale's hand. Fidelia rose to go away and leave the two together. "'And no, dearest, don't go,' Lady Scardale said. "'I would rather you were here at the first meeting. "'Later, if we want to say anything in particular, you can go if you like, "'but I would rather you stayed with me now.' "'Mr. Rupert Granton was simply our old friend Red Gundy, "'dressed up quite up to date, and cleanly shaven and wearing double eyeglasses.' He came over to Lady Scardale, who was standing up to greet him, and he took both her hands in his and tenderly kissed them, and looked into her eyes, and then he kissed her forehead and did not yet speak a word. "'Dear Rupert, dearest brother, how long you have been away, and you have come back at last. I never thought you would come back. I never hoped to see you any more.' Then she threw her arms around his neck and kissed him tenderly, fondly, almost passionately. "'I never meant to come back,' Granton said. "'I did not think myself good enough to come back. I had knocked about the world too much and done too many queer things, and I didn't think I could ever show myself to you and your world again. And to tell the truth, dear sister, and shame a personage whose acquaintance you will never have any chance of making, I shouldn't have come back even now but for a reason which has little or nothing to do with you. Oh, no matter about the reason, no matter why you have to come, since only you have come. I will try hard to keep you this time. I will hold you and never let you go. Fidelia was standing a little way back, watching this singular meeting with the deepest interest. "'I don't think I should have ever known you again,' Lady Scardale said as she looked fondly at the young man. "'Of course, it is a long time ago, and you have changed and grown and got strong. I should have known you by your eyes, I think, but then you cover them with glasses. Has your sight grown short, Rupert, dear?' "'Sight wears out like other things in a wild sort of life.' "'Your love for me hasn't worn out,' she asked plaintively. "'Even in your wild life, if it was wild. "'Oh, I should have known you by your voice, Rupert, dear. "'Come, I must introduce you, before I say another word about myself, "'to my dear friend and colleague, Miss Fidelia Locke.' "'She drew Fidelia forward by the arm, "'and Fidelia looked frankly into the bright, handsome face of the stranger.' One who had known Red Gundy would not have been likely to know him again in Rupert Granton. The great drooping moustache had gone, 
the chin and cheeks were closely shaven, and the pince-nez concealed the bold brightness of the eyes. Red Gundy used to wear his hair rather long, and dress carelessly. Rupert Granton wore his hair cropped close to his head, and was elaborately got up in the latest London style. Even under the pince-nez, however, Fidelia could see that his eyes drooped when he saw her, and that his cheek coloured a little, and he seemed embarrassed. Can it be, she thought, that this reckless wanderer is shy, that he is afraid of a woman? If Rupert had, however, been overcome by a momentary shyness, he evidently soon got over it. He talked in a rapid and easy way to his sister-in-law and to her friend. He said but little of his own past life, and seemed to convey the idea that he would prefer not to have anything said about it. He told them that he had come last from South America, that he had taken part in a revolution there, and that he had before that time taken part in a revolution in Mexico, but he said nothing about mining adventures and diamond fields. Suddenly a new visitor was announced, at the mention of whose name Fidelia dropped her eyelids for a moment, and then looked up with a brightened face. The newcomer was Gerald Aspen, a frequent visitor at the College of Culture during recent days. He came to Lady Scardale's die and received the greetings of her kindly hand, and then Fidelia shook hands with him, and then his eyes fell bewildered on Rupert Granton. He did not recognize him, and yet was utterly puzzled with some strange impression that he must have met him, that he ought to know him, that the bearing of the man was familiar. The mystery was explained when Lady Scardale said, this is my long-lost roving brother, come back to civilization and his loving sister-in-law. Let me introduce Mr. Rupert Granton to you, Mr. Aspen. Then Gerald's eyes met those of Rupert Granton, and a look of meaning was interchanged, and Aspen knew the whole story. Come and look at the fencing, Lady Scardale said after they had talked for some time. You used to be a great lover of fencing at one time, Rupert. Yes, I have always kept it up a little where I could, Rupert said. I am very fond of fencing, Aspen said. So they turned to look at the new bout of fencing. Mr. Bostock had kept up his practice mechanically, it might almost seem, while they were speaking. He had the air of a man who meant to convey the idea that the talk which was going on was no business of his. Yet if any of his pupils had noticed or had watched the movement of his eyes for other than fencing purposes, it might have been seen how often he glanced around at the dai, and how he seemed to follow the movements of Fidelia Locke with a keen and hungry look. Bostock was able to use his eyes for such purposes, but he was too good a fencer to have to watch very narrowly the feints and lunges of his pupils. He could spare many a glance at Fidelia, and at Gerald Aspen too. The whole group of which Lady Scardell was the centre moved towards Bostock, who had just completed a lesson, and Lady Scardell introduced her brother-in-law to Mr. Bostock. "'You seem to be a wonderful fencer,' Granton said. He had been watching the proceedings for some moments with much interest, contrasting the easy movements of the girls with the odd alternations of rigidity and supple snake-like swiftness which characterized the play of Bostock. Bostock turned and fixed his dull black eyes on Granton's face. Yes, he said quietly, I do fence pretty well. And you? He jerked out the question suddenly at the end of his answer, and simple though it sounded, there was something in it of offence, something taunting which irritated Granton, as a chance stroke from a whip might. I can do a little of most things, he answered with a laugh. 
When a man has been in as many places as I have, he picks up a smattering of various arts, as well as half a dozen vocabularies. Jack of all trades, you know. Bostock gave his shoulders the least perceptible little shrug. It suggested dexterously, though by no means delicately, the scorn of the expert for the amateur. Granton noted the action and was again annoyed. "'I wish you would so far humour me, Professor,' he said, slightly emphasising the word Professor, "'as to allow me to cross foils with you, if you are not too tired.' He underlined the last phrase, ironically, but the dull eyes of Bostock grew no brighter. "'I am not tired,' he said simply. "'If you will come into my dressing-room, I can lend you some things.' The girls had all gone away by this time, only Lady Scardale remained in the room, and of course Fidelia. Lady Scardale declared that she was most anxious to see Rupert handle a foil again after all these years. She had seen him fence with his brother often enough in the old days, and she remembered his skill, and was curious to see it displayed again. Fidelia begged to be permitted to remain, and Rupert expressed himself as at once delighted and dismayed. To tell the truth, he did not in his heart feel the least dismayed. He was perfectly confident that he could score off Bostock, and he was very willing indeed that the process should take place before Fidelia. So he followed Bostock into his dressing-room, with the thin ghost of a whistle playing about his lips. In a few moments Granton came back, arrayed in the panoply of the mimic duello. Then the fencing began. Gerald, standing on the little dye between Lady Scardale and Fidelia, watched it with the interest which he felt in everything in which Granton took part. Granton was always something of a puzzle to him, but he could not help liking the man and his extraordinary buoyancy and his wonderful ability in doing a great variety of things. It was evident from the first moment, when he crossed foils with the master, that fencing was included in the things that Granton did well, but it was evident also, at least to a skilled swordsman like Fidelia, that Granton had entered upon the contest with a degree of confidence which he did not keep unshaken after the first few seconds. Indeed it was so. Granton had been convinced that he would show this teacher of girls what fencing really meant. He had handled swords since on fields where the issue certainly meant danger and might very well mean death, and he had had the best of it in the few cases in which it was a matter of very serious importance to him that he should have the best of it. He had tried his hand with every prévôt d'armes in Europe, and had always come off well. He had been a member, and a distinguished member, of a famous London fencing club in the days when he still more or less adorned society. So he had prepared to attack Bostock with the same composure that an espada would show who was advancing towards the fated bull. But a few seconds changed his mood. It only needed half a dozen passes to convince him that Bostock was the toughest of fencers he had ever encountered, and a few more that the man was really and truly a master of his weapon. At first, Granton had attacked swiftly and incisively, trying bot after bot, and he knew many a one with amazing rapidity. But Bostock met every one of them with an imperturbable certainty, which astonished Granton. If the man's rapier had been a very wall of steel, he could hardly have seemed to be more securely shot off from all Granton's assaults. Then in his turn, Bostock began to attack, and Granton felt that the tables were being turned on him with a vengeance. 
he defended himself as desperately as if he had been really fighting for his life on some grey morning in a parisian park and for some brilliant despairing seconds he succeeded in keeping bostock off but only for a few seconds suddenly the fencing master's weapon gleamed before his eyes in an unexpected find and there was a dexterous turn of the wrist a sudden sense on granton's heart that he and his foil were quite alone in the world and the next moment he felt the decisive touch on the breast just where the little crimson heart was soon on to the leather of his jerkin granton dropped his foil bostock recovered and saluted fidelia applauded gerald smiled slightly and lady scardale looked anxious granton noted each action and understood it fidelia had applauded because she loved the game so well that she must applaud the most skilful quite apart from any personal feeling gerald had looked surprised because he had not expected to see granton defeated lady scardale looked anxious because it slightly worried her to think that her favourite should not succeed in anything he undertook granton had to admit to himself that he felt somewhat chagrined he had wanted that applause for fidelia to be given to him he had counted upon it almost as a certainty and after all it had been given to that funeral fellow who was standing there bolt upright and staring with his dull expressionless eyes at the dai where the fair fidelia was enthroned like a queen of beauty but granton was not going to allow any hint of chagrin to betray itself in his manner well done he said laughing and extending his hand to bostock who bowed swiftly but did not take it i thought i was a pretty smart fencer but i have met my match this time and no mistake you must have studied in rare schools bostock bowed again as stiffly as before it was worth taking pains about he said and i took pains i believe one can succeed in anything if one only takes pains enough granton rejoined lifting his mask from his face and moving towards the dai the fencing master looked after him i hope so he said more to himself than to granton End of chapter twelve End of the first volume. Chapter Thirteen of Red Diamonds by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Thirteen: The Wrong Weapon bostock followed granton to the foot of the dais fidelia leaned over to speak to him that was very well done mr bostock she said i shall never again dare to encourage the hope i have cherished so long that some day or other i may be able to touch you she pointed lightly towards the red heart on his breast as she spoke if her finger had been a burning steel and his breast undefended it could hardly have made him wince more unexpectedly but fidelia did not notice it for she had turned to speak to gerald and gerald did not notice it for he was only looking at fidelia and lady scardale did not notice it for she was intent upon her brother-in-law and was earnestly hoping that he felt no great sense of discomfiture only granton observed the odd look that came into bostock's face so that is your weak point my man he said to himself well well i do not grudge you your glory in her eyes but i think you will find it is dearly bored there's a bad time waiting for you i'm afraid my good bostock if i read you all right gerald had spoken to fidelia and fidelia had turned around to him with a look of pleasure on her face 
Granton, still unassumingly watching Bostock, saw the look and saw that Bostock's thin lips seemed to grow thinner, a mere red line in his livid face. Bostock suddenly turned to Gerald. "'How would you like to take a turn with the foils, Mr. Aspen?' There was an odd attempt to be light-hearted, almost conciliatory about the man's voice, which sounded curiously in Granton's ears. Gerald answered, smiling and slightly embarrassed, that he was afraid he was not a good enough fencer to venture to cross swords with such a master as Mr. Bostock. Bostock shook his head. "'You ought by your look to be a good fencer,' he said. "'I am seldom deceived, but I should like to make sure. "'Come a couple of passes. "'I do not expect that you will defeat me,' he went on, "'while a very unpleasant expression that was intended to represent a smile disturbed his face. "'But I shall be able, just for my own satisfaction, "'to decide what sort of a fencer you would make.' "'Yes, do, Mr. Aspen,' said Lady Scardale, who was rather anxious in her heart that someone else as well as Granton should suffer defeat at the hands of the fencing-master. Gerald glanced at Fidelia, who seemed to smile encouragement at him. That was enough for Gerald. Perhaps after all, who knows, he might win.' He was young, quick, in good condition, he had always considered himself a very fair fencer, he had kept his fencing up more than young journalists usually do. If he did succeed in touching Bostock, what a triumph! If he failed, there was no ignominy in failing after Granton, the more especially as he had not himself challenged the issue. So he went hopefully enough into the dressing-room, and came out very quickly arrayed for combat. There is something exquisitely exhilarating about a fencing match, which almost no other form of pastime can quite afford. For while it calls forth all the skill, all the dexterity, all the suppleness of body and steadiness of nerve, of which a man is master, it goes to the root of the matter at once. It appeals to the instinct of battle, which every man carries at least a spice of, hidden away somewhere in his composition. Even boxing with all its charms does not so directly appeal to this higher sense of combativeness. For fencing is such a fascinating reproduction of real strife, it is the duel turned into a game and played almost with real weapons. It affords something of the same pleasure that was accorded to the Scandinavian guards in Valhalla who could fight all the afternoon and be as much wounded and hacked as they pleased, but were sound and whole again when the time came for supper. Fencing is fighting at which a man may count on living to fight another day without the ignominy of running away. That is one reason amongst many why it is popular and endures in lands where men no more think of using the small sword to settle differences of opinion than they would think of taking the sedan chair to go to the club. The fencing began. Gerald was resolved to keep his head cool and to adopt a policy of wary defence. He meant, as he put it picturesquely to himself, to sell his life as dearly as possible, and he entered upon the struggle as one who, foredoomed to defeat, resolved at least to make defeat dignified. But to his surprise he found that he was doing better, very much better than he expected. He held his own successfully against one or two of the master's attacks. Indeed, it seemed to Gerald as if Bostock's feints were by no means as subtle or as invincible as they had seemed to be when he was dealing with Granton. "'Can it be?' 
Gerald asked himself with a beating heart, while he kept making attacks which were indeed repulsed, but not repulsed so strenuously as he expected. Can it be that I am a better fencer than Granton? Can it be that there is a chance of my pinking the invincible Bostock? As he thought this, Bostock made a feint which seemed to Gerald pretty obvious, and which he was able so promptly to forestall, that when Bostock made the subsequent attack, Gerald's parry was not only successful in defending his body from Bostock's point, but actually struck the foil out of Bostock's hand, and sent it spinning away to the far end of the room. In an instant, Gerald, half proud, half apologetic, had dropped his point, but Bostock, bounding a step or two back, caught up another foil from the rack behind him and began to press Gerald hard. Gerald was somewhat bewildered by his apparent triumph, and by the extraordinary quickness with which Bostock had recovered from his disarmament. He seemed to be suddenly face to face with quite a new antagonist, before whom he felt quite convincingly that he was as helpless as a swimmer in some furious sea. He made the half-circle desperately as if for dear life, and was expecting momentarily the touch of the foil on his breast, when, to his surprise, he felt a thrill like that of a red-hot wire along the underpart of his lifted left arm, and he was aware that Granton had flung himself between them and had struck up Bostock's foil and had caught Gerald's wrist in his left hand. What had happened? What did it all mean? He heard Granton's voice speaking sternly. There is something the matter with your foil, Mr. Bostock. Gerald stood still and stared. Bostock, who, when Granton had parted them, had seemed for a moment inclined to turn on his interrupter, was now standing erect and stiff. Granton, who was masked again, was looking straight at him. There is something the matter with your foil, Mr. Bostock. Bostock lifted up his foil, and Granton, before he could prevent him, promptly took it from him. Bostock made no show of any resistance. However better Bostock might be as a fencer, Granton was undoubtedly a far stronger man. Besides, Bostock did not seem to see any reason why he should resent Granton's interference. He only seemed to be stiffly surprised. "'Look here, Mr. Aspen,' said Granton. "'This is a pretty thing to fence with. Do you see this, Mr. Bostock?' His voice was very sharp indeed. The two women, wondering at the unexpected episode, came down from the dai. All they knew was that while they were watching the fencing, Granton had suddenly slipped his mask on, caught up his foil, and at a bound had come between the combatants and dexterously stopped them. Now they were anxious for the explanation. Gerald looked at the foil and understood what Granton meant. It was a foil from which the button had been sharply broken off, a very little distance from the point, leaving a jagged edge of steel. He stared in astonishment. Bostock stared also, his face displaying the liveliest astonishment. Then he spoke. "'Good heavens, what a blunder! How could I have made such a mistake? Pray accept my profoundest apologies for my carelessness, Mr. Aspen. It was really your own fault, for you pressed me so hard that I got excited and caught up a disused foil by mistake. You are too quick a fencer for me.' Bostock's face was perfectly still while he spoke, but the tones of his voice expressed the deepest regret. Gerald was touched by the regret, and flattered by the compliment to his skill. 
"'Oh, it doesn't matter at all, not of the slightest consequence,' he murmured, but Granton caught him sharply up. "'Not of the slightest consequence? Does it matter? You don't know what you are talking of. If that had been lunched home, it would have spit at you like a hare. Look at your sleeve, man!' Granton's words recalled to Gerald the sharp sting of pain he had felt, a pain forgotten in the excitement of the subsequent seconds. He looked at his left sleeve. It and the shirt beneath it were torn, where the foil had passed through and been wrenched out when Granton struck it aside. Linen and cloth were wet with the blood that came from an ugly-looking scratch on the flesh. "'My poor boy,' said Lady Scardale. "'Lend me your handkerchief,' said Fidelia. "'I know something about bandaging.' "'Attended ambulance lectures, of course,' said Granton with a laugh. "'Best leave it to me, Miss Locke. I have had practical experience and of worse wounds than this, though not worse than it would have been by Jove, if I hadn't skipped in between with more luck than Romeo's. Why, a foil like that would go through a deal plank. Bostock was profuse in his apologies. They ran from him rapidly, not ineloquently, persuasively, while his face remained unchanged the while, leaving the face of some old-fashioned fountain which never alters for all the volume of water between the unchanging lips. He could never forgive himself for his carelessness. He could not think how it came to pass that such a foil was lying about. He hoped Gerald would understand how deeply pained and grieved he was, and so on. Gerald, whose arm was beginning to feel a little stiff and very sore, accepted these apologies in a very good part, and withdrew with Granton into the dressing-room, whence he emerged in a few minutes with a handkerchief tied deftly about his head by Granton, whose fingers proved to be, for such a matter, as delicate and dexterous as any woman's could be. "'My dear boy,' he said to Gerald, who complimented him on his skill, "'I have helped to dress some devilish ugly wounds in my time in many parts of the world.' He was silent for a second or two, and then he added, "'By Jove, I have been in a good many odd places, and seen a good many rum sights, but I don't think I ever saw a much rummier thing than this, take it all in all.' "'Why, good gracious, you don't suppose he did it on purpose?' Gerald asked, in surprise, and Granton answered, "'Oh, of course not.' but it was rummy all the same. A man who can lose his head like that is not quite the man whom I should choose for a fencing master. That's all. Perhaps Gerald might have been inclined to agree more cordially with him if it had not been for the fact that the trifling incident of which Bostock was the cause had really rendered him a service for it had made Fidelia Locke exceedingly sympathetic and sweet and womanly tender in her solicitude for him, and she asked him how he did, so often and so graciously, that really Gerald felt more like a wounded hero returning from battle to the eyes of his lady-love than a respectable young journalist who had had his arm scratched in an accident. It was a very sweet sensation to be pitied and fussed over, and made much of by Fidelia Locke, and it is perhaps not surprising that Gerald could not find it in his heart to feel very angry with the blundering fencing-master. As for the blundering fencing-master, he had disappeared as soon as possible. While Granton was dressing Gerald's scratch, he had remained with Lady Scardale and Fidelia, and had repeated to them all his profound expressions of regret, and all his very plausible explanations of how the accident had occurred. He had never been disarmed before, not since he was a child. 
Young Mr. Aspen had a wrist of iron. The foil flew so far away that his only thought was to be armed again, and his involuntary and not inexcusable breach of etiquette in seizing a fresh weapon from the rack instead of waiting and resuming the one which had been flung so far, had allowed him by a most unhappy accident to catch up a foil from which the button had been broken off by chance the previous day, and which should never have been left in the room at all. The two young men walked a little way together after leaving Lady Scardale. "'You carried that well off,' Granton said, after a moment or two of silence. "'The hat! Oh, it does not amount to anything!' "'No, I don't mean that. I mean the first meeting with Red Gundy turned into Rupert Granton. Well, I am much beholden to you for the quiet way in which you took it. As to the other business, it is a very queer affair, and I can't make it out. I don't see anything very queer about it. Don't you? Who is this fellow Bostock? All I know of him is what you see, and the fact that he gave evidence at the inquest of poor Chickering. Yes, but somehow his face haunts me, and not the face so much, perhaps, as the eyes. Where did I see those eyes before? I don't believe I ever saw the man until that inquest, but the eyes get on my nerves. I feel as if I had seen those very eyes, but in a different face. I see it like a picture. I have a way of carrying my memories in pictures, don't you know? And I see Bostock's eyes in another man's face, only I can't recall the other face, or think where I could have seen it. Well, anyhow, call me an idiot if it does not turn out that that man Bostock has some queer story behind him, and some still queerer story before him. Aspen could not see it, and only laughed, with a wonder in his secret heart, why so dashing and generous a fellow as Granton should have such a prejudice against Bostock merely because Bostock had got the better of him in a fencing bout. End of chapter 13《Chapter fourteen of Red Diamonds by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter fourteen. A Place by the River. A river is an endless delight to minds that are in the least tinged with poetry. All my life long I loved rivers and poets who sang of rivers. Ah, the memorable words of a great prose-writer who saw in his time many rivers. The word river has its own invincible charm, calling up to a wondrous mind visions of the yellow Nile as it flows through hushed old Egypt and her sands like some mysterious thought threading a dream of the mighty mississippi whose channel varies day by day of german rhine and gallic rhone and holy tiber and the arid bed of Ilissus, where athenian washerwomen try to find water enough to splash their clothes in by the spot where socrates talked with carmides beneath the plain of the danube and the meagre manzanares and many a stream beside and best of all to the english wanderer his own dear thames that silver name calls up pictures of osired reaches of shining spaces of water flooded by the passing oar of green lawns reaching to the river's lip of backwaters where the water rat watches with amazement his reedy kingdom invaded by the darting canoe and gliding punt of pleasant rural inns dear to anglers of gardens and locks crowded with a gaily coloured crowd and all manner of craft 
of plashing wares, of launches disturbing, like Leviathan, the sanctity of the river god's repose. But if such delicious glimpses of river life float across the fancy of him who thinks upon the sweet themes of Spencer and of Collins, there are other aspects of the river which he is less likely or less willing to remember. In its civic aspect, the Thames is less enchanting. If the Roman severity of the embankment lends it here and there something of an antique dignity, its surroundings are principally grimy wharves, the many-windowed backs of warehouses, the landing-places of steamers, the mouths of canals, the mooring-spaces of barges. Where the river widens towards Greenwich, welcoming the salt kisses of the sea, there is a kind of marine beauty, partly of actual fact, partly of dear association, which do much to redeem it. But there are places along our London stream which are as unlovely as can well be found in any portion of the earth. One of the ugliest spots in all the river is on the right bank beyond Battersea, just where the stream is thoroughly urban, just where it seems to have abandoned all memories of the green fields it has passed, of the wooded hills whose bases it has washed. Here, in a wilderness of decaying wolves and tumble-down houses, stood a certain building which demands our special attention. The building has apparently once been a kind of boathouse, but now it seemed to have been long disused. It stood out in the river some feet from the shore, on a platform supported on piles driven into the river bed. On one side, some of the piles had settled down a little, so that the whole house sloped slightly from the perpendicular, rakishly, like a knowingly adjusted, somewhat inebriated bat. The platform on which the house stood only extended about a foot all around the shanty, so that anyone who wanted to walk around the house would have to do so with dexterity, with outstretched arms flattened against the wall, or run the risk of immersion into the stream. The hut had a door in front, and a door at the back, and a window on the upstream side, whose damaged panes consisted principally of brown paper. The building was connected with the shore by a sort of clumsy, dilapidated bridge of planks rudely fastened together. By the downstream corner of the river front, an exceptionally dirty, disreputable-looking dingy was moored, the whole place in its squalor and neglect had a sinister, even a villainous appearance. Nobody quite knew whom it belonged to, and nobody cared. It was rented, people understood, from a local landlord, who grew rich on the rents of strange tenements, and it occasionally had an occupant, a red-haired, red-bearded man, who knew nobody, and whom nobody knew or seemed to want to know. The riverside population were incurious. Their own affairs occupied them sufficiently. They had little leisure, little inclination for the affairs of other people. The occupant was at home one morning. The door facing the river was open, and let a certain amount of pale light into the sordid interior, which in its decay carried out worthily the traditions of the exterior. The occupant sat by one side of the door, with his back to the wall, in such a way as to obtain all the advantage of the light, for he was reading, without being seen from the outside. He was red-haired and red-bearded, between the red hair and the red beard and the raw fringe of red whisker, there was not much of the occupant's face to be seen. 
but his eyes were bright curious eyes and they did not somehow seem to be in keeping with the red hair the occupant seemed to be quite absorbed in his study he was reading a letter which bore signs of having been much read before and yet the familiarity of its contents did not appear to rob it of any of its interest in the eyes of the man who was reading it as soon as he came to the end of it he turned back again to the beginning and read it slowly over again his eye travelling steadily along the lines and never missing a single word presently he shook himself folded the letter up and was about to put it in his pocket then he paused as if changing his mind opened the letter again spread it carefully out and began to read it once more but this time aloud in a low measured monotonous voice he read it as if in the process of thus reading it aloud he was fulfilling some religious function going through some daily duty as indeed he was in the foreign lands where i have been he often said to himself sitting in that same place priests read their breviaries aloud to themselves daily this is my breviary and i read it aloud to myself daily though i know every word of it by heart the letter was not a very long one son japhet it began and as the man read those words his strange eyes looked stranger son japhet by the time you get this i shall be a good bit dead they are going to hang me blank them they've got the bulge on me for i meant to do for them and i did for some of them too be praised you know i always wanted to be a fine gentleman some day and i wanted you to be a fine gentleman too japhet and so you shall be though i don't live to see it i told you about our little diamond ring here there is to be the big divide next new year but i shan't be in it i shall be otherwise engaged blank them now the fewer there are to divide the more there will be for the survivors some of them have gone to kingdom come already never mind how i didn't think i should be joining them so soon but it was my own fault for letting them get the chance to have the drop on me however it's no use crying over spilt milk or spilt blood either for the matter of that my little game is just over japhet and your little game is going to begin they are scoring off me now japhet you've got to score off them by and by remember the divide's on new year's day every man that drops out of the running before then makes it a bigger pool to share if they all drop out except you why you are a rich man japhet one of the richest men in the world think of that and think of this too that if they are going to hang me in half an hour and if you are as good a pal to me as i have been to you you'll make some of them pay for it seth chickering's going to london soon he's been the worst of the gang against me all along london's a mighty dangerous playground japhet and it might be that seth came to harm suppose you looked after him a bit and kept him out of mischief eh and as for the others i don't know where the devil rat gundy has gone to he's a devil himself he is but he did me a blank good turn without knowing it when he shot Locke's silly heart out. Well, Japhet, I guess that's about all I've got to say, and not is as good as a wink to such a dark horse as you are. You've got to play for a big game, and if you win, why, you can boss the world. That's about the size of it. Blank them all. If I only had my old gun in my hand, how I would make them sing small, though they crow so loud now over the hanging of me. Remember that, Japhet, they hanged your father, your father who was good to you and played a great game for you. You'll be serving your own turn as well as mine in thinning them out, so thin them out and be damned to them, and to you and to me too. 
which is what the parson says will happen, your affectionate father, Noah Bland. When the man had finished reading the letter aloud, he gave a kind of groan, more like the growl of a wounded animal than any articulate human utterance. Then he folded the letter carefully, placed it back in its stained envelope with the Cape Colony stamps and Cape Town postmark, and put it back in his breast pocket. When he had done so, he sat still for some seconds, staring at the wall opposite, as if his whole attention was riveted to the fantastic movement of the sunlight as it danced, reflected from the water outside. But the man was not watching the sunlight, was not thinking of the sunlight. He was thinking of that queer South African tragedy, of the strange succession of deaths, of the lynching of Noah Bland, of the curiously transmitted heritage of hate and lust of blood and lust of gold. He was thinking of his own strange life and of its longings, of its desperate shifts and sins, of the endless pursuit of money, the quenchless thirst for power. Before his swimming eyes, the walls seemed alternately to show red with the stains of blood and to grow yellow with the glitter of gold. Faces rose up from the past, the face of Noah Bland, fierce, forbidding, powerful, a face at once ambitious and bestial, the face of a Napoleon of gorillas. There were other faces, faces of men who had been Noah Bland's accomplices in his many dark leagues of crime, faces of men who had been his victims, hideous faces, hopeless faces, they all came crowding out upon his memory now, as some great crowd rushes through an opened door. Some of those faces he had not thought of for years, some he had almost forgotten, some, but these were fewer, he had wished to forget. As he sat there watching these faces of his fancy, they seemed to vanish, giving place to a single face, a strong, foolish, kindly face, framed in ruddy hair, a face that had been ruddy once, but now was pale in recent death. As that face floated into his mind, the man smiled in cruel satisfaction, but even as he did so, the smile died away, for that face had gone and given way to another, a woman's face, young and exquisitely fair, and as he thought of that face, he sprang to his feet with another animal-like cry, and flung up his arms, and opened and clenched his hands, as if he were grasping at something that was almost beyond his reach, and trying to drag it down to him. "'I will win that, too,' he muttered to himself, "'that and all.' He shook himself as a man might do who was trying to shake off sleep, and turning, walked to the open doorway and stood staring at the stream. In the bright light he did not look attractive. Anyone passing just then and seeing him, anyone with an eye to the fitness of things, would have thought that the unpleasant neighborhood had found a very appropriate inmate in this unpleasant figure but no one was passing. The river was almost deserted, save for some rare barges lazily moving along. The man walked cautiously along the narrow platform till he came to the corner where the dingy was moored. He got into the boat, unfastened the rope that tied it, lifted the skulls into the water, and pushed off. Keeping the boat's head around, he began to row upstream, at first slowly, but after a few seconds, with such rapidity of stroke and such great muscular power, that the dingy seemed almost to fly through the water. The current was strong against him, the wind was strong against him, but he seemed to make light alike of wind and current as he rode steadily on, 
tearing his boat through the water and putting into every stroke an amount of skill and strength which would have delighted a university coxswain. When he had gone a certain distance, he suddenly slackened speed, and turning his boat around with a few strong strokes, he began to row as swiftly downstream. He rowed for some time without stopping, his strokes falling with exquisite regularity into the water. At a uniform speed he passed along the unsightly old wharves, till he came to Battersea Bridge, and the beginning of the embankment. After he shot the bridge, his strokes became as steadily as before, but somewhat slower, and he dropped leisurely down the river till he came to that part of the embankment on which the old physic garden fronts. Here he suddenly shipped his oars and allowed the boat to rock upon the waters, drifting slowly with the current, while his eyes were fixed upon the red wall of a house to the right of the physic garden, a red wall which he could just distinguish gleaming in the sunlight through its screen of guardian trees. As he gazed, his lips moved and he muttered to himself, to win or to lose, he said, to win or lose, to win that is worth all the rest, but to win that and to win the rest, to win all, that is the great game, that is the game to play, that is the game to win. He was silent for a few seconds while his boat drifted idly upon the idle waters, then, when he had fairly dropped below the physic garden, and out of sight of the red walls on which his thoughts were fixed, he caught up the oars again, and turned his boat head round, and rowed without a pause as fast as he could, back to the crazy building which he had chosen for an abode. He tied up his boat and entered the place. As he trod, the crazy old timbers seemed to tremble, and when he flung himself into a chair the edifice shook. He sat in moody silence for a while, then he rose, and going to a little cupboard in a corner, he took out a small bottle containing a dark, ruby-coloured liquid. He held the bottle up to the light and looked at it with a grim smile. Not quite the kind of stuff to make the hand steady and the mind cool, he muttered to himself. But I want it today, I want it today. He poured a quantity of the fluid into a glass and held the glass in his hand meditatively while he still muttered to himself. Here are power and love and riches, everything for which one longs and hopes and fights, full triumph full revenge, all in the magic of those dark drops. He shrugged his shoulders and laughed bitterly. It is as good as the real thing while it lasts, he said, and he spoke as if he were sneering at himself. Here goes, here's luck, and he drank the fluid down. Then he flung himself upon the ground again, with his back to the wall, and sat there silent, motionless, staring at the door, and watching with glazed eyes the visions begotten of the drug. End of chapter 14「Chapter fifteen of Red Diamonds by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter fifteen. Herb of Grace. Most people in Chelsea knew Mrs. Boringer's shop in the Queen's Road. Many a stranger was purposely brought to see the shop. Mrs. Boringer was a remarkable woman. She was calmly conscious of the fact and calmly satisfied with the fact. Some of her friends said that she had a face like a horse. She knew that they said so, 
and she knew also that there was a certain felicity of description in what they said, but she did not mind in the least. "'What has that got to do with my own ability in my own particular line?' she would ask, and the argument was really unanswerable. What had Mrs. Boringer's greater or less degree of facial resemblance to a horse to do with her ability in her particular line? Mrs. Boringer's particular line was herbs. She was a herbalist. She believed, fanatically, in the amelioration of mankind through the properties, juices, and essences of herbs, and to further that amelioration she kept a herbalist's shop in the Queen's Road, Chelsea, almost exactly opposite of the gate of Chelsea Hospital. There was no special reason why Mrs. Boringer should keep a shop of any kind, whether a herbalist's or another, but she kept it on principle, very much as Lady Scardale kept the culture college. "'Lady Scardale looks after people's minds,' Mrs. Boringer said. "'I look after their bodies. That's the chief difference between us.' Naturally, Lady Scardale and Mrs. Boringer were excellent friends. It would have made no whit of difference to Lady Scardale whether Mrs. Boringer had or had not been a regular shopkeeper come from the class of people to whom the keeping of small shops is the express business of life. Lady Scardale was honestly democratic in her heart as well as in her theories, and would have welcomed the society of a chimney-sweep if that chimney-sweep had anything interesting to say for himself, or any suggestion to make about the improvement of the chimneys in the homes of the poor. But Mrs. Boringer did not belong to the class of people to whom the keeping of shops seems to be the preordained business of life. She believed in the healing grace of herbs, and it seemed to her after due reflection that the best way of disseminating that belief was by taking a small shop and encouraging, through her personal practice and example, the sale of herbs. There are many occupations far more disagreeable than the sale of herbs. The sale of herbs is a clean business. It is dry, it is somewhat sweet-smelling, it brings its practitioner, in a pleasant way, in touch with the mysterious forces of nature and the regenerating strength of the Mother Earth. One learns an infinite variety of pleasing secrets in the study of herbs. One stores the chambers of the mind with a variety of quaint and delightful names of plants, the names that figure in the shepherd's calendar, and that are so many thousand times more delightful than the rigid Latin names of the scholar. Here were to be found specimens of almost every herb under the hoop of heaven, dried in bundles, powdered in packages, inspissated in syrups. There were the dried roots of the marshmallow, whose pale purple petals tell of August and the autumn in regions of salt marshes. There was the shrubby stalk of the garden sage, in whose medicinal qualities Mrs. Boringer believed as firmly as the Chinese believe. Here were masses of the acrid rose that Mithridates believed, and learned doctors since the king of Pontus believe, to possess the power of resisting the action of poisons, and believe inaccurately. Here were specimens of such quaintly named plants as Solomon's seal, and virgin's bower, and palma Christi. Here was masterwort, fragrant to smell, pungent to taste, masterwort which in earlier and simpler days was known as the divine remedy. So excellent was it esteemed. 
Here was holy thistle, which of old its admirers called Benedictus, for its supposed astonishing virtues. Here, in Mrs. Boringer's shop, the leaves of the noble laurel aroused no thoughts of Apollo, but were regarded solely as the materials for the manufacture of laurel tea. Here were the flowers of ladies' smock, which is also called the cuckoo flower, and the leaves of the ground ivy, excellent for infusion, and the dried seeds of pimento, and the dried leaves of hemlock, hidden away from the light, and the dried roots of the Christmas rose, or black hellebore, and the dried leaves of the deadly foxglove, and its less deadly cousin, the hedge hyssop. To the student Mrs. Boringer's shop presented a kind of condensation of the world. He might drift back from shelf to shelf to the very dawn of science. Her little shop in the Queen's Road was a very miracle of old-fashioned neatness. It was not in the least like a modern shop. It might have belonged to some country town in the middle of the last century. It might almost have nestled in the arcades of some medieval Italian city, except, perhaps, that its pervading and almost delicate neatness gave its old-fashioned air an especially English complexion. Mrs. Boringer's shop was not in the least like the shop of the apothecary, whom young Romeo visited on a memorable and melancholy occasion. It was exquisitely clean, ineffably orderly. Outside, it was painted in a lightish shade of green, suggestive of early spring, chosen, perhaps, partly as pointing a moral between the dry, mummied condition of the plants that were arranged behind the pines and along the internal shelves, partly as if in some measure to console the very plants by reminding them of the woodlands and the meadows, the heaths and uplands, from which they had been called away, to aid, through the supple chemistry of nature, in the healing of afflicted mankind. Within the window were arranged, even arrayed for the business was managed with an eye to the picturesque, any quantity of dried plants, bundles of mysterious twigs, shriveled bulbs and withered grasses, all presenting to the gaze of the inexperienced a medley of worthless weeds, but to Mrs. Boringer, and those who shared in the wonders of her art, they were full of deep meaning and of indefinite consolation. Inside, the little shop was all shelves and cupboards and diminutive drawers. There was a neat little counter, which was always covered with packages of seeds and specimens of preserved herbs, strong-smelling spices and sweet-smelling lavender, masses of theme and rue and rosemary. It was the most curious shop to enter, for the atmosphere was very strange, faintly sweet, subtle, and almost heady. It was like entering some tomb, some eastern tomb, where the mummied body of a pharaoh lay, steeped in the strongest spices, to await the summons of Osiris, yet there was something balsamic in it too, something that was almost as tonic and invigorating as the slight wind that stirs faintly among the pine trees in a land of coniferous hills. There were elements of perfume in that blended air which came from plants grown in no English garden, from simples gathered on no English hill. The learned botanist could have guessed by his sense of smell what a frequent inspection of the contents of certain of the shelves and drawers would have confirmed, that many of the dried plants that lay there colourless had first waxed to perfection in the luxurious darkness of tropic jungles, 
or beneath the heat of tropic suns. The tropic element in this English herbarium was no difficult of explanation to anyone who knew anything about it and Mrs. Boringer. It was due to Mr. Boringer, not to the Mr. Boringer who had given Mrs. Boringer his name so many years ago, down in that quiet Surrey village where he and she first breathed the air, not that Mr. Boringer, now dead and buried this many a year, and sleeping his last sleep in the quiet Chelsea churchyard, but his brother, Mr. Boringer, the sailor, as he was still called by old-fashioned friends, in the vicinity of Godalming and Guildford, a persistent skimmer of the seas. There was an element of romance about Mrs. Boringer's career. There was an element of romance about the career of Skipper Boringer. This latter fact is not surprising. To be a sailor is to be, ex officio as it were, romantic. To be free of a wider world than that of common folks who stop at home and sleep slug a bed upon the stable earth. But Mrs. Boringer, who sold herbs in a shop in Queen's Road, there did not seem at first to be anything very romantic about her. But she had had her romance, and a not incurious one. A generation earlier she was Susan Gemmell, the very fresh, very plump, very pretty twenty-year-old daughter of a well-to-do farmer, who was almost, but not quite, a gentleman farmer in that rich and pleasant land of Surrey, which lies below the hawk's back. His farm lay but a mile or two from Goldaming, hard by the winding way. Perhaps farming was a better thing then than it is now. Certainly it proved profitable in Farmer Gamel's hands, and he had plenty of money in the bank and plenty of money to spend upon his daughter and only child. Mr. Gamel was a widower, and he adored Susan as only a lovable man can love an only child. Nothing was too good for her, and so it happened that Susan got a very much better education than was the lot of even well-to-do farmers' daughters thirty years ago. But if Farmer Gamel was fortunate, there were fellow farmers who were not so fortunate, and Farmer Boringer was one of these. The Boringer farm paid its way, and fed and clothed its owners, but that was all it did, and the Boringer family was unlike the Gamel family, for Farmer Boringer's wife was alive and thriving, and Farmer Boringer had two sons. Those two sons were both young men, one was nineteen and the other twenty, and they both did as they were destined to do, and as it was indeed their duty to do, they both fell in love with Susan Gamel. Susan Gamel did her duty in falling in love with one of them. They were different, the two brothers. Andrew, the elder, was quiet, steady, solid, a slow learner and slow thinker, but what he thought he thought well, and what he learned he learned well. Hiram, the younger, was very different. He was a lively country lad, even a bit wild, very good-looking, a great hand at all rural sports, a great hero at all rural festivities. It would be only natural for a girl to fall in love with the idle apprentice instead of the industrious, but Susan was independent even as a young girl, and she fell in love with Andrew Boringer, to his calm satisfaction and the very bitter and very real despair of Hiram. It was late one summer evening that Hiram, leaning over a stile that led into the Gamel Acres, told Susan of his love, and learned to his surprise and sorrow that she was already plied to his brother Andrew. "'Is there no hope for me?' he asked wildly. None, she answered. 
Then he bade her good-bye, very gravely and sadly. "'I shan't see you again,' he said, "'at least not for a while. "'This bit of earth don't suit me after this, "'and I'll try something else.' He pressed her hand warmly, ran along the path through the field they had just traversed, and disappeared behind the hedge of alders. She did not see him again for fifteen years. Hiram had a little money, a few pounds of his own, and he and his few pounds disappeared together. He left a note behind to his brother, saying that he was tired of England and intended to try foreign parts. Andrew sighed over his roving disposition, shook his head when he talked of it to Susan, and wondered what his reason could be. Susan professed wonder also, but seemed unable to enlighten him. Then Andrew, having proposed for Susan's hand and being accepted, repeated his proposal formally to Farmer Gamel, and was as formally but most decisively rejected. Old Gamel was as obstinate as a mule when he liked, and in this matter of the marriage he seemed inflexible. Susan took his refusal, as she took everything in life, with composure. Luckily, composure was also the principal element in her lover's composition. We must wait, Susan said, and Andrew agreed, and they did wait. Other suitors came in and offered themselves to Susan, suitors upon whom old Gamel looked with a favouring eye, but one and all Susan politely showed to the farm door. If her father was obstinate, so was she. She would not marry Andrew without her father's consent, though she was five and twenty, but she would marry nobody else. So things drifted on through five summers and winters. She and Andrew met occasionally, but not very often. Each was perfectly devoted to the other. Both did their appointed work with a patience that had about it an antique dignity. They knew how to wait, and to wait without wailing. After five years, Farmer Gamel took to his bed, and being sick, felt sorrow for his stubbornness, and gave his long-delayed consent. Both Susan and her lover accepted their good fortune with a decent joy, but before they could be married, Farmer Gamel died and was buried, and Susan was rigid, as indeed Andrew would have expected and desired her to be, about the due observance of the proper period of mourning. For a year each remained almost as distant as before, he the head of his little farm, she the head of her great farm. But the year came to an end, and ended the patient waiting of these exemplary lovers. They were married in Godalming Church, and the head of the house of Raven gave away the bride, and Andrew came cross from his little farm to settle down as the master of the big farm. He was the master in name and the master in deed, but he never took a step without consulting his wife, and he never disregarded her advice but once, when he rode to hounds on a horse which she misdoubted, and the horse fell at a fence and threw him. He never recovered from the effects of the fall, and he died and left Susan a widow with one little girl, Lydia, ten years after they were married in Godalming Church. His widow mourned for him deeply, but she kept her sorrow stoutly to herself, devoted herself to her little girl, and carried on her farm so well that no one who worked upon it missed the hand of Andrew Boringer. Fifteen months after Andrew's death, a man came to the garden gate and looked in. He was burnt a brown red, his crisp black hair and beard had streaks of grey in them. His eyes were very bright, and the backs of his big brown hands had tattoo marks on them. 
Mrs. Boringer, seated in the window arranging herbs, nodded pleasantly to him. "'Good evening, Hiram,' she said, just as she had said it any time before that evening when he disappeared behind the alders. And Hiram came in and explained himself. He had been to see, he had been in all parts of the world, he had turned his hand to anything that was honest and hard to do, and everything had gone well with him. He had found gold in Australia, and silver in Bella Nevada, and rubies in Burma, and diamonds at the Cape. He had always loved the sea ever since the days when, as a lad, he used to tramp along the Portsmouth Road, mile after mile, without conscious fatigue, for the pleasure of seeing the great ships and the great grey water. When he ran away from England and his grief, he was too old to enter either the Royal Navy or the Merchant Service but he worked his way to South America, and happened to do well there, and bit by bit he earned enough and learned enough to buy a vessel of his own, and go where he pleased with her. He was now only forty years old, but he was in his way a rich man, with interest of all kinds in all parts of the world. But though he was rich enough to live in Park Lane if he pleased, though he had accounts in half a dozen banks any one of which represented in itself a comfortable little fortune he had always looked like what he was and what he wanted to be the master of a ship i am a trader he would say and he was proud of it as a matter of fact he was something more than a trader he was an explorer, and he had distinguished himself in an arctic expedition, which he carried out at his own expense, and which had earned him an honourable reputation in the world of wanderers, and an election to the membership of the Voyagers Club. He had been in China, travelling in the interior, when he heard of his brother's death. At that time the news was half a year old. As soon as he could, he started to return home, but it is not so easy to leave the interior of China at a moment's notice as it is to return, say, from Paris to London. His expedition had trouble with robbers, trouble with fever, trouble with false guides. It took him some time to get out of China, and then more time to get home, so that Mrs. Boringer was fifteen months a widow when Hiram arrived at the gate. Hiram's purpose was simple enough. He told Mrs. Boringer that he loved her still, that if she thought it right, he would gladly marry her. Such a marriage, he explained, was customary enough in many countries. But Mrs. Boringer did not like it. "'It may be customary elsewhere,' she said, "'but it isn't here, and if it were, I wouldn't,' which slightly incoherent statement Skipper Boringer wisely took to be final. Then he inquired, delicately enough, if she needed anything, and ascertained to his half-regretful satisfaction that she was well provided for, and that there was nothing he could do for her. But he gave her many rare and precious gifts from the stores of his explorations, declared that Lydia was just what her mother was at her age, Lydia was then ten, and finally, after a residence of a couple of months at Godalming, announced that he was to do in New Guinea on an ethnological expedition. So he said good-bye and departed. Skipper Boringer went his wild way, going down to the seas in his ship and sailing those seas to all manner of distant and wonderful ports. Mrs. Boringer went her way, coming to London. She was determined that her daughter Lydia should have the best education that could be got for her, and Lady Scardale's Culture College seemed to afford the desired opportunity. Lady Scardale, stopping at Holmraven once, had heard of Mrs. Boringer and had sought her out, as she always sought out people of originality, 
people with strength of character. She had liked Mrs. Boringer, and Mrs. Boringer liked her, and she had talked of her college scheme to Mrs. Boringer, and Mrs. Boringer had applauded the idea. So when the culture college was fairly started, Mrs. Boringer resolved that it should include Lydia among its disciples. She put the farm into careful hands, and secure in the payment of a large and regular rent, she invaded London. But Mrs. Boringer was not a woman to be idle even in London, hence the shop. She had always, from her youngest days, been deeply interested in the study of herbs and simples and their properties, and she resolved now that she would apply that knowledge to some purpose. The little shop in the Queen's Road was to let. Mrs. Boringer took it as it stood, lived with her daughter in the upper part, and converted the lower part into a herbarium. Lisbeth, an elderly woman from the farm who shared her mistress's tastes and much of her knowledge, looked after the shop under Mrs. Boringer's supervision, while Lydia attended the culture college. All were supremely happy. End of chapter 15Chapter 16 of Red Diamonds by Justin McCarthy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter 16 New Mysteries. The days went on and on, and Gerald was a frequent visitor at the College of Culture, and Rupert Granton was still more often there. Gerald was beginning to discover for himself what many a man had discovered before him, that the possession of wealth is by no means a guarantee of tranquillity. Gerald Aspen was undoubtedly rich, at least he was to be rich in a few months, but undoubtedly he was not tranquil. On the contrary, he felt himself growing more uneasy, more restless, more irritable daily. The fault, however, of the changed condition did not lie directly with the expected fortune. Only indirectly had his inheritance caused him any change of spirit. It was because that inheritance had for the first time made him aware of the existence on the habitable globe of a young woman named Fidelia, that Aspen was occasionally tempted to gird at his affluence in the spirit of a new Timon. For, to tell the truth, Aspen was beginning to find that his thoughts dwelt daily more and more upon the image of Fidelia Locke. Hers was a very delightful image to dwell upon, and, so far at least, Aspen had no just cause for complaint or self-tormenting. But the more Gerald thought of Fidelia, the more also he convinced himself that he was acting very foolishly in allowing himself to think so incessantly of her, and the more he convinced himself of his folly, the more also did he persist in his folly. He frankly admitted to himself that the more he saw of Fidelia, the more he longed to see her, that the more he thought of her, the sweeter his thoughts seemed, and the more delightful her image. "'There's no mistake about it,' he said to himself one day as he walked slowly along the road leading to Lady Scardale's a road with which his feet had grown strangely familiar. There's no mistake about it, I am in love with Fidelia Locke, and there's no mistake about it either, I might just as well be in love with the moon for all the good it is likely to do me. Gerald Aspen was mistaken in his deduction. It always does a man good to be in love with a good girl, and whether she returns his affection or not is really by the way. But he was accurate enough in his estimate of his own emotions. He had naturally seen a good deal of Fidelia of late, and the more he saw of her, the more completely he surrendered himself to the charm of her beauty and her strong spirit. Yes. 
Gerald went on to himself. Granton is right. There never was a girl like Fidelia. And as the name of Lady Scardale's brother-in-law flitted across his mind, his face darkened, for he had touched the keynote of his disquietude. It was not so much his own unanswered devotion to Fidelia Locke, which had of late so troubled him. It was the openly displayed devotion of Rupert Granton for Fidelia, which put him into such perturbation. Rupert Granton's admiration for Fidelia was unconcealed, and what was more to the purpose in Gerald's vexation, it seemed to impress Fidelia very pleasurably. It was impossible for Gerald to conceal from himself that Rat Gundy, or rather Rupert Granton, had won his way into Fidelia's favour very remarkably. He had done his best to keep the two apart, he had roundly refused to have anything to do with advancing the acquaintanceship, and now, in spite of all his wishes, here were Rupert Granton and Fidelia Locke apparently the best of friends, always seemingly delighted to meet each other, always full of mutual confidences. Poor Gerald! It must be recorded to his credit that although it was in his power at any moment to destroy the friendship by telling Fidelia who Lady Scardale's brother-in-law was, by simply saying, Rupert Granton is Red Gundy, and Red Gundy is the man who, on his own confession to me, killed your father. Though it was in his power at any moment to do this, and in any instant to destroy the pretensions of a man whom he believed to be a dangerous rival, the thought of such a betrayal of Red Gundy's confidence never seriously entered into his mind. It galled him to think that Rupert Granton seemed to be on a more intimate footing with Fidelia than he was. It roused a sense of wild, impotent anger in him when he saw her talking, earnest, interested, absorbed, with the man whose hand had killed her father, with the man whom by his own plighted word he was to help her to discover and to punish. But there was nothing to be done. Gerald could not betray Red Gundy, and without betraying Red Gundy, there was no way for him to counteract the influence of Rupert Granton over Fidelia Locke. Lady Scardale had set her heart on one thing, and that was a marriage between Fidelia and Rupert Granton. She loved the girl dearly, she appreciated her purity and her many sweet and noble qualities, she knew, or at least she guessed, what a wild kind of life Rupert had led, and yet she dearly wished that Fidelia should marry him. Lady Scardale was one of those women, very good and clever women often, who think a pure girl cannot have any better business in life than that of taking in hand some battered-out rake and reforming him. It did not occur to her that there was anything shocking or unnatural in this union of uncongenial natures, nor had her own sad experience satisfied her that a woman may sacrifice her purity and her life for the sake of redeeming a man and have to leave him unredeemed in the end. She told herself that Rupert was a very different man from his brother, and she was right in that, but she did not think seriously enough of Fidelia's share in the experiment. Sometimes, indeed, it had occurred to her that perhaps Fidelia might get to care too much about Gerald Aspen, but even a conviction of that kind would not have stopped her matchmaking plans. She did not care much about mere love affairs, she did not believe girls usually took them very seriously, and she was of opinion that women have higher duties in this world than loving and being made love to. It would, she thought, be a thousand times a nobler piece of work for the girl, for the best of girls, to redeem and regenerate a man like Rupert Granton than to make happy a man like Gerald Aspen. 
Any other girl, she thought, who was nice, would do for Gerald Aspen just as well as Fidelia, but she did not know any girl except Fidelia who could have any real and abiding influence over Rupert Granton. Therefore she began to grow a little jealous about Gerald Aspen's frequent visits, and was much delighted in her heart at the evident pleasure which Fidelia found in the society of Rupert Granton. She thought she could read into Fidelia's breast, and in truth she could not. Fidelia did enjoy the society of Rupert Granton very much. Her life had been for the most part cabined and confined, and he came to her with the atmosphere of a brilliant, broad and many-tinted world about him. She liked his daring, his scorn of conventionalities, his frankness, his exhilarating animal spirits, and his sunny temper. She liked to hear him sing, she liked to hear him talk, to talk to him. She could be infinitely more frank and free with him than with Gerald. There was not much difference between the ages of the two young men, but Rupert appeared to her to be infinitely older, to belong to a different generation, to be about the same sort of age as her father. As her father. Yes, there was the reason deep down in her heart which made her cling to Granton. It had grown to be a conviction in her mind, deep-grounded as an article of faith, that through Rupert Granton she would learn something about her father's death. She had no actual reason for thinking this, she had no reason to believe that Rupert had been in the diamond mines or had ever seen her father, but the moment she saw him and heard of his strange wandering life, it seemed to be borne in upon her that in him she had found the man who would help her to some trace of her father's murderer. For the girl had made up her mind that her father was murderously done to death. Lady Scardale knew Fidelia well, thought she knew her to her heart's core, but she knew nothing of all this. She was as much mistaken as Gerald Aspen. She did not know the new Fidelia, who had suddenly taken the place of the other Fidelia. She did not know the new soul that had sprung up in the girl's breast, the new passion, stronger than love or jealousy or ambition, the passion for revenge on the murderer of her father. And so Lady Scardale went on smiling to herself, as she saw with what gladness the eyes of Fidelia were turned to the coming of Rupert, and with what eager interest she listened to his words, and she said to herself that all that meant growing love, which to Lady Scardale's thinking was something far better than the terrible love at first sight, the fire of Peter straw, as she thought it, that blazes up in all its strength at once, and just as suddenly goes out, and leaves behind it nothing but a heap of ashes. Lady Scardale longed for the time when Fidelia would come to her, and take her into her confidence, and tell her all. Now it so happened that this very day, while Gerald was walking slowly to Lady Scardale's and trying to find some decent excuse for calling again so soon, Fidelia was having a momentous talk with Granton. Granton needed no excuse for going any day or every day to see his sister-in-law, and his sister-in-law gave him every opportunity of being alone with Fidelia. So this day Fidelia sprang upon him a long-meditated plot. She began asking him all about his travels and adventures, and at last she asked him if he had ever been to any of the diamond mines in South Africa. Taken off guard, and not knowing what was to come, he owned up to having been there. "'You know my extraordinary story,' she said, and you would be interested in it for Lady Scardale's sake. For your sake, Miss Locke. Thank you. Well, there are some things about it which I have not been able to understand. 
Everybody concerned in what happened out there seems to be dead, or lost. Mr. Aspen's father is dead, my father is dead, Captain Raven's brother is dead, the man who brought the whole horrible story to England was killed the first night he reached London, and one other man who was out there and knew all about it has disappeared. And he has disappeared off the face of the earth, nobody knows where he has gone to. Why did he go away in that strange and sudden way? Was it to escape from justice? Was it he who killed the man in St. James's Street? Some people said it was he. What do you think? She spoke fast and eagerly. Well, I was not there at the time, you know. He spoke hesitatingly. Yes, but you must have read all about it. Was it he who committed the murder? What do you think? Red Gundy murder poor Seth Chickering? My dear Miss Locke, the idea, forgive me for saying it, is too absurd. Red Gundy murder Seth Chickering? Why, they were the best of friends. Granton's feelings had thrown him a little off his guard, and he read the fact in Fidelia's surprised and flashing eyes. Oh, then you knew this man, this Red Gundy? Her eyes sparkled with the excitement of the question. Granton was staggered by her eagerness. He soon, however, pulled himself together. Yes, I did know Red Gundy. I have known such a lot of people in my time that one can't recollect them all or all about them, but I believe I did know Red Gundy. But you must have known him better than that. You must remember him. He is not a man to be forgotten in that light sort of way. Why? Did you know him? No, I never saw him, but I have longed to see him, and I have prayed Mr. Aspen to bring me to him, and he did not, or he would not, and now the man is gone nobody knows where, and I shall never perhaps have a chance of knowing him. No, Granton said gravely, you will never have a chance of knowing Rat Gundy. But why on earth did you want to know him? He was never much of a ladies' man, poor Red Gundy. As if I cared about a ladies' man, as if I could have endured a ladies' man. I wanted to see him, to know him, to make him my friend, and to get him into my confidence. I wanted to make him fall in love with me. Yes, I did, and I would have done it too. He wasn't much of a man for falling in love, and I don't believe any woman ever loved him, in that way, I mean. But why should you want to make him fall in love with you? You did not propose to marry him, did you? No, I proposed nothing but one thing. I may as well tell you, I always meant to tell you because I thought you might help me to find him, and I may as well tell you now. Why tell me at all? Why not? Because I can't help you, in that or in anything else. Nobody gets helped by me, man or a woman, to anything good. He was speaking in a low, deep tone. He knew something painful was coming, and he shrank from it. Ah, but this is not something good. It is something bad, something wicked. It is a purpose which a Christian woman ought not to have, but which I have in my heart and in my very blood. If Lady Scardale only knew how this thought possesses me, she would think me no longer the girl she cared for and was kind to. Listen, Mr. Granton, my purpose is revenge. Revenge! Revenge? He repeated the word mechanically after her. Revenge for what? He well knew for what while he asked the question. Oh, can't you guess? You must have heard the story. Revenge for my father's murder. Yes, I have heard the story. That is, I have heard the story of his death. But as I have heard the story told, he was not murdered. He was killed in fair fight. Fair fight! I don't believe it. I know he was murdered, and I want to find out who murdered him. 
That is why I wanted to know this man with the strange name and the strange story, this Rat Gundy. Did you suppose, Grant asked, bringing out the words with difficulty and not looking into the girl's excited face, but keeping his eyes on the ground, that it was Rat Gundy who caused your father's death? No, I didn't. At least I did not suppose anything about it. But I know, we all know, the papers told us all about it, that Red Gundy was out in this place where they found all the diamonds, and got all this odious fortune for some of us. Red Gundy was there. Red Gundy had left the place a long time. He came here from South America. Oh, then do you know something about him? He started. The girl appeared to have caught him again. Oh, well, it was all in the papers, you know. But I did know something about him at one time. Tell me all you know, everything, quick, please. Begin at the beginning and speak fast. You are so eager, he said, that you put me out. What do you want to know? I want to know anything and everything about Red Gundy, because I am certain he could tell me all about my father's death. Why did he never come here? Why would Mr. Aspen never bring him to see me, or help me to get to see him? It could only be because he knew something about my father's death, which they thought, Mr. Aspen and he, that it would be too painful for me to hear. Painful, as if it mattered about pain as if the one great pain to his daughter was not the fact of his being dead, dead, killed, murdered. Oh, well, go on, tell me all about this man. As I heard the story told by Red Gundy's own lips, Ah! her eyes gleamed. You did hear the story from him? I was present when he told the story more than once. He said your father was killed in a duel. The old tale, as if that would account for all the mystery that is made about it, as if that would explain my secret conviction. Can you help me to find this Red Gundy? No, Miss Locke, I can't do that. You will never see Red Gundy. Poor old Red Gundy is dead. Dead? Oh, no, that can't be. No one said that. The papers all said that he had gone back to South America. Miss Locke, take my word for it. Red Gundy will never be seen again by you or any other living creature. Red Gundy is dead and buried. He has taken his story, whatever it is, with him, and no voice can call him back. I can't understand this. I can't understand you. Is it a riddle? Are you playing with me? As if I would play with you about such a thing he exclaimed, in a tone of almost passionate protest. "'Oh, no, no, you would not. You would not. It was wrong of me to say such a thing. But I get wild over this, and there seems something mysterious about you, and your very voice does not sound as it did. Mr. Granton, for pity's sake, for heaven's sake, for my sake. That's what fetches me most of all.' he interjected. She hardly noticed his interruption. For my sake, tell me all you know about my father's death. As heaven shall judge me, Miss Locke, all I know is that your father was killed in a duel. That is the story I have always heard. I never heard any other. He was killed in a duel, and the man who killed him was as incapable of committing a murder as poor Red Gundy, or as I myself. The name of the man who killed him, was it not Red Gundy? Granton drew a deep breath and seemed to be stealing himself up for an effort. The name of the man who killed your father was not Red Gundy. Oh, then I am sorry if Red Gundy is dead, but I have no further interest in him. I know that is not all the story. 
It is not all the story. Ha! Did I not say so? It is not all the story. The man who was the real cause of your father's death was not the man whose pistol ball killed him, but the man who got up the quarrel and made these two men fight, got up the quarrel by lies and calumnies and devilish tricks of all kinds, and set these two gentlemen against one another, and boasted afterwards that it was he who had planned it and brought it about. Tell me that man's name. That man's name was Noah Bland, and he is dead. He was lynched for his crimes. He ought to have been lynched long before. He is the father of the Jaffet Bland, who is one of the heirs of this wretched, blood-stained money, who can't be found. He is sure to turn up, Granton said. If he is at all like his father, he will not leave his money long unclaimed. Some day, you may be sure, he will start up in the midst of us. Oh, hush, Fidelia suddenly whispered. Don't you see? Professor Bostock. Professor Bostock indeed had come into the hall and was standing quite near them. He had come in so quietly that neither of them had heard his steps. But he always moved quietly. He did not come into a place. He always appeared there. He was examining a foil with intent eyes. He threw himself into a fencing attitude and made a few passes, then stopped and turned towards Fidelia. "'I hope I am not interrupting you,' he said meekly, and sending a deferential glance at Fidelia. He looked uneasy and unwholesome. "'No,' she answered, rather angrily. "'The place is yours more than it is mine or Mr. Granton's.' "'Oh!' He made a gesture as of one who would say, if you put it in that cruel way. Fidelia took no notice. Anyhow, I must go, Granton said. He was only too well pleased to get a chance of escaping, even for a moment, from Fidelia's further questions. Goodbye, she said, and held out her hand. Come again soon. She gave him an appealing look, which he tried to avoid, but which Bostock saw and fancied he understood. Rupert murmured some sort of promise and hurried away. "'You are angry with me for coming in,' Bostock said. "'Angry? Nonsense! Why should I be angry?' Two are company and three are none. "'Mr. Bostock!' You seem to me to be in rather a bad temper today, and I think your words are a little rude. I did not mean to be rude to you. It does not matter, Fidelia said, and was turning away from him. Don't go yet, Miss Locke, he said softly. I have something to say to you. She turned back and looked at him in surprise. I could not help hearing something that was said between you and that man as I came in. Oh! She was going to speak, but he raised his hand deprecatingly and went on. I did not want to listen or to hear, but I could not help it. If you did hear anything of our talk, she said contemptuously, you must know that we spoke on a subject of the most painful interest to me, and I am not likely to want to renew the talk. With me, I suppose, he asked meekly. With everyone, with anyone. I should not think of speaking to you about it, but that you seemed so anxious to hear something about what happened out in those diamond fields. She could not choose but listen when any word was spoken on that subject. Yes, she said quickly, almost sharply. What do you know about all that? More than you might imagine, Miss Locke. At least I could get to know a good deal. Mr. Granton does not seem to be able to help you very much about it. Mr. Aspin won't help you. "'Oh, then you heard all that. 
You must have been listening for a good long time. There was an increasing tone of contempt in her voice. Pardon me, I only heard the last few words you were saying, but you will excuse me if I observe that you spoke in a very loud and eager tone. Well, never mind, go on, she said. Only that, if neither of these gentlemen will serve you, I thought perhaps you might give me a chance. He turned his eyes on her. They were absolutely expressionless as ever. Fidelia looked into the eyes and noted how they were discharged of all expression. An uncomfortable and creepy conviction seemed to come over her that the eyes were kept under restraint and that they could, if they would, blaze out with all manner of emotion. She had for some time felt a little uneasy about her fencing master. He occasionally paid her elaborate and formal compliments, to which the most sensitive woman could not openly object, but which made her feel as if she would sometimes rather dispense with the fencing lessons. But she was a girl of a good, brave, healthy sort of mind, and she never imagined that every man was likely to fall in love with her. So she repented a little of her sharpness and corrected her sentence. If you really know or could get to know anything of what happened out there, Mr. Bostock, she said, you could not do me a greater favor than to tell me something. Only, it is a terrible subject for me, and I do not want to have one moment's idle talk about it. I did talk about it to Mr. Granton, as you seem to have heard, because he had been out there, and I thought he might tell me something, if he knew. I talked to Mr. Aspen about it, as you appear to have heard also, because he is mysteriously mixed up with me in the whole horrible story, and he has lost a father, as I have. But I hardly ever speak of it to Lady Scardale, whom I dearly love, because I know she could not help me. I do not understand how you can know anything about it. You have not been in South Africa. No, I have not been to South Africa or the diamond mines, but I know something about them, and it is easy to get to South Africa nowadays, and if you will let me go I shall find out everything you want to know. If I let you go, Mr. Bostock, I don't understand you. How can I either let you go or keep you back? "'Can't you understand me, really and truly?' he asked. "'Have you no idea?' "'Not the very slightest.' "'Do you really mean that? Come, you are not like other women. You are not a mere trifler, a coquette.' Fidelia's brow darkened. "'I hope I am not a trifler or a coquette, but I don't know what that has got to do with it or what we are talking about.' And I don't quite see why we should be wasting our time talking about anything. I think I must go, Mr. Bostock. She was turning away from him. Don't go just yet, he pleaded. He had the foil still in his hand, and he made a sudden gesture with it, as if he were interposing it as a barrier between her and the outer world. I must tell you something. We have wandered from our subject, she said anxiously, but not afraid. I have not wandered from mine, he answered. It is one of the two subjects I have in my brain and in my heart. Miss Locke, do you know why I consent to spend my life drudging in this hateful school and giving lessons in fencing to silly and stupid and awkward girls? Fidelia was inclined for the moment to be a little amused. "'Am I one of the silly and stupid and awkward girls?' she asked, not without a tone of malice in her voice. "'You! Oh, well, I need not answer that question. Do you know why I give up my life to this place?' She was almost inclined to reply that she assumed it was because Lady Scardale paid him a very good salary for his very good fencing lessons, but his face looked too serious for such a reply. 
so she only said in a tone of conciliation, "'I presume, Mr. Bostock, you take an interest in your craft, which you can practice so well.' "'It isn't that,' he said abruptly. "'Do you think I was made to live the life of a teacher in a girl's school?' Fidelia, in truth, could not answer the question. She had never given it any thought. She had accepted it as one of the natural condition of things that a clever fencing-master could be found for a college like that of Lady Scardale, no matter whether the fencing-master had to teach girls or boys. She had never noticed anything much in Mr. Bostock except his remarkable skill in fence and his quiet, suppressed, methodical ways. Therefore she felt herself embarrassed when suddenly confronted with a question never presented to her before, and which seemed to start a kind of mystery to explain what seemed a very commonplace business, not calling for any explanation. But she could also see that Mr. Bostock was entirely in earnest in putting his question. "'Mr. Bostock,' she answered, very gravely and respectfully, "'I suppose many people or most people have to lead lives which they do not find altogether suited to their feelings and their tastes. This may, of course, be your lot, as it is the lot of others.' "'Do you mean to tell me,' he said, with the same expressionless face, but with deep emotion in his tones, that you have no idea why I pass my life in this place? Unless for the ordinary and obvious reasons, no idea, none whatever. I have not thought about it. It was no affair of yours, he broke in sharply. If you wish to put it so, yes. It was no affair of mine, Mr. Bostock, I should rather put it that I had no right to form any conjectures as to your motives. It was an affair of yours, he said, with deep, repressed passion in his voice, and you have a right to form a conjecture. I stay here because you are here. I came here because you are here. Stop, Mr. Bostock, pray stop, do stop. I am not likely to stop now, having gone so far. I must go on. I love you. Fidelia began to think she had to deal with a madman. Something of this thought seemed to publish itself in her face, for he quickly said, You think I am mad, perhaps? Well, I dare say I am. Every man is mad in a sense who falls desperately in love with a woman, and if so, I am mad, for I am desperately in love with you. But I am sane enough in other ways, and I mean to carry my point in this. I am going to be rich, I ever so rich, and I shall have power, and I am not a man to let anything stand in my way, and Fidelia Locke, I love you. Come, can you love me? Don't think of me as the poor drudge of a girl's school. That isn't my vocation any more than my name is Bostock. Our lives are bound up together, and our destinies in a way you little dream of. Come, can you love me? He flung away his foil, which went clattering to the floor, folded his arms, and stood quietly before her, waiting for an answer. If only anybody would come, a student, a servant, anyone. Fidelia glanced uneasily around the great room, but there was no one. Oh, if Lady Scardale would come, she did not know what to say or how to act, but she had a great conviction that the moment was one for keeping cool and avoiding the tragic. Mr. Bostock, she said at last, you must not be surprised if I refuse to take all things quite seriously. It is very serious for me, he said grimly. It will be very serious for you as well, and for others, too. Then Fidelia lost her temper. You are threatening me, Mr. Bostock, she said. 
and i can only tell you that i am not the least in the world frightened by your threats no i am glad you have threatened me because it gives me the right to say that i have nothing to do with you and that i defy you you shall not defy me long he growled you do not know who i am and what i can do i do not know and i do not care let us have an end of this mr bostock we must continue to meet for i cannot have lady scardale disturbed by reports of such stuff let us meet as mere fellow-workers in this college until perhaps some future day we may be able to meet again as friends she endeavoured to put some softening tone of kindliness of a hope for reconciliation into her closing words never he replied we can never be friends i would rather be hated by you than looked on merely as a milk-and-water friend i am a man who has no friends and does not want any i have enemies and i make them and i get rid of them when i can i have had to make my own way in the world and i have made it and i will make it and i let nothing stand in my way and i shall conquer you too in the end this is all too melodramatic for me fidelia said and i have no taste for melodrama have you no feeling for a man who loves you i don't believe there is any love in that and if there is i hate such love and i despise it do you think a girl is to be frightened and and bullied into falling in love with the first man who gets it into his head that he is falling in love with her come mr bostock drop all this nonsense and let us get into the commonplace again will you not allow me to assist you in finding out all about your father oh hush she exclaimed do not let us bring his name into this odious talk will you not let me help you i can help you as nobody else can will you not take my help in this not in this or in anything else until we return to the old conditions of the commonplace oh thank heaven these last words were uttered in an undertone and with a deep-drawn breath of relief for one of the attendant women was coming towards her with a salver and a cart on it that would have been a strange visitor indeed who was not welcome to fidelia just then a flush came into her face as she took the card it bore the name of gerald aspen show mr aspen in she said with an air of hardly concealed delight and triumph you will not tell bostock hastily began i never tell tales out of school was fidelia's almost contemptuous reply you will keep to yourself what i have told you keep it to yourself for the future she said and you may feel sure that i will keep it to myself at that moment gerald aspen entered the room bostock saluted him grimly and then vanished gerald had not eyes for him he had only eyes for fidelia and for the look of unmistakable joy that came into her face the pain and strain of her talk with bostock had been too much for her and the sudden relief caused by gerald's coming had swelled her emotion to overflow a man should have been dull indeed who mistook the welcoming look in her eyes i am so glad you have come she said and in her impulsive way she stretched out both her hands to him ignorant gerald why had he never known that if she was constrained with him and perfectly easy familiar and friendly with rupert granton it was because she had no feeling which could make her embarrassed in her relations with rupert granton and she had much feeling to embarrass her in her relations with him how could she be perfectly open and frank and unembarrassed with him how was she to know the true nature of his feelings towards her 
She might be allowing herself to go too far. She might have been showing her hand. She might have been, to put it in better words, showing her love. She might have been making overtures such as no true girl would make until she is well assured in her own mind and heart that these overtures are to be becomingly returned. Gerald, though a society journalist, was a somewhat shy and modest young man in the presence of women, and this one particular woman had an influence over him that sometimes made him tremble and blush in her presence. "'Has anything happened?' he asked. "'Have you been alarmed by anything?' "'No, I have been talking to Mr. Bostock, and he is a strange man, but it is nothing.' "'Will you come and walk in the grounds?' he asked timidly. End of chapter 16「Seventeen in Ranelagh Gardens No, not in the grounds, Fidelia said hurriedly, but somewhere else if you like. I don't want to walk in the grounds just now. I don't know why. "'Something has happened to disturb you?' Uh, "'No, no, please don't ask me any questions.' She became embarrassed and impulsive. Embarrassment always leads to impulsiveness. In her anxiety to avoid any cross-examination about Bostock, concerning whom she was much more alarmed than she would have cared to admit, even to herself, and of all men in the world she would least have wished to bring Gerald into this affair. So, to save herself from having to be truthful, she had to put on a false air of coquetry. "'If you really don't want to walk out with me,' she said, "'of course I don't mean to press you.' "'If I don't want to walk out with you.' "'Yes, very well, you need not protest. "'Then if you do want to walk out with me, "'I don't see why we might not walk in Ranelagh Gardens. "'Have you ever walked in Ranelagh Gardens?' "'Gerald did not know what he answered. "'At the moment he did not remember "'whether he had ever walked in Ranelagh Gardens or not.' What did he care? He knew he was going to walk with Fidelia Locke there now, and that was enough for him. It was a summer evening, an hour before sunset, and he was to dine out that evening. He would probably be a little late for his dinner party, but that did not much concern him. He felt all aflame. He was sure that a crisis was coming. The walk in Ranelagh Gardens he felt must decide his fate. If he was mistaken, if Fidelia was only animated by some excitement which had nothing to do with him, then the sooner he knew it, the better. Never could he have again so good a chance as now. Ah, surely, surely he could not have misinterpreted the welcoming glance in her eyes when he came into the hall and found her with Bostock. If that gleam of light did not mean love, ah, then he had read poems and dreamt dreams to no purpose, and all in vain. "'My fate cries out,' he said to himself, in the words of Hamlet. All this he thought of while Fidelia was putting on her hat to go with him to Ranelagh Gardens. A moment or two later, they had to travel but a little distance, they were walking in the gardens that bear the famous name of Ranelagh. Neither knew nor cared about the traditions of the place. Fidelia probably did not even know what had been its traditions. Gerald was not then in a mind to concern himself about them. All the bows and bells, 
all the bucks and dandies and dandizettes who had once enlivened the gardens with their more or less vapid laughter might never have lived so far as these young lovers were concerned for gerald all the storied memories of all the ages were summed up in the one thought that he was with fidelia locke in a lonely garden of chelsea and that he had made up his mind to tell her there and then that he loved her out of that garden she should not go until he had told her his love come what would he must tell her that not another day must pass when she went to rest that night she must bear with her to the pillow the knowledge that he loved her would it surprise her would it shock her would she have to tell him that she could not give back his love that she would always regard him as a brother and all that sad crushing commonplace of excuse as if a man who wanted to be a lover ever cared about being considered a brother that very thought was passing through gerald's mind at the moment the very same thought that bostock had lately put into words i would rather she told me that she hated me he said to himself than that she regarded me as a brother but was it possible she could hate him she had been always sweetly frank and friendly to him no she did not hate him that was certain it was clear that she liked his companionship but a woman may like and even dearly like a man's companionship without being in the least degree in love with him or having the faintest inclination to marry him and this gerald thoroughly understood he was even inclined to draw evil augury from her present liking for his companionship if she were in love with him she would seem less at her ease in his society than she did that day she would not have asked him to walk out with her she would not have said so outspokenly that she was glad when he came thus he thought tormenting himself and contradicting himself after the true lover's immemorial way but it must all be settled then and there before they passed forth of that gateway again he did not come to it quickly however he and she talked slowly and in low tones about all manner of things which little concerned them or anybody else the sun was about to sink and gerald knew that fidelia would have soon to go home would he fail of his purpose after all no he determined that if he reached that period of their walk when he had only time left to say fidelia i love you will you be my wife he would say it and get her answer he could not face a new day with the doubt and the uncertainty and the suspense see she said the sun is going down and everybody is gone the everybodies were very few to begin with he answered somewhat vapidly and their disappearance does not make much difference but we ought to be going too why ought we well i don't know but i suppose they will soon want to close the gates and we can't exactly allow ourselves to be locked in oh they will be sure to come and tell us and why should we not allow ourselves to be locked in and spend the night wandering in this garden i should like it of all things ridiculous she said with a light flush on her face we should catch fearful colds and what would lady scardale say she would think i was very happy gerald said defiantly fidelia looked at him wonderingly and her heart began to beat more quickly 
Come, she said decisively, we must go. Wait a little. I... I have something to say to you, Fidelia. He had never called her by her name before. She panted, and her eyes grew dim. She knew what was coming now. Is it not strange, he said impetuously, determined to get to the end of it. Is it not strange, Fidelia, how you and I have been thrown together, how a sort of mysterious common destiny has twined itself around us both, and brought us both at the same time, calamity and fortune? Is it not a wonderful thing? It is indeed, she said slowly, a strange story. Fancy, he said, six months ago I was a poor young journalist, and I had never heard of the diamond mines, and I had never heard of you. And I had never heard of the diamond mine, and I had never heard of you, and I believed my father was living, and that I should see him again. Now I know that he is dead. Yes, Gerald interposed hastily, and I then thought my father was living too, and I know now that he is dead. He hastened over all this, for he could not pretend that their sorrow was equal. He could not persuade himself that he grieved for his father as she grieved for hers. Gerald was almost jealous of her grief for the loss of her father, almost resented it. I didn't mean that, he added. I was thinking of how you and I have been brought together, and of the stupid life I was leading before I knew you, and how strangely we have been brought together and linked together in this story, which no one would think of believing if it was made into a romance. Doesn't it all mean something, Fidelia? She opened her eyes with a sort of start. You make me start, she said, when you call me by my name. Then she wished she had not said anything about it. Are you angry? he asked. Would you rather I did not call you by your name? It does not matter, but I am not used to it, and it made me start. You never called me Fidelia before. One must begin some time. Must one? Why? Oh, you know why, he exclaimed. You must know quite well, because I love you, Fidelia, because I am in love with you, and because I want you to be my wife. There was a moment's pause, and Gerald waited in an agony of silence. Yet even then, he was glad he had spoken. It was done, it was out. It was a relief. Call me Fidelia, she said. Always. Oh, you darling, he exclaimed, and he put his arm around her waist and drew her to him and kissed her. There was no looker on save alone the kindly sun, and even he was about to withdraw below the horizon and allow this young lover unseen to kiss his true love once again. Fidelia, he exclaimed, Fidelia always, but not Fidelia Locke. Not always, she said, with a smile struggling against tears. Soon it may be Fidelia, a long pause, Fidelia Aspen. Then they passed out of the garden and then walked home together. Ah, bear in mind that garden was enchanted. So Edgar Poe bids us to remember of the garden where his lover first saw and last saw his mystic, unforgotten Helen. That Ranelagh garden will always be enchanted for Gerald and for Fidelia. 
no spot on earth will ever for either of them have the magic sweetness the delight the perfume of that lonely nook in chelsea where gerald found courage to put his love into words you do care about me he asked as they were passing out of the gates oh yes if i didn't do you think i should not have let you know yes yes of course he answered awkwardly i hardly knew what i was saying i am so happy fidelia and i too she said frankly and simply i suppose you knew that i was in love with you he asked looking closely at her for the first time since his declaration oh yes was her straightforward answer and then her eyelids went down and a deeper colour came into her cheek. "'How long have you known it?' "'I can't tell, ever so long.' "'And tell me, how long have you cared for me?' "'I don't know. I suppose ever since you began to care for me.' "'How strange,' he said musingly. We have no one to consult about all this. We have no kith or kin, you and I. We are absolutely free to do as we please with our own lives. No, she said solemnly, looking up at him. I have my father. Fidelia, your father? Yes, I must find out about him and his death before I can marry you, Gerald. A pang of disappointment and a thrill of delight went through him. He was disappointed to hear that anything depended on the quest into her father's fate. He was delighted to hear her for the first time call him Gerald. Fidelia, he remonstrated very tenderly, you have promised me, you have as good as given me your word. Oh, yes, Gerald. I will be your wife, if you wish it, for I love you, but we must first find out how my father was killed. Suppose we cannot find out. But we can. You will help me. If we married first, I might get to be too happy. I might become entirely wrapped up in my love for you and in my selfish happiness and I might forget what I owe to my dear lost father. You will help me to find out. You will be all the more eager to help me because of my resolve. Are you really determined on this, Fidelia? Quite determined, Gerald, and if I were not I should expect you and ask of you to keep me up to my resolve. I don't believe you really love me at all, he said passionately. For the moment his disappointment was profound. I love you, she protested, with all my soul and with all my strength. I have never felt one touch of love before. But I must keep to this resolve, Gerald, and you must help to keep me to it. She looked with utter confidence into his eyes. Gerald's heart was torn with distracting emotions. She loved him, loved him, loved no one else. That was the first thought. All his alarms about Rupert Grant had been utterly without foundation. That ought to be enough to fill his soul with happiness. But then came the bitter thought, she will not marry me, for that was what it came to. She would not marry until she had found out all about her father's death, and he, Gerald, must help her to find it out. And he, Gerald, already knew all about it that was to be known, and he could not tell her. He could not in conscience and in honour betray the secret of Rupert Granton. No, he could not do that even to have Fidelia look for his wife. 
He could not ask Granton to save him by revealing the whole story. He could not ask Granton to make himself odious to Fidelia and an object of repugnance to Lady Scardale by avowing that he had killed Fidelia's father. Granton had generously trusted him, and he could not betray the confidence. Would Fidelia cling to her purpose? Alas, he feared that she would. He had seen that purpose growing up in her, and he did not believe it would wither. It was founded on an entirely wrong impression, on the conviction that her father had been foully murdered. If that conviction could be removed, the purpose would go with it. But how could it be removed? Only one man living could put the story in its true light to Fidelia, and that man was Rupert Granton, and he could only do that by proclaiming that his was the hand which had done her father to death. Again, Gerald felt as if it would be playing false with the girl's feelings if he were to profess or pretend that he was assisting her in finding out all about her father's death. This would be to enact a dismal farce and to make the girl he loved an unconscious performer in it. Look what way he would, the prospect seemed one only of disappointment, of distress, and even of despair. There was a moment's pause. The lovers were pacing alone one of the deserted streets of the Chelsea region. They had it all to themselves. Nothing could well be more lonely. The storied lovers who were cast ashore on the hitherto uninhabited island of Madeira could hardly have felt themselves more apart from the rush of human life than this pair lingering in a street on the edge of the Thames, and within an eighteen-penny cap fare of the Houses of Parliament and the Charing Cross station. Then Gerald spoke in a timid, embarrassed sort of way. Elderly readers will understand it perhaps even better than the younger, to whom the sensation, if they have had it, is still too near to be quite crystallized into permanent form. Gerald felt all that exquisite, that delightful shyness, which comes to a young man when, for the first time in his life, a sweet girl imposes on him the responsibilities of her destiny. It is a rare moment, after life has perhaps nothing quite equal to it. Couldn't I help you better as, as your husband, Fidelia? He stammered out in an awkward sort of way. No, she said fervently. No, Gerald, I feel as if I had no right to any happiness, and as if the man I loved had no right to any happiness, and you are the man I love, Gerald. Until I had tried to do my duty to my dear father, my murdered father, I feel like one of the girls in the Greek poems, don't you know, that have been translated for us at the college, the girls who had to fulfil some solemn task for a father or a brother or a sister, and who had to do that before they could pretend to try to be happy. You will indulge me in this, you will help me in this, you will, oh, you will, my dear. There was passion in her voice, the glory of the sinking sun was on her face. They were now near to the gate of the culture college. Gerald would have longed to kiss her, but he could not attempt it then and there. "'I love you, I adore you,' was all he said. "'Good night.' "'Good night, Gerald.' So they parted for the evening, and went their ways with somewhat different emotions. Gerald was indeed happy to know that Fidelia loved him, 
to be relieved from all torturing doubts on that great hope of his life. But with the exacting, unsatisfied impatience of the man, he was troubled because of the condition imposed by Fidelia on their love, and the difficulty of his fulfilling it. He might have known that, since the girl loved him, she would find a way somehow to make it easy for him to come to his heart's desire. The reasonable part of his trouble was that he could not be quite frank with her, for complete frankness would have meant the betrayal of the secret of another. Fidelia, for her part, was wrapped in a measureless content. She had loved him from the first, now she knew that he loved her. She assumed, she took it for granted, that he would devote himself to her purpose as regarded her father's death, and would make it a purpose of his own. She had all the sweet unreasonableness, and the unquestioning, instinctive trust of a woman in her lover, the feeling that, whatever I want him to do, that he will wish to do. She also had a curious feminine sense of newly found protection, the exquisite delight of resting on a strength stronger than her own. Gerald will make everything easy for me, such was her feeling. The very talk with Bostock that day brought her with its memory a new sense of protection. There was a vague alarm lingering in her because of Bostock's declarations to her, the utterly unexpected avowal of his love, his threats, his agitating announcement that he was not really the man he professed to be, and did not own the name he professed to bear. She felt guarded against all that danger now, if danger there should be, for Gerald would take care of her. Yet she could not tell that story to Gerald, just yet. She, too, had to keep her secret. So they parted, this true pair of lovers, each having something on the mind which as yet the other must not be allowed to know. But of the two, Fidelia was the more happy, although she did not for that night tell the story of her happiness to Lady Scardale. She felt timid and shy about the confession of her love. End of chapter 17、chapter、eighteen of Red Diamonds by Justin McCarthy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter eighteen The Affair on the Embankment Ever since the bungle and blunder at the fencing scene, Mr. Bostock had been prodigal in his civilities to Gerald Aspen. The fencing master seemed as if he could not do enough to efface from Gerald's mind the memory of that unhappy accident. Gerald, in his genial way, would have cared nothing at all about it. His absolutely unsuspicious nature would not have allowed or encouraged a sinister thought to enter it. He was greatly touched by the extreme and unnecessary amount of penitence that Bostock showed. As if he could have helped it, poor fellow, Gerald said to himself more than once. To him it was simply like the case of some accident at a shooting party, where the gun of a friend by mishap gives you a hurt, and you feel at once that the injured man suffers far less than the innocent injurer. The doubts and surmises of Rupert Granton were wholly thrown away on Gerald Aspen. Gerald began to take a liking to the professor of fencing, because the professor had inadvertently wounded him, and was so very sorry for it. So Gerald invited him to dine at the Voyagers' Club, and the professor came and was introduced to Captain Jackdaw, 
in whom he took an immense interest as a partner in the great diamond mine scheme of which so much had been heard then captain jackdaw in his genial off-hand sort of way invited gerald and bostock to dine with him at the voyagers club another night and they went and they dined and had some pleasant talk it's very funny you know said captain raven on this second occasion our going to be rich in this sort of way but i say i wish aspen don't you they could make us rich i mean could give us our money as i suppose it is ours all at once it's a beastly nuisance holding on until the first of january next suppose a fellow goes and dies in the meantime then what good has he out of it i want to know unless the comfort of leaving it to his widow the serious professor solemnly remarked but i haven't any wife raven observed and consequently i can't have any widow that seems good sense eh mr bostock i haven't any wife either gerald said mr bostock became silent at once naturally the whole subject did not intimately concern him why should it here were two young men one of them a tremendous swell the other a young favourite of fortune both of them to be rich men on the first of coming january and what had he bostock a poor fencing-master at the college of culture to do with their concerns so he remained silent and the conversation changed possibly he may have noted the fact that neither of them seemed to have thought of making any provision for a transfer of their property if such transfer were practicable in the event of either's sudden death but after all why should he notice a fact like that and wherein could it concern him the dinner was early and raven had to go off somewhere else gerald wished to leave a message for lady scardale no doubt at the college of culture bostock lived not very far from the college on the battersea side in the shadow of the church where bolingbroke lies buried so gerald proposed that they should have a hansom together to the college of culture which they had and gerald paid the fare then gerald left his message for lady scardale no doubt and the young men started to walk away together it was a lovely starlit night and the moon was shining on the river and making the thames with the low-lying surrey shore and the small trees on the surrey shore look curiously like the stream of the nile gerald felt all the influence of the night bostock had lately been very silent come gerald said bostock i'll see you on your way as far as the other side of the bridge so they crossed the bridge together and then they recrossed it taken no doubt by the beauty of the night and perhaps taken too by the thought that each had something in his mind which was likely to be in the mind of the other when they came again to the middlesex side mr bostock abruptly turned the talk into quite a new direction they had been talking commonplaces and the fine weather gerald had been seeing fidelia in the light of every star and the moonlit ripple of every wave you have all the luck mr aspen the professor of fencing said despondently have i gerald asked and then he answered himself cheerily well i certainly have had a marvellous amount of luck lately professor bostock i am to be a rich man at the beginning of the year but up to this time i have had to make a pretty hard fight for it i may as well say 
Ah, but it isn't that only, Bostock slowly said. Not that only? That is a good deal, is it not, for a man only starting in life? It's a good deal, but it is not all, or nearly all. You have won more than money. You have won love. Gerald started. What do you mean? Why do you talk of that? Because I have been in love myself, because I have a heart to feel and eyes to see, and I know how you are favoured by destiny and by her. Do not be angry, and do not think me wanting in delicacy, Mr. Aspen. We have been rowing in the same boat for a long time, although I must own, as the old jest has it, not with the same skulls, not with the same gifts and graces and good fortune, certainly. I say, Bostock, Gerald interposed, with abrupt and boyish good humour. You haven't been keeping out the fog at all, have you? Keeping out the fog? What fog? I don't quite follow you, Mr. Aspen. There isn't any fog, it is all bright full moon. See? I am not clever at all, except at fencing. Intellectually, you know, I am very dull. What do you mean by keeping out the fog? Well, to tell you the honest truth, I thought you might have been drinking a little too much at the voyages, perhaps. Drinking? Oh, no, Mr. Aspen, I drink very little. I haven't the means to afford much drinking, and what, he added, with a sickly smile, would become of the wrist and the nerves of a professor of fencing who drank? You are right there. Aspen said, and I ask your pardon, for I well know how you can fence. But I thought you were talking a little wildly all the same, and about things that did not quite concern you. Yes, but they do concern me, Bostock said gravely. At least in a sense they do. I don't suppose things would ever have been different with me anyhow, if you had never come on the scene. She would never have cared for me, I suppose, and of all men I have ever seen, I would rather you won her, since it is sure as fate that I could never have a chance. In the name of heaven, Mr. Bostock, Aspen said, stopping suddenly and facing his extraordinary companion, what are you talking about, and why do you talk to me at all? You know well enough what I am talking to you about, and why I am talking to you is because I do not wish you to think too badly of me, or to think I hate you because you have succeeded where I have utterly failed, and where I never had from the beginning the remotest chance of success. I am talking of Miss Fidelia Locke. I'd rather we didn't talk of Miss Locke, Mr. Bostock, if you please. I don't see what you have to do with her. Nothing, Bostock said, shrugging his shoulders and turning out his hands in meekest deprecation. You are right. I have nothing to do with her. But I use the right of every man that lives, and I love a woman when she seems to me to be worth a man's love. So I have loved Miss Fidelia Locke ever so long. Am I a criminal for that? Can I help it? I have been seeing her, talking with her, fencing with her, every day. Am I to be blamed because I have a man's feelings and she is a glorious girl? Not blamed by me, certainly, Gerald said gently. This was all new and startling to him. He had never known anything about it, never thought of it before. The professor of fencing seemed to him to stand on much the same level as the hairdresser, who came to look after the tresses of the young women at the culture college. But there was an unmistakable note of sincerity, he thought, in the words of the poor professor, 
and Gerald, out of the lordliness of his own success and his own certainty, felt a generous sympathy for the man who had never even ventured to put his fate to the test. "'I am glad to hear you say so,' Bostock replied meekly. "'I should like to keep your good opinion. I should like you to know how thoroughly I understand that I never had a chance from the very first, never could have had, and that I am only too glad she has given her love to you, and not to that man Granton. "'Well, well, I think we had better not talk about these things.' I don't know whether Grant never had any thoughts that way. At all events, that is no affair of yours or mine. If you are at all a sufferer, Mr. Bostock, believe me, I am sorry for it, and I think all the better of you for it, and for the manly, courageous way in which you have spoken about it. But I am sure we ought not ever to speak of it any more. No, no, certainly not. Bostock said eagerly. My mind is quite relieved. I have said all I had to say. I wanted you to know that I understood how things had gone, and that I had no enmity, and that I bore no malice, and that I knew well you had not come between me and anything that could have been mine, because I know it never could have been mine. There, Mr. Aspen, that's all about it, and I congratulate you on your expected property, and your other and better good fortune as well. And now I drop the subject and become the stolid self-contained professor of fencing again. Oh, just one word. Did she ever tell you anything of this? She? Miss Locke, of course. She? Why, man, how should she know? Ah, to be sure, Bostock said meditatively, how should she know it? To be sure, how should she know it? There was something in the tone of Bostock's voice now that grated on Aspen's nerves. I don't suppose you ever tried to tell her anything? I thought perhaps she might have guessed, Bostock said humbly, Women are so quick and clever at guessing that sort of thing, and I thought perhaps she might have told you. Girls are fond of telling the men they love about the men who loved them. Something in all this irritated Aspen beyond endurance, although he believed it to be only Bostock's awkward way of expressing his meaning. Still, he could not bear to hear the name of Fidelia mixed up in any such talk. "'To cut all this short, Bostock,' he said, "'I don't believe that Miss Locke ever mentioned your name to me.' Was this what Bostock wanted to get at? Was it to this he had led up? Did he want to feel assured that his one effort at love-making had not come to the knowledge of Aspen, so as to make Aspen dislike and distrust him, and stand on his guard against him? Perhaps so. At any rate, he changed the conversation quickly. "'I wonder,' he said, "'what has become of the man at Gundy?' "'Ah, I wonder,' was the only reply of Aspen." Strange that he should have disappeared so soon, when the money has not yet been shared. Well, I dare say he will turn up at the right time and claim his share. You see, he was always a wanderer and a globetrotter, and then he is not the only one who is missing at the moment. Where, I wonder, is the young man, Jeffet Bland? Ah, uh, I wonder was the echoing remark of the professor of fencing. "'Don't you suppose he'll turn up at the right time?' Gerald asked contemptuously. "'If he is at all like his father's son, he'll not lose the chance of the money, you may be sure.' "'Did you know his father?' Bostock grimly asked. 
"'No, I never knew his father, but I have heard all about him from Seth Chickering and—' "'And from Gundy?' "'And from Gundy, yes.' "'These men have been his enemies.' "'Anyhow, it does not concern you or me,' Gerald said abruptly, being a little weary of the talk. "'You haven't any suspicions of Rat Gundy?' "'Suspicions? About what?' "'That murder of Seth Chickering.' "'Stuff and nonsense! Why should I have suspicions of him?' "'Well, people had, you know. He was found on the spot.' "'Yes, he gave the alarm. He tried to stop the man who was running away. Why, confound it all, Bostock!' Aspen said, with a rush of recollection coming back upon him. "'You yourself swore that you saw the very man whom he described on that very same night.' "'So I did, and I saw him. But he may have been sent there. He may have been sent on and paid to do the trick, and another man may have planted him in the way to do it. Do you know that I fancied I saw that very same face close to us, to you and me, this very night?' "'Close to us? My dear Mr. Bostock, you are dreaming. Close to us, when and where?' Just after we came out from the college, in the dark street, I saw a face flash past me, just like this. I do not easily forget faces. Do you know where we passed the little sugar factory, sweetmeat factory, whatever it is? There was a crowd coming out of working lads and working girls. Yes, yes, I saw. Well, among that crowd I seemed to see that face. Absurd, Gerald said, some mere chance likeness. Anyhow, I don't suppose he particularly wants to murder you or me, and I suppose, even if he had any such design, we could hold our own, so long as he did not attack us from behind. We are pretty good at defending ourselves, you and I. Yes, Bostock answered lugubriously. But such a man generally does attack one from behind. But what on earth could be his motive for attacking you or me? No motive for attacking me, certainly. But suppose he were to get rid of you? Well, what good would that do him? There would be one more gone. One more? One more out of the claimants to the inheritance, one more besides Seth Chickering. When the stakes come to be divided in January, there would be so much the more to get. For the assassin, for our mysterious friend with the shook head and the red beard. Oh, no, for the man who set him on, for Rat Gundy, perhaps, who knows? Gerald burst into a peal of laughter. "'Mr. Bostock, you ought to have belonged to my profession. You ought to have been a journalist. Or better still, you ought to have been a sensation novelist. Well, I must go home. Good night, and don't think any more about all this imaginary danger.' "'It is danger for you, not for me.' "'I know, and it's very kind of you.' But there's no danger for nobody, and so good night. I wish you would let me go with you, said Bostock in a curious pleading tone of voice. Why on earth should you go with me? Because it is late and dark, and I am haunted by the face of that man, and he would never think of attacking two people, and I am tremendously strong in the arm. My good fellow, this is too ridiculous, but I am much obliged to you all the same, Bostock. He hastily corrected the tone of his voice, for he was really touched by Bostock's kind, albeit somewhat absurd anxiety on his account. And I know you are a good fellow, and I wish you good luck in everything, old man, except the one thing about which I can't afford to wish good luck to anyone but myself. 
He spoke sympathetically and kindly, for he began to think that in his heart he had been doing wrong to Bostock. But he would not hear of Bostock's accompanying him any farther, and so on the Chelsea side of the bridge they bade each other good night and parted. Gerald lit a cigar and sauntered slowly along the Thames embankment. He was not thinking much of what Bostock had been telling him. He was a little amused at Bostock's theory about Ratigundi. Knowing who Ratigundi was, he could well afford to be amused at that. The theory of a mysterious red-bearded assassin going about killing people systematically to carry out a tontine principle in the distribution of a great fortune seemed to him much too ridiculous even for the sensation novel. This night, as he walked home, his thoughts, to say the truth, ran mostly on his happy love-making and on Fidelia Locke. It is marvellous how to a young man the whole universe can become absorbed into the being of his sweetheart, until nothing else seems worthy of a moment's concern. Gerald passed little groups of people, young men and young women, walking three abreast, four abreast, six abreast, in loose marching order, or sometimes with ranks very much closed up, and with loving arms around freely consenting waists. Many wayfarers trod behind him, and soon passed him, or turned off in some other direction. He took no account of them. Presently the embankment grew more and more lonely. At one moment it was curiously borne in upon him that he had the walk almost all to himself. He could only hear one footfall behind him. But as he passed one of the benches, it seemed to him as if he saw a man lying upon it, nothing out of the common surely in all weather winter and summer there are figures seen resting all night through on the benches of the thames embankment a sad study for statementship that whenever statementship can find spare time to look after it that all night long in summer and in winter there are men and women who make a bench on the thames embankment their bedchamber of one thing we may be sure they would not sleep there in the fogs of winter or the blustering winds of spring or the chill nights of late autumn if they could possibly find a more warm and comfortable place to rest the fact, perhaps, that statementship will have to take very carefully into account some day. A vague thought of this kind was passing through Gerald's brain as he saw, or thought he saw, the outcast on the bench. But another thought was mingled up with it, for he fancied that as the face of the sleeper was lighted by the moon, he could see that it had shook a red hair and a red beard. Then he smiled to himself at his own folly, and he stopped to light another cigar. The moment his fuse flashed out in the air, it seemed to him as if another flash came on him from behind. It might have been for all seeming the crash of a thunderbolt, the sharp, swift sabre cut of a sunstroke. He was only suddenly conscious that something had happened to him. Something had struck him from behind. The cigar dropped from his lips, his fuse went sparkling and spluttering along the pavement, he faced around and certainly had a clear picture of a man with red hair and a red beard who was striking at him again and again and he tried to grapple with his assailant and he fell from sheer faintness on the ground and then he distinctly heard the familiar voice of professor bostock call out you murderer you scoundrel i have got you no i'll never let you go unless you kill me as you have killed him 
and he seemed to understand it all, and how Bostock had followed him to watch over his safety, and then he made an effort to rise in defence of Bostock against the assassin, who would now have Bostock only to deal with, and then a peculiarly sweet and soothing sensation took possession of him, a sense of relief, and lassitude, and rest and he thought for one exquisite second that he could see the face of Fidelia bending lovingly down to him out of the starry sky, and then his eyes closed languidly, and Bostock, and the murderer, and the struggle, and Bostock's present danger were all forgotten, and Gerald sank into a swoon. End of chapter 18《Chapter 19 of Red Diamonds by Justin McCarthy This LibVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter 19 — Gerald Raves Poor Gerald was quite right when, in his fading senses as the blow told upon him, he thought he knew the voice of Bostock coming to his help. For now, standing over his fallen body is Bostock himself, and alone. The assassin must have escaped, and Bostock is examining into the nature of the hurt. "'Confound it all!' he muttered. "'The fellow's not dead yet!' And then he was making a sudden movement with his right hand, when he heard the hurried tramp of a policeman's feet, and the shrill sound of a policeman's whistle, and he let Gerald's head fall, and he accompanied the fall with an execration below his breath. Then he called to the approaching policeman, "'Look here, I say, why don't you watch this embankment? Here has been an attempt at murder, and if I hadn't happened to be near, it would have been murder all out. Whistle again for some of your men. This poor chap is in a bad way.' "'Who's done it?' the policeman asked. "'How the devil should I know? A man with a red beard, a robber, I suppose. He ran up that straight towards the strand. He stabbed me in the arm where I should have held him fast enough.' "'Was this poor chap a friend of yours?' the policeman asked, lifting Gerald's head tenderly and carefully. "'Yes, he was. Where shall we take him to?' Oh, Charing Cross Hospital, of course. I'll get a cab. By this time, two or three other policemen had come up, and a little crowd of night birds had gathered on the scene. Men who had been sleeping on the embankment, women who had been sleeping on the embankment, children who had been sleeping on the embankment. A cab was got, a four-wheeler, and Gerald, still quite insensible, was put into it, and Bostock, with the policeman accompanying, carried him to the Charing Cross Hospital. There Gerald was taken in, and the house surgeon looked to him. He had had some heavy blows on the head, given apparently with some weapon like a short iron life-preserver. "'Look here,' Bostock said in a low voice. "'When I came to close quarters with the red-haired man, I heard something fall on the pavement before he pulled out the knife and stabbed me. If we go back there at once, we are sure to find the thing, whatever it was, a life-preserver most likely.' He spoke with all the eagerness of a man whose heart is set on bringing the assailant of his friend to justice. "'All right, Mr. Bostock,' the policeman said sympathetically. Bostock had at once given his name, occupation, and address. "'We'll go there in a moment. But hadn't you better get this gentleman to look to the hurt in your arm?' "'Oh, it's nothing at all.' Bostock said hastily. 
The surgeon, however, examined the arm and found that there was a pretty deep flesh wound, nothing to cause any alarm, but something to need looking after. The surgeon was somewhat impressed by Bostock's total self-forgetfulness. He dressed the wound for the time, and then Bostock and the policeman went to the nearest police station. On their way, they searched the embankment at the place where the attempt was made, and there, to be sure, they found lying on the pavement a small steel life-preserver, apparently of American make, which could have easily been carried up the sleeve. The policeman impounced this piece of material evidence and took it to the station. There Bostock told all his story. It was even yet not long past midnight. Bostock thought the best thing he could do was to find out Rupert Granton and put on him the distressing duty of bearing this painful news to Lady Scardale and to Miss Locke. He knew that Granton frequented the Voyagers' Club, and had heard him say that he was one of its original members. He would try for him first there, he thought, and then at the worst he could ring at the door of Claridge's Hotel and insist on seeing Mr. Granton. He was clear in his mind that Granton was the right person to carry the news. Bostock could not carry it himself, as things had turned out. He was anxious to make some little capital out of the heroic part of rescuer which he had played, and if he could only impress Granton with a feeling of that part, then Granton might convey the same impression to Lady Scardale and to Fidelia. Granton, then, was the person to be first approached and first impressed. As good luck would have it, he found Granton still drinking midnight, and not much else, at the Voyagers' Club. Granton came out to him smoking a cigar. He was evidently surprised at seeing Bostock, but he soon repressed his surprise. "'I hope I have not disturbed you, Mr. Granton,' Bostock began. "'Nothing ever disturbs me,' Granton politely said. "'Won't you come in and have a brandy and soda and smoke a cigar?' From the very first Granton had a vague dislike and distrust of Bostock. Bostock's eyes had been a constant puzzle to him. Where had he seen those eyes, and why had they so flashed and sparkled then, and were so dull and expressionless now, and why did his memory always show them as in another sort of face? Why had Bostock, a master of cool fencing, made that awkward mistake about the foil the other day? All these questions put Granton upon his guard. Bostock might be as exemplary a citizen as he was a good fencer, but it was always well to be on one's guard. Granton had been in many places where one's life every other day depends on his capacity for being always on his guard and never being surprised at anything. Therefore he now took Bostock composedly, and waited to hear what Bostock had to tell. "'Your friend Mr. Aspen,' Bostock said, "'has just been attacked by an assassin on the embankment.' Then, for half a moment, Granton's composure gave way, and he looked really astonished. "'Attacked by an assassin on the embankment? Do you mean a rough or a robber? Is he badly hurt?' I saw him removed to the Charing Cross Hospital. He is badly hurt. He was quite unconscious when I left him. All right, said Granton, composedly turning to the vestiary for his light overcoat. I'll go and see him. I know the house surgeon at the Charing Cross Hospital. He'll let me in, I am sure. Don't you want to hear what has happened? 
Bostock asked quietly. "'Well, I think you have told me all you know. You think he was attacked by an assassin. Anyhow, he was attacked by somebody. Did you see the affair?' Granton's perfect composure a little puzzled and vexed Professor Bostock. "'Yes, I saw it,' he said sullenly. "'You don't seem to think much about it.' "'My good Mr. Bostock, what is the use of thinking much about anything in this sort of world? The thing is to try and do something. Now I am going at once to see my friend Aspen, and to see if I can do anything for him. Then I shall set about finding out this mysterious assassin. You really think an assassin?' Bostock told his story briefly and coldly, for he did not like Granton's manner, and did not see much chance of being greatly glorified in Granton's account of the event to Lady Scardale and to Fidelia. "'Oh, this red-bearded man again, the same man you and I saw on the night when Seth Chickering was murdered.' "'The same man.' "'Your star seems to lead you to those odd scenes, Mr. Bostock. I am glad you came in good time this evening. We were both of us a little late on the other occasion.' "'We were,' Bostock grimly observed. If I had not been behind Mr. Aspen, he would not be alive just now. "'Quite an interposition of providence, Mr. Bostock,' Granton said gravely. "'But now look here. Have you any theory about all this?' "'I can't help having a theory. There is some conspiracy against the heirs of that diamond mine property. Oh, that is your theory.' "'Certainly it is.' "'Well, that has been mine this long time. I wonder if we work it out in quite the same way.' "'Isn't it getting late?' Bostock asked. "'Had you not better go and see after Mr. Aspen?' "'Of course, I'll go and see after him, but you know I can't do him the least good just at present. I am neither nurse nor doctor, and he will be well cared for at Charing Cross Hospital. But I am anxious, before seeing him, to get at your theory of this case.' They were now standing on the threshold of the club. Various cabmen on the rank in front of the club were signalling and soliciting them. "'Well, you see,' Bostock said slowly, "'one man is missing, Red Gundy. Where is he, I want to know?' "'Yes, exactly,' Granton said, with perfectly unmoved countenance. "'Where is he, I wonder, and where is that other fellow, what is his name, Jeffet Bland? Where is he, I want to know?' And he did then, in the language of Hamlet, rivet his eyes on the face of Bostock. Bostock said, I know so little about the whole affair, I only talk of what I hear. But your theory is that Rat Gundy is instigating these murders and these attempts at murder? If I can be said to have a theory, if I have any means to enable me to form any opinion at all, then I should say yes, that is my opinion. Curious now, Granton said. Here we are, two reasonably intelligent men, and both outside the circle of this controversy, and with, I suppose, about the same or quite the same means of information, and we have come to quite different theories. We are both agreed that these murders and attempts at murder are the scheme of one brain. We are agreed about that, are we not, Mr. Bostock? Yes. Bostock said, with hesitation. I think we are agreed about that. Oh, but come, we are positively agreed about that. Very well, yes, I suppose we are. 
only you are of the opinion that the instigating brain is in the skull of the missing rat gundy yes that is my opinion bostock said he was beginning to feel uneasy and uncomfortable curious now is it not granton said meditatively according to all my theories the instigating brain is in the skull of the missing jaffet bland well i shall go and see poor aspen now i dare say if jaffet bland were to know of my theory he might be inclined to follow me or have me followed along the embankment some night but it would not be of much use i have been accustomed to take care of myself i shall listen for suspicious footsteps behind me and if any one comes in front of me i fancy i can take good care of myself so can you of course and if your theory is right and it is made known that you hold it you may be in just the same danger from red gundy that i should be from jaffet bland it will be curious to see which of us comes out right in the end and which of us lives to tell the tale good night mr bostock i am going to look after poor aspen you will carry the news to lady scardale to-morrow morning bostock asked bostock somehow he could not tell why felt bewildered and in the elizabethan sense overcrowded he had a vague confusing impression that grant knew more than he said and had been too much for him he felt as one groping in the dark and vaguely conscious of some hostile force coming towards him i'll tell lady scardale first thing in the morning granton said good night have a cigar no no thanks bostock said curious too granton observed gravely some men can live without cigars i can't i find the troubles of life too much other people naturally don't of course their withers are unwrung then he called a hansom bostock walked away perplexed he felt as if he had been fencing with an antagonist of untried power and that although he had not been defeated yet that he had felt opposed to him a wrist of steel which somehow foreboded coming defeat granton drove to charing cross hospital rang the night bell and asked for the house surgeon whom he had known in former days and who knew all about him and his family he was admitted to see the patient he will recover granton asked eagerly he will recover i think the surgeon said but he has had a bad knock or two on the head and it's a queer case altogether there was a nurse watching poor gerald as he tossed his bandaged and blood-stained head feverishly and fretfully from one side to the other a little delirious the surgeon said you must not try to talk to him i know granton answered i have been often in such a fix myself there is nothing that i can do i suppose oh no nothing whatever we'll take all possible care of him the surgeon presently left granton to look after other duties granton and the nurse a quiet reserved intelligent woman whose face somehow won granton's confidence and sympathy stood by the bed gerald up to this time was lying almost unconscious and perfectly silent suddenly he started and tried to rise the nurse held him down with a firm albeit very gentle touch i want to tell you something he said in tones so natural that granton fancied for the moment that he must have recognized him then there came a mere cry from the bed a cry in one word fidelia 
was the cry. Granton started. He drew nearer to the bed. Fidelia, he rambled on, in a low, unearthly kind of voice. Your father was not murdered. I know all about it. I do indeed. But I can't tell you. I can't help you to find out anything about it. It is a secret, and the man is my friend and your friend, and I can't tell what he has told me, even for you, Fidelia. Oh, if you do love me, why should you wait? Why should you make me wait? Until you have found it out. Take my word, you had much better never find it out. Don't try to find it out, Fidelia, my love. Let it remain a secret. It would only shock you if you were to find it out. And what good, what good, what good? If we love each other, and we do, we do, we do. You told me yourself, Fidelia, that you loved me that day, that day, that dear, divine day in Renley Gardens. Where have those days gone? Why don't we walk in Ranelagh Gardens now? We never walk there now, and I don't seem able to walk. What is the matter with me? I think it is because I don't see you now, and you will insist that we must not marry until we find out about your father, and you must not find out anything about it. No, no, no! Let it rest, Fidelia. Let it rest, and whatever you do, don't tell Lady Scardale one single word. Don't ask her to find it out. Oh, if she found it out, it would kill her. "'Has he raved like that before?' Granton asked, in a whispered tone, of the nurse, who had begun to smoothen the pillows and arrange the bedclothes with a gentle practised hand, in the evident hope of soothing the patient out of his wandering and distracted mood. "'Only within the last hour, sir,' she said, and it is all the same thing over and over again. You have no idea what he is talking about? No, sir, she said quietly. We never concern ourselves with what our patients talk about. I suppose it is a mere raving, Grant asked tentatively. I suppose so, sir. Patients constantly talk about things that never could have happened, and about persons that never could have lived. The sick man had now ceased to moan and talk, and was lying in a heavy sleep. Granton began to think he had better leave. "'Look here, nurse,' he said. "'You are a sensible woman and a woman of the world, and you have the true feeling of your calling.' What this poor fellow is saying now has a good deal of fact and truth and meaning in it. The nurse nodded her head, as if to say, I thought as much. Of course you thought as much, Granton said, quickly following or catching her unspoken meaning. Well, do you know Lady Scardale? "'Yes, I have seen Lady Scardale often, and heard ever so much about her.' "'You heard him,' glancing at Gerald, "'mention her name?' "'Yes, sir, many times.' "'Do you know a young lady named Fidelia Locke?' "'The young lady who always goes about with Lady Scardale?' "'Yes, that young lady. "'I have seen her two or three times.' You heard him mention her name? The nurse nodded. Well, these ladies, or Lady Scardale at all events, will very likely come to see Mr. Aspen. It would be of the highest importance that they or either of them should not hear such words as those he has lately been speaking. Will you take care that Lady Scardale is not allowed to see him, with Miss Locke or without her, at any time when he is likely to rave? I shall take good care of that, the nurse said sympathetically. I should have taken care of it even if you had not mentioned anything about it. 
only the nurse and the doctor and the clergyman ought to hear what a man or a woman says in delirium i am sorry sir that you should have heard it although of course you are his friend and you'll not mind i am very glad i have heard it granton said for because of my having heard it i may be able to save much trouble to him and to others too good night nurse granton hesitated and took out his purse in a doubtful sort of way looking at the nurse would you be offended he asked if i were to offer you some money it would not be meant for offence but perhaps you would not like to take it we are not allowed to take money she quietly replied well look here he said i must give you something take this for good luck he had a number of glittering baubles hanging at his watch chain he detached one it was a tiny golden locket enclosing a symbol of a four-leafed shamrock traced in the smallest of diamonds wear that on your watch chain nurse i got it in a far-off country the gold comes from there and the diamonds come from there and the thing was made there it was given me for good luck but it never brought me any good luck until now this very moment when i stood with you here and heard my poor friend moan out his troubles the nurse hesitated was that good luck sir she asked it was nurse because i can set all the troubles right and i am the only human being who can do it so there i pass on to you the luck found for the first time you may take it may you not i shall be very sorry if you may not thank you sir i shall tell the matron that you asked me to take it and she will allow me i shall wear it always and be grateful your name is mr rupert granton i think yes nurse i am lady scardale's brother-in-law good night i'll come again and see my friend something occurred to him and he stopped do you find this a dull life nurse oh no sir i am so concerned about my patients if i can help to pull a patient through i do not care for anything else that is right granton said that is the true spirit of the soldier i only wish we were all like that some of us are not but we try to be sometimes she thanked him for his present with a dignified kind of inborn modesty making neither too much nor too little of the costly gift and then granton went on his way it was a thoughtful way for him he was thinking much he had indeed a good deal to think about he had found out aspen's trouble and fidelia's and he was the one man who could put things right but to put things right meant an absolute and a final banishment from civilization he had never a thought of hesitating i came back to england he thought only to try to do some good for this girl at a time when i fancied somehow that she was a little thing in short frocks i hadn't the remotest notion of how i could possibly be able to do any sort of good for her she could not want any money she would be rich enough and there wouldn't be any likely way of my giving her any money and her taking it anyhow now here all of a sudden i find the way to be of service to her and to her lover i can settle the whole question for her about her father's death and i can come to the relief of poor aspen true and gallant chap heart of oak fancy a london newspaper chap being like that he would positively have remained without his sweetheart rather than betray his comrade good fellow i can't imagine how they make that sort of fellow in london i fancied that it took danger and hard life and struggle and all that sort of thing to make such plucky stuff but it don't clearly 
I don't suppose Aspen, until his affair on the embankment, was ever in the slightest danger of his life, except from a hansom cab at Hyde Park Corner, or something of that kind. Well, I have got to leave London and civilization once more. Nobody will miss me much, except my sister-in-law, and even she won't miss me long. Nobody will know where I have gone— Yes, Fidelia must know, but there are other things that she will not know. She won't exactly know how I feel towards her. I shouldn't like it if she did. I suppose it would only worry her and pain her. Life is a sad sort of thing. I suppose I should have done as well, after all, if I had stuck to society and conventionality, and followed the beaten ways, and married a nice little wife and settled down. But it's no use thinking of all that now. I had to dream my weird. I went my own way, and now I shall go my own way again." I stole like a shadow back into London civilization, and now I shall steal like a shadow out of it again. End of chapter 19「Chapter 20 of Red Diamonds by Justin McCarthy this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Twenty. I am Red Gundy. The next morning, Lady Scardale and Fidelia were walking in the garden of the College of Culture before the exercises of the day had yet set in. Fidelia had been unburdening her soul to her friend. Lady Scardale had listened, with a shade of disappointment fairly perceptible on her face. She was glad in her heart that Fidelia should be happy, or going to be happy, only she wished that her happiness could have come to her in a different form. She kissed the girl kindly. "'Dear Fidelia,' she said, you know that whatever makes you happy makes me just as well. Thy own wish, wish I thee in every place. Only I am a little disappointed, too. Disappointed? Fidelia asked with opened eyes of wonder. Disappointed? With what? Well, not with you, child, certainly, but about you— I did so hope that you could have seen your way to fall in love with my Rupert. But Lady Scardale, he never saw his way to fall in love with me. Oh, I don't know. I have a strong belief that he was beginning to see his way fast enough, and then you would have made him so happy, and you could have held him to you, and made him so steady— and he would have quite redeemed all his past follies. But, Lady Scardale, I don't feel that I have any mission to take charge of him, even if I were able to do it. And, you see, I am in love with Gerald, and he is in love with me, and we can't help ourselves, and that makes all the difference. And you mustn't be angry with me or with him, above all not with him. No, indeed, I am not, and I shall love him for your sake, and he is ever so nice, and I am sure he will make you very happy. Oh, yes, Fidelia murmured with a tranquil certainty which touched Lady Scardale. He has all the luck, Lady Scardale said with a smile of resignation. No, indeed, I have all the luck, Fidelia interposed. "'Are you to be long engaged?' Lady Scardale suddenly asked. "'Yes, I think so. A long time,' Fidelia replied with downcast eyes and overclouded brow. "'Why a long time, dearest? You are both going to be ever so rich with the beginning of next year.' "'It isn't that, Lady Scardale. It is because of my poor father's death.' 
She spoke firmly and without a note of a tear in her voice. Lady Scardia looked at her curiously. "'Your father's death happened a good long time ago, Fidelia, and a girl is not expected to put off her marriage for a very long time, even on account of the death of a parent. Of course, I did not suppose that you were going to be married the day after tomorrow, or next week, or anything of the kind. What I meant was that I think a very long engagement might be a great mistake.' "'Why?' Fidelia asked composedly. "'Because he might get tired of me, or I get tired of him. But if that could be so, would it not be better we found it out before than after?' "'I was not thinking of that,' Lady Scardale said somewhat hastily, for it came back to her memory that her own had been a very short engagement, and that not much good had come of its shortness, that if it had been much longer she might have known better, and things might have fared better with her. The truth is, dear, that is one of those wise sayings which we hear repeated so often, that we begin to believe they are axioms of life, and repeat them like accepted gospel truth. But I do not see why yours should be a long engagement for all that, and if I were selfish, Fidelia, I should wish it to be ever so long in order that I might be the farther from losing you. This place will be changed for me when you are not here. Oh, Lady Scardale, dearest friend, Fidelia said, the tears which the allusion to her father's death had not brought into her eyes now starting swiftly there i shall be with you still and always 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 lady scardale pressed the girl's loving hand and remained silent for a moment but fidelia said abruptly I didn't mean that it was because of my father's death in that sense that our engagement must be long, not in that sense. No? In what sense, dear? I am afraid I can hardly explain it to you, even to you. You won't understand, perhaps, but I feel it so. I can't marry, I can't be happy, I can't take happiness if it were offered to me, until I find out the man who killed my father and bring him to justice. Lady Scardale drew away in surprise. She had not known that Fidelia's nature had that side to it. My dear, she expostulated gently, what good could it possibly do to your father or yourself to bring this man, whoever he is, to justice, if you could bring him to justice? Is it not likely that in that wild, unregulated community he was killed in an ordinary fight? Oh, you too, Lady Scardale, that is what everybody says, Gerald and your brother-in-law and everybody. "'Well, dear child, and are not Gerald and my brother-in-law likely to be right, more likely, at all events, than you, who know nothing about such places and such lives?' "'But I do not believe it. I can't believe it. My father never quarrelled. He was too gentle. He was too kind. He was too manly.' I know he was murdered. I had a dream last night, only last night, dear Lady Scardale, a horrid and a ghastly dream, about seeing a murder done by one man creeping up behind another and striking him down with one heavy iron thing. But was it your father you dreamed of? I don't know. I could not see the face. I only saw the blow struck from behind. I don't see much guidance in that dream, Fidelia, Lady Scardale said with a compassionate smile. I am always dreaming about my father, Fidelia piteously said. 
but you must think of some one else you must think of your lover why should you keep him waiting for a discovery that may be impossible or that when it does come may prove you to be utterly wrong ah dear fidelia life is so much too precarious for that kind of thing if you love your lover marry him as soon as ever you can my dear to-morrow some calamity may come the bearer of bad news sad news may be at the gate as she spoke the words rupert granton appeared in the garden rupert at this hour lady scardale said and then added hurriedly i am sure my words are not ominous but as rupert came up there was an evident shadow on his face and the hearts of the two women sank within them rupert however tried to make as light of things as possible now look here girls he said it was a way of his lately to address the two friends as girls i want you to be very plucky just now and to help to look after a poor fellow who is in some trouble and not to make too much about it it won't i fancy be a very bad business after all fidelia turned deadly pale she knew that something had happened to gerald lady scardale quickly said all her courage coming back at the needed moment tell us the worst at once rupert dear all my life long i have hated to be prepared for anything tell us the worst fidelia echoed faintly well the worst is this gerald aspen has been badly hurt and the best is that i am sure he will recover sure he will recover fidelia said with a white scared face sure he will recover then he is in danger not now i trust and firmly believe granton said cheerily he was attacked from behind on the embankment last night he was struck down and got some ugly knocks on the head but he is sure to come all right again and very soon where is he both women asked at once in the charing cross hospital i saw him there last night or this morning what did he tell you about it lady scardale asked granton hesitated well he said the fact is he did not tell me anything it was just after he had been brought in and he was a little delirious that's all the better sign they tell me nobody had told him any such thing it was a pious fraud devised by him on the spur of the moment come fidelia lady scardale said we'll go and see him who struck him fidelia asked no one knows as yet very likely some thames embankment rough and rubber it was not fidelia exclaimed and you don't think anything of the kind oh i can see it in your face it was an attempt at murder the same hand that struck down that man seth chickering well if you will have it so granton composedly answered i think so too i firmly believe that a network of murder is woven around us i am perfectly determined that i shall not stop until i found out the whole truth i'll help you fidelia cried with awakened energy and flashing eyes i know that the same hand that killed seth chickering and killed my father is the hand that struck at gerald aspen granton smiled a melancholy and forlorn smile do you not believe it she asked impetuously i believe he answered gravely and i am convinced that the man who struck down seth chickering is the man who struck down poor aspen i shall find out that man 
"'Was it you, dear, who found Mr. Aspen on the embankment?' Lady Scardale asked. "'No, Aspen was found by your friend Bostock.' Fidelia suddenly drew back and put her hand to her forehead, as if she were half asleep and were trying to rub her eyes into complete wakefulness. No distinct suspicion crossed her mind, but still the vague threatening words of Bostock came back into her memory, the threat with which she had reproached him, and for which she had scouted him at the time, that it would harm others as well as her if she were altogether to repel his advances. She remembered that, and she remembered also his melodramatic suggestions, that he was not altogether what he seemed to be. These thoughts filled her with perplexity and anxiety. She must tell Lady Scardale all that had happened. She must tell her on the way, she thought. She became suddenly silent. "'Will you take us to the hospital, Rupert?' Lady Scardale asked. "'Yes, I'll take you there and introduce you to the house surgeon, a good friend of mine. If it isn't against the rules, I dare say he will let you in, but it very likely is against the rules, and anyhow, you couldn't do anything for poor Aspen. He will be well looked after, you may be quite sure.' "'Oh, we'll go,' Lady Scardale said. Then a message was brought to Lady Scardale. The work of the day was setting in, and she had to go into the house. "'I shall be ready, Fidelia,' she said, "'in half an hour.' "'I shall be ready, too,' Fidelia calmly said. The stress of the sudden news and the sudden thoughts coming on her was forcing her into a kind of marble calmness. Then Lady Scardale hastened along the garden paths and into the house, and Fidelia and Granton were left alone. "'I am glad my sister is gone,' Granton said. "'I want to talk to you about some serious things, Miss Locke.' "'No more bad news?' she asked with a tremor in her voice. "'Well, bad or good, it must be told. I know that these murders and attempts at murder are done with a purpose, and I am drawing a theory, slowly but surely, about them. Professor Bostock, who found poor Aspen last night, has a theory, too.' He saw that Fidelia started. "'What is his theory?' she faintly asked. "'His theory is that the murder of Seth Chickering and the attack on Aspen were set on, if not committed, by the man called Red Gundy. Now, that is not my theory. I know a little too much for that.' "'You have a theory?' she asked. She almost shrank from hearing the answer. Strange and horrible ideas had been creeping up in her own mind, and bewildering her with a terrible sense of uncertainty. Uncertainty seemed, indeed, to have now taken her life under its control. "'I have formed a theory,' he said, "'and I propose to work it out, but I don't want to talk much about that just now. We have not time, and it can wait.' What I particularly want to tell you cannot wait. I want to tell you of something I heard last night from poor Aspen while he was delirious. He talked about you, he raved about you, he thought he was talking to you. You know how he loves you. Oh, yes, she said passionately, and he knows how I love him. Every one may know it who will. I know it, Granton said calmly. Well, what I want to tell you is that whoever made the attempt on Aspen's life last night, it certainly was not Rat Gundy. Oh, but surely, she said impatiently, you need not tell me that. 
it will be told to you that it was red gundy and some attempt might be made to get you to believe it how on earth could i believe it she asked impatiently it almost seemed as if granton were trifling with her feelings how could i believe that when i know that the man with that name is dead she said you told me yourself that rat gundy was dead yes i did and i was speaking the truth then and almost literally i had made up my mind that rat gundy should be buried for ever never to appear again i did not see any further use of him to me or to you or to anybody and i thought the sooner the world was rid of him the better then is he living yes i have brought him to life on your account oh on my account there was something wild about granton's manner which almost frightened her although she was not a girl whom it was easy to frighten yes on your account do you know that i verily believe if red gundy were really lying in the cold grave he could be almost brought out of it to come and lend a helping hand to you do i need a helping hand mr granton and how and if i do how is this man to help me you need a helping hand very badly very sorely and he is the one man who can give it to you see here miss locke you are going to allow the happiness of two lives to be thrown away and i am not going to stand it if i can and neither is red gundy if he can oh this man red gundy what has he to do with me i almost hate to hear the mention of his name i don't know why you told me yourself that rat gundy was not the name of the man who-who oh how terrible to have to speak of such things who murdered my father fidelia your father was not murdered he was killed in what we rowdies of that day called a fair fight the fight was forced on him and on the other man by a black-hearted scoundrel who has since suffered part and only a very small part of the punishment he ought to have i swear to you that there was no murder unless to get up a deadly fight between two men who were not natural enemies be a murder and then the murderer was noah bland and he was lynched not long after that murderer is out of your reach or mine there was a curious exultation of manner about granton which held fidelia impressed for all her impatience and all her suffering there was an absolute truth in his flashing eyes in the sound of his voice which carried with it to the listener an entire conviction she listened awe-stricken to what was yet to come for she knew that something decisive and final would have to be told and listened to you believe me fidelia he said yes i believe you she hardly noticed in her absorption that he had taken to calling her by her christian name i told you that the name of the man who killed your father was not rat gundy you did i spoke the literal truth the name the real name of that man the most unfortunate and deeply repentant man who killed your father was not rat gundy but rupert granton merciful heavens she exclaimed and the first thought that rushed into her mind was lady scardale's brother the brother of my dearest friend and benefactress rupert granton killed my father yes you may well exclaim you may well cover your face with your hands to shut out all sight of me 
I wished to heaven it had been my good luck to be killed by him, or better still, by some one else, years and years ago. I have been lamenting that terrible day ever since. I have that dead face before me. Yes, I see you shudder at the thought. I came back to England for nothing but to find you out and try to do some good for you, unknown to you. I never would have allowed myself to return to civilization but for that. I would have allowed my wretched memory to fade from my poor sister's mind. Yes, I may call her my sister. She is the sister of my heart and of my soul. I would rather never let her touch my blood-stained hand. Only for you. 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 Let me go now, Fidelia said. Let there be peace between us, and let me go. I can bear no more. Yet a little more, he said eagerly. You must not refuse to hear me tell my tale, and then you are released and shall not see me ever again. Oh, she exclaimed, let me not see you ever again. I will go away. I don't know or care where. I can't live with Lady Scardale any more after this. I have lost her, too, lost everything. You shall not go, Fidelia. There shall be no need. I am disappearing again out of civilization forever. No power on earth shall drag me back to England. My sister-in-law need never know of this. She will only believe that her absurd brother-in-law has gone back to his rowdy life, and she will be sorry, but she will not be much surprised. And she will have enough to occupy her in doing good, and she will not have time to think too much about him. Fidelia, there is no reason why my poor sister-in-law should ever know this tale. Why did you tell it to me? Because I saw you wasting your life and the life of my friend for nothing, and I could not bear it. Since I came to know you, I have come to know, too, that there might have been better things in life for me than knocking about the world with gamblers and cowboys and the scum of European armies. You made me feel this, although you never knew it nor thought about it, I dare say. I have thought better of life since I came to know you, and that is why I have told you my tale. Let me go now, was all that she could say. Just another moment. I am Red Gundy. You, Red Gundy? That was the name I gave myself out there, he jerked his head impatiently, out in that confounded place. I have given myself several names in life, and left a queer reputation for some of them. If anything of all this must reach my poor sister-in-law's ears, remember, it was Rat Gundy who did the deed. She must not know the truth. And now, yes, I think that's all. I have one job of work to do before I leave England, and then I am off, and I shan't come back. I mean to track out the man who planned and carried out these attempts at murder, and I fancy I am on his traces already. I am one of the heirs, Fidelia, just as you are. Remember, I am the Red Gandhi of the story, and think if I am the man who was likely to make a murderous attack on your lover. I can't believe that you are Red Gandhi, she exclaimed. I am Red Gundy as sure as you are Fidelia Locke, and it was Red Gundy who killed your father, and I came back to England under the name of Red Gundy to try to make some amends to you for my fault and my crime, although God knows I was driven on to it, and it was not thought much of a crime out there. Oh, don't talk like that, she implored. All right, I'll not defend myself. Think the worst of me that you can. 
only remember fidelia that my sister-in-law must know nothing of all this that you and she and i shall have to go together to the charing cross hospital in a few minutes and that if you were to show the slightest doubt or ill-feeling to me it might bring thoughts into her mind that you and i must keep for ever out of it you will think of her fidelia will you not and you will save her brother-in-law for her oh yes fidelia said i will do that with all my heart and all my soul i will not ask you to forgive me he said that would be too much i only ask you to go on in my sister's presence as if nothing had happened i would not ask you to take my blood-stained hand now here we two alone i do ask you to take it formally when we are with my sister there was a moment of silence and repression then fidelia spoke out firmly i will take your hand now this moment now and at all times i do not blame you or i forgive you i don't know which but i will take your hand a tear started into the bold bright eyes of rupert granton as he stretched out his hand and took hers in it then lady scardale returned now fidelia she said go and get ready End of chapter twenty